Bruce, I think we're all ready to get started here. I think it's set up. Okay, we're ready to go. Good morning, and welcome to the March 9th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, it is 9 a.m. Uh, clerk, would you please call the roll? Good morning, apologies. My desktop froze, so I'm on my laptop now. <laughs> All right. Ready for the roll? Please, yes. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Uh, we will now have a... Thank you. All five members are here. Uh, we'll now have a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Repeat after me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One, one nation, nation under God. One nation Amen. under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we will go to item number three, consideration of late additions to the agenda, um, additions and deletions to the consent and regular agendas. Mr. Palacios, do we have any additions or corrections? Yes, uh, yes we do. Chair McPherson and members of the board, on the regular agenda, item 11, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo packet page 135. Uh, in addition, there's a correction. The item should read, consider directing the planning department in conjunction with the Office of Recovery and Resiliency to return to the board on April 27, 2021 with a proposal to incorporate a set of pre-approved accessory dwelling units on the planning department's website on or before June 30th, 2021 for use by CZU fire victims and the general public as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor McPherson. On item number 12, there's additional materials. There's a notice of objection, uh, insert after page 148. And then on item 13, there's additional materials, attachment B, SB 45 bill text, insert after packet page 151. That concludes the corrections to the agenda. And Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'd like to suggest if it uh, meets with your agreement and the rest of the board that we combine items eight and nine uh, since they're similar and uh, we hear them as one item. Uh, that's fine to do. I don't think there's there should be any objection to that. Uh, these are on the, the list of uh, housing issues, homeless issues we're facing today, and I think combining those would be fine. I don't think there would be any objection. Uh, Mr. County Council, is that that seem proper to you? I. I don't think that that should create a problem at all. So we, we will combine items eight and nine um, on the agenda. Okay, is there any announcement? Oh, I'd like to welcome, uh, we are being broadcast by Community TV and I'd like to welcome Ian who is handling those chores for us today at the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, any other, any announcement no, on item number four, any announcement by board members of items removed from the consent or regular agenda to the regular agenda? I don't see any. Um, we'll go to item number five, public comment. Uh, this is the time for any person who, to address the board during the public comment, not exceeding two minutes. And we will have a timer clock for you to see how much time you have left when you're speaking. Uh, comments must be directed uh, to items on today's consent and closed session agendas or yet to be heard items on the regular agenda um, or on a topic not on today's agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors. We'll take public comments for now for up to 30 minutes. And if, nece uh, if necessary, uh, additional time for public comment will be allowed 
after the last item on today's agenda, and that will be an afternoon session. Uh, we're going to have a discussion on the, uh, uh, the pre-budget, um, the budget for 2021-2 uh, at 1.30 today, so that would come after that. Do we have anybody that would like to speak to us uh, in public comment? Mr. Chair, we have six members of the public wishing to address the board during public comment. Okay, now's okay. the time for public six, comment. Okay. You, go ahead. Thank you. If you wish to comment or are joining us through the Zoom link, please find the hand left icon at the bottom of your screen and click this to raise your hand. This will place you in the queue to speak. When it is your turn, I will call you by name or the last four digits of your phone number. Please accept the unmute and begin speaking. Once you begin speaking, the timer will run and you'll have two minutes. It will end automatically at the end. If you're calling in from a phone, please dial star nine now. This will virtually raise your hand. Thank you. Caller 1999. Good morning, this is James Ewing Whitman. Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. So, Oh, what a mangled web. This was the title of the Santa Cruz Grand Jury, I believe, in 2020. So why do I write what I write about, who I write about? Because I am selfish and want to live another 40 years in this county. This is a local quote from a community member. From a local community member politely engaging with a checkout clerk at the local health food store, one of the staff mentioned 10 of their customers took the IBM Nazi Microsoft injection one male healthy and in good shape physically one hour after the injection had a heart attack and stroke and died. Another had a stroke shortly after the injection. The other eight customers who were injected are all having serious health complications. You know, I wrote this this morning, quote, we are all homeless, all useless, all useless eaters under Rockefeller Western medicines profits over cures an unhealthy monopoly entrenched in the United States of America by 1920, but further established after the Nazi scientists furthered their con concentration camp proven results into the UN and World, Horth World Health Organizations. This is a particularly good brief read, The History of the Pharma Cartel, Cartel published in 2007. After reading this, many community members might share not just this, but many other links like it. As the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisor meet, as the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors meets to, meets today, March 9th, 2021, only presenting 483 pages of Agenda 2130, the situation of homelessness is on the agenda for in four items. I recall sharing in late 2019 in the city of Santa Cruz Council that we are all already homeless due to the wireless weapons already installed. Caller 1401. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors and everyone listening. I'm asking you to follow. I'm asking the Board of Supervisors to follow the lead of Mill Valley, California, and pass an ordinance prohibiting 5G. Mill Valley didn't wait for the federal government, and you don't need to either. In fact, you have an uh, ethical and legal duty to protect us. I'm going to play for you a clip from Dr. Sharon Goldberg's testimony to the Michigan. Senate Subcommittee on October 4th, 2018. Cut. I mean, go. The 5G is not a conversation about whether or not these biological effects exist. They clearly do. 5G is a conversation about unsustainable health care expenditures. Why do I say this? We've been sitting on the evidence for EMR and chronic disease for decades. Um, and now we're seeing all these epidemics appearing. So diabetes is the first epidemic. I think most of you know the statistics. They're very scary. One in three American children will become diabetic in their lifetime, and if they're Hispanic females, the number is one in two. So what does this have to do with wireless radiation? Wireless radiation and other electromagnetic fields, such as magnetic fields and dirty electricity, 
have been clearly associated with elevated blood sugar and diabetes. That is what the peer-reviewed literature says. It is not opinion. The closer you live to a cell tower, the higher your blood glucose. That is based on hemoglobin A1C measurements. So the idea with small cells of putting the cells closer to people's homes and bedrooms, scientifically, is very dangerous. And from an economic perspective, it's dangerous. And you may not know this. Carol Bourne, you'll have two minutes to speak when your microphone is unmuted. This is Carol Bjorn. Tomorrow is the one year anniversary of the local adoption of the proclamation of a local health emergency dated March 10th, 2020, related to COVID-19. When this resolution was adopted by the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors one year ago, it was supposed to exist for a period of 60 days, unless continued or terminated by the board. Why is this local health emergency order still in place? As I told the board in June of 2020, the California Emergency Services Act requires an imminent threat. And at that time, I said, if you've been dealing with COVID for three months, by definition, there's no imminent threat. After three months, you should know how to preemptively treat it. Now, here we are a year later, and there's even more evidence that there is no imminent threat. COVID-19 can be treated preemptively and it has a 99% recovery rate. The local health emergency and local health orders are now only being used as a tool of our county government. And here's an example. The California Department of Public Health does not require schools offering in-person instruction to do active health screenings, including temperature checks at school. I'm gonna repeat that. The state agency, the California Department of Public Health, does not require schools offering in-person instruction to do active health screenings, including temperature checks at school. Yet our local county office of education requires that. Why? Since you all adopted this resolution a year ago, you all need to rescind it today so that county agencies, such as the County Board of Education, do not create more strict requirements than the state requires. This is a tremendously great disservice to the sons and daughters of the men and women of this county, and it needs to be rescinded today. Caller 2915. You'll have two minutes to speak, but your microphone is unmuted. As a reminder, all callers are able to speak once per item. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, I first of all want to thank you, uh, Ms. Berg, for putting the Zoom access information front and center on the board's agenda. That is so helpful, and I really want to thank you for doing that. I also want to ask the board, at the time it, you, in January, said that you would have no more in-person meetings, you did say that you would revisit that decision in March. I've not seen any action on that, and so I would like some discussion about that um, with the constituents when the in-person meetings will return. I would also um, like to ask, related to items later on your agenda regarding housing, that this county consider adopting, as Monterey has, a flagging and staking ordinance. There is a lot of building proposed on the horizon, and on the horizon, we need to see what it will look like. A flagging and staking ordinance will simply do that and bring people's attention to projects in their neighborhood in a timely manner when they can help and really make a difference. The fourth thing I'd like to talk about is this county's participation in the State Board of Forestry uh, fire safe rulemaking efforts. I want to applaud Ms. Paya Levine and Mr. Reed for the um, testimonies they've given to those boards. It is helping Santa Cruz a lot. And I am very concerned that these new rules will really make it hard for people to rebuild in the CZU fire area. And I'm grateful for um, their efforts. I'm also grateful for the two uh, town hall meetings next Monday and Tuesday for the CZU fire people. Those are being hosted by CAL FIRE, and I'm happy that's finally going to happen. Um, and to that end, I ask that this board consider funding. Thank you. Jeff Gaffney, your microphone is unmuted.
Jeff Gaffney. Your microphone is unmuted. You'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman McPherson and fellow board members. Uh, this is Jeff Gaffney, the director for Santa Cruz County Parks. I wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize one of our employees, park maintenance worker, Aaron Randolph. Um, it's not often that we get to have um, positive things said about public employees uh, and at the board meeting. So I wanna make sure that we do that. And um, we recently had the opportunity to get a, a, a very sweet and kind email from um, a constituent who uh, recognized Aaron for his efforts and uh, he was out. So Abel Duran was the person who sent us the email. He was out at a Felton covered Bridge Park um, with his wife. They were enjoying a COVID safe meal um, where they can in parks like people have been lately. Um, he uh, went home and re realized that he had lost his wallet. His wallet had $400 cash in it that he was gonna pay his utility bills with. It was also a brand new wallet his wife had given to him for Valentine's Day. Um, fortunately, um, Aaron was working that day and found the wallet and was able to get it to the sheriff's office who in turn returned it to um, Abel, who was worried, of course, about identity theft and li driver's license, having to replace all that kind of information. Um, and uh, these type of small heroic efforts that our staff make are not easily or often recognized. And it was, it was very kind of Mr. Duran to take the time to send us an email and let us know his thoughts and appreciate the efforts of, of our Aaron Randolph, um, our maintenance staff. And I just wanted to take a moment to let you know that there's a lot of people like that in our workforce, a lot of people that in that county employee employment who uh, make those efforts every day and, and thank Aaron and hope you guys have a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, John Showalter. Okay. Color has dropped off. Jackie Busset, your What's microphone that? is unmuted. What? Yeah, I guess, I guess I am on now. My apologies. My name is John Showalter and I'm the chairman of the Association of Faith Communities. Uh, the AFC is a coalition of 26 congregations assembled to organize the efforts of those faith communities in service to the poor. We are pleased to speak to the board today in support of the proposal put forth by Supervisor Coonery. The new approach is needed. The proposed policy charges county staff to create guidance and policy for the establishing camps that allow neighbors and potential operators to know what to expect. This is good. The policy recognizes such camps can become in a variety of configurations and structures, allowing for flexibility and creative solutions. The policy has the county identify any public or private spaces that might accommodate an encampment. Again, good. Any site must be suitable for the purpose and sensitive to the neighborhoods. The wider we look, the greater the chances of compatibility. This policy does the above with the understanding that we need to build and operate multiple sites to accommodate hundreds of units that have stable funding. This is good as it recognizes that the force, the force to sleep, excuse me, that those who are forced to sleep outside are not confined to the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville. The AFC has vastly encouraged the county is finding the political will to address the reality that the unhoused are more than a two city problem, more than a short term problem, more than a market problem, requires more than tents and a porta potty, and may be needed for a while. This won't be easy. Some have demonized the homeless, ignoring the 75% who had an address before they became homeless. They flame away on next door and burn away. I'm gonna run out of time. I thought I was gonna have five minutes. Oh, well, thank you all. Jackie Buse, your microphone is unmuted. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Jackie Bussey and I am a public school parent and I'm a pediatrician in our community. Um, and I wanna talk briefly about reopening our schools. There's a lot of discussion going on about the technicalities of getting our kids back to school, but I wanna just get back to the big picture. A year ago when our schools closed, I think it was the right thing to do. I don't hear we any sound. Oh. I don't have the audio. I don't know who. 
Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Um, Sound comes in and out. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. So I'll try to go quickly here. Um, I am a public school parent and a pediatrician, and I wanna talk briefly about reopening our schools. There's a lot of discussion going on about the technicalities of getting kids back to school, but I wanna just touch on the big picture. A year ago when schools closed, I think it was the right thing to do. We assumed COVID would be like other respiratory illnesses with kids being the primary drivers of transmission, that they would be at high risk of severe disease and that schools would be super spreaders, but we were wrong. We have known for quite a while now that schools can open safely with simple basic mitigation strategies. There really is no scientific or safety mm -hmm. reason that our schools should still be closed. Schools all over the world, the country, and even in our own state have been open for months with extremely low rates of in-school transmission. Yet our kids are still at home. We're about to go back to hybrid, which is long overdue, but I was devastated to learn that our county is also planning hybrid instruction for next fall. This is totally unnecessary and will cause ongoing harm. I am very worried about the long-term impacts of another year of inadequate schooling, not just for our kids, but for the parents in our community, and frankly, the future of our public school system. We need to prioritize getting our kids back to school full-time as soon as possible. It really is unconscionable to continue to keep kids at home just on a technicality. Thank you so much for addressing this issue. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Melissa, your microphone is unmuted. I don't see anything restarted at this point. Is there one more? Melissa, speaker? your microphone is unmuted. Um, I didn't be able, be able to contact the person who wants to speak. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you, um, Chair McPherson. Uh, it looks like Stephanie may be having some um, connection problems. Let's see. Okay. Is, um, how many, was there one or two more speak? Oh, where we go? Supervisor, what I can do is I can take pick it up from um, Stephanie. So I will not be able to share my screen, however, with the timer. So if um, Community TV could simply run your own timer, we would appreciate that. Speaker whose number ends in three, two, five, six, you will have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead and you are unmuted and start. You will have two minutes. Speaker three. Oh, good morning. Go ahead. Yes, good morning. Hello, good morning. This is Ellie Black. Uh, a couple things I want to touch on today, uh, some of them were touched on already by other speakers, and thank you for that. Uh, the most pressing is the situation with uh, um, protesters at Trader Joe's and other places. Uh, the wording in the Sentinel article recently where law enforcement was requesting that the public um, help them track these people down, finding their home addresses, car uh identification, take pictures of them, et cetera, is very troubling to me. This is um, this is something that's not appropriate in a, in a free society. This has been done before in history and it was never with good consequences. No matter what someone's perspective is on the protesting, um, my own ex included, I don't believe that setting the public on one another is the correct way to do things. These people, as far as I'm aware, do not hide their identities. I believe their events are public. And the fact that law enforcement was fully aware of the situation ahead of time and did, chose not to show up 
uh, is a very glaring question in my mind. Instead, what we, could be more productive for the community is to call a public forum and have the people who are doing these protests speak with the leaders in our community and have public input on this. This is obviously something that affects people on a very uh, emotional and visceral level, and there's a lot of fear, and that's that's needs to be addressed in a, for a constructive outcome to the situation. So I hope you all are considering that. I'd also like to speak to uh, the fact that we were told that in-person meetings could likely resume in March. It is now March, and uh, would like to see that followed through with as far as it being something that we can go back to because public participation. Thank you. Caller 1851, your microphone is unmuted. Hello, this is Monica McGuire calling and uh, asking that you again hear the many requests that you look at the local picture here in Santa Cruz County, but as well, there's still the bigger picture that includes uh, real science debate and conversation that could be taking place, such as with the former director, vice president and chief scientist of Pfizer, who uh, was quoted in the article in November of 2020, still very, very valid today under lifesitenews.com. Um, the article entitled uh, Pfizer um, says no need for vaccines, the pandemic is effectively over. It's all still true that Dr. Michael Yaden, um, who spent over 30 years leading new and allergy and respiratory medicine research in some of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, then retired from Pfizer as the most senior research position in this field. He said, there is absolutely no need for vaccines to extinguish the, va the pandemic. I've never heard such nonsense talked about vaccines. You don't vaccinate people who aren't at risk from a disease. You also don't set about planning to vaccinate millions of fit and healthy people with a vaccine that hasn't been extensively tested on human subjects. The British Nationals' comments come at the end of a comprehensive criticism of the Scientific Advisor Group for Emergencies they, uh, they have in the UK, but again, it fits with everything that we're doing in this county. And those are all of these government agencies are playing a predominant role in determining public lockdown policies, et cetera, including all of the ones that have continued all of these months and should be looked at. The, this article, like so many others, is asking what we've all been asking. Could we look at the local need? We have a 0.009% death rate, and that's only with the... the Colin User, you will have two minutes once your microphone is unmuted. Thank you, Speaker. Your microphone is unmuted. Hi. Um, it's a shame we don't still have three minutes on public comment, thanks to Bruce McPherson cutting off the public at two minutes. <laughs> Uh, this is Marilyn Garrett. Despite what the telecom industry says and their assurances of safe amounts of exposure to radio frequency microwave wow. radiation, no such safety limits exist. As Dr. Sharon Goldberg has stated, wireless radiation has biological effects, period. This county is planning to upgrade all the existing wireless sites to 5G um, the, as the planning commission discussed last month. I'm going to continue with some comments of Dr. Sharon Goldberg testifying in Michigan. The problem with diabetes really is chronic kidney disease. Um, end stage renal disease, the worst complication of diabetes, leads to hemodialysis. Hemodialysis is an automatic qualification for Medicare. Um, and if you don't qualify for Medicare, we still have to dialyze the patient. And the state 
state ends up paying in many different instances. So renal failure is 1% of Medicare, but it takes up 7% of all Medicare expenditures. I don't have time to talk about this anymore, but once again, we have... So the other epidemics that clearly link from the science with electromagnetic radiation are related to mental health. And this is straight from PubMed. This isn't my opinion. This is science. Okay? For those of us who aren't physicians, what is... Thank you, Chair. That concludes the speakers for public comment. You're on mute, Bruce. Let me chair your... Okay, we will go now to item number six, action on the consent agenda. I'll ask the board members who will start uh, anything that you would like to comment on the or take off of the consent agenda. Just a few comments, um, no, uh, nothing to, to pull. Um, just on item 26. This is, excuse me, this, is super, this is Supervisor Koenig now speaking. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on item number six, 26, I wanna thank my analyst, Amy Miyakusu for volunteering to serve as my alternate on the RTC. Our experience uh, as a senior analyst with public works here in our county uh, for many years before joining my office makes her very well positioned for this. Uh, on item number 31, I want to call attention to this nearly $300,000 contract with Janice to provide treatment and housing payment assistance services. Uh, it's great that we're seeing more financial resources, uh, but we also know from programs like FIT that there's a shortage of housing for programs like this. And so creating more low cost housing opportunities in our community uh, will ultimately help state money like this go further. And uh, I also look forward to seeing some of the data that's collected uh, from this program as, as highlighted um, in the award. Um, on item number 32 uh, about the local area management program or LAMP, uh, this is definitely something uh, I heard about a lot on the campaign trail as well, uh, the, the issues we've seen. Um, I wanna thank you, thank Environmental Health for the update. Um, it's been a huge need in our, um, in our community, in our county, since our, we lost authority in May 2018 to approve anything other than low risk systems. Uh, and, the, and the need to go to the state is adding a huge amount of time and expense to projects. So the fact that we furthermore anticipate going from 16% of uh, all septic systems being um, seen as, as needing advanced treatment to 30 to 50% is really a, a staggering potential increase. Um, and, you know, especially given my understanding that advanced treatment systems can cost as much as $80,000. So, uh, you know, I think as evidenced by the extensive comments from the community on this, we, we know this is a big issue. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to exploring alternatives as well. Uh, not a day goes by, it seems these days when someone doesn't ask me when the county will be considering composting toilets as well. Um, so, you know, I hope that we'll address that in the future. On item number 33, uh, I just wanna um, you know, express my gratitude for the Great Plates Delivered program. Uh, I know my neighbor uh, has benefited greatly from that program and it really put her at ease throughout the, the pandemic. Uh, and finally, on item number 37, I wanna thank Public Works and Conley Engineering for the successful completion of the North Rodeo Gulch Storm Damage Repair Project. Uh, the project was much needed to um, ensure safe, safe egress on public uh, um, on North Rodeo Gulch. And the fact that it went less than half a percent over budget is uh, incredible. I'd say it's, that's pretty much spot on. Um, so thanks again. That's all. Supervisor Friend, do you have any comments on the consent agenda? Thank you, Supervisor McPherson, Chair McPherson. And I'd like to uh, build a little bit on Supervisor Koenig's comments on item 32, and I appreciate those comments, and I agree with these concerns. Uh, Supervisor Koenig and myself, as well as Supervisor McPherson, have a lot of the areas that are impacted by this. 
I did have a question. I'm not sure if there is somebody here from uh, that can actually answer it. But while we're producing a draft lamp, do we actually have an expected timeline on the completion of it? Um, obviously, there's a lot of steps still uh, to get this completely certified. And so I just wanted to see if there's a timeline that we could start providing to constituents for completion on, on uh, that item. So I'm not sure if there's somebody that could address that, or if not, it's just a question that maybe I could get addressed offline. But if there's somebody here, I'd like to be able to get a sense of what the expensive timeline is on 32. Um, uh, very good. I, uh, we've each had comments on that so far, and I'm going to have some as well. Uh, I will ask uh, our environmental health director, uh, Marilyn Underwood, to comment on, uh, just keep in mind your question, and I have a couple questions on that as well. So, uh, so um, we will tee up uh, Marilyn Underwood of Environmental Health to answer some of those questions. Uh, after every each board member has addressed us on the items on the consent agenda. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, do you have any concerns or uh, any comments you wanna make on items on the consent agenda? No, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going, uh, my mute is going off and on again. I'm trying to correct that as we speak. Uh, you didn't, Supervisor Coonerty, to, uh, to be clear, you didn't have any comments on the consent agenda? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Supervisor uh, Caput. No, uh, thanks. Thank any you, comments? Chair. Do, you, do you have any comments on it? No, I'm okay. Everything's fine. Okay. Thank you. All right. I, uh, and I just have uh, two issues that I want to address. Um, the first one is on item number 32, as has been um, addressed by uh, Supervisors Koenig and Friend. Uh, it's on the, uh, the local agency management program, which has been underway since the state had some direction in 1999. So this is an ongoing project. Uh, and I want to thank Environmental Health for its work. It, it appears uh, Chair McPherson's computer is frozen momentarily. We do have uh, IT up here trying to uh, work on his computer. Um, so I imagine we'll, we can wait a few. I'm going to have to take a two minute break. I'm going to make, excuse me, Mr. Palacios. I'm going to take a two minute break uh, to correct something here. That's what it's probably going to take. So can we just, uh, take a, a brief uh, recess for a couple minutes and then I'll come back on uh, right away. Okay, we'll go ahead and take a, a two minute break then and we'll resume very shortly. Okay, very well. Sure. Thank you, we can hear you, Chair. Okay, so we will reconvene the the March 19, 2021 of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you for your patience. Um, there was one question from Zach Friend and a comment by uh, Supervisor Coney as well. Uh, and I just want to thank the Environmental Health Department, first of all. It's worked on this project over the many years. This uh, started with state regulations that were imposed in, uh, I think, 1999. Uh, and these change, changes are really being driven uh, by our state and regional policies uh, with the water regional boards and so forth. And we know that they have a significant uh, impact on our property owners. Uh, in addition, uh, I, and I'm gonna be asking this of uh, Marilyn Underwood, our, our director of environmental health. And I think she will answer supervisor friend's question as well. Um, there's a, a range here that we have in this um, of a number of parcels Im impacted and it's between 8,500 and 12,000. But for the 30 to 50 cent of permits that will not require enhanced treatment systems um, that will be triggered when there is uh, our repairs or just when new and upgraded systems are being installed. Um, I, I just wasn't sure what that, that, what that really meant. 
And then on the estimated number of parcels affected by the various proposed changes, is there some duplication on this 8,512,000? Uh, in other words, will some parcels be affected by one or more of the changes in the regulations that were stipulated uh, in the, uh, the agenda item? Is uh, Marilyn Underwood, uh, our Director of Environmental Health, is she available to answer some of those questions? Chair McPherson, um, Marilyn uh, Underwood is available. And so Stephanie, if you could um, uh, elevate Marilyn um, to a panelist and then she can uh, respond to the questions that uh, Chair McPherson and other board members have asked. Thank you, Marilyn, your microphone is unmuted. It has been promoted, thank you. Good, Good morning, Supervisor McPherson and Board of Supervisors. Um, let's see if I can answer all your different questions. I think the easiest one maybe is, well, maybe the easiest one is the timeline. Uh, at this point, we think we will be needing to put the document out for a second round of public comment, and we will have a uh, at least some sort of uh, opportunity for the entire community to speak on the, on the document, the LAMP, the Local Area Management Plan. Um, and then we hope to have it to the regional board uh, for their June meeting. Um, and so that's about the timing right now that we're looking at. Um, as far as um, comments on the, um, the, the document, in the document we state, it is estimated the percentage of permits requiring enhanced treatment will increase from about 16 to either 30 to 50%. And actually in asking John Ricker a little bit more about that, John Ricker, as you know, is our recently retired uh, environmental health coordinator position and he actually largely wrote this document, the local area management plan. He actually thought it would be more like 30 to 40%. So again, that's enhanced treatments being not required on 16%, but up to 30 to 40. So an increase about 15 to 20%. Again, there will be a, a fair number of systems that will not require that uh, upgrade to enhanced treatment systems, uh, but some will for sure. And, and again, the reasons oftentimes are uh, changes in our standards um, from when the parcels were su first subdivided uh, that require, if, especially if a small parcel is too close to a stream and uh, there will not be adequate setback. Uh, groundwater separation, that's the separation between the bottom of where the, um, the sewage is or this um, liquid is just positive on the soil and the top of the groundwater at the high groundwater time. So again, something that's really has been found to be very important to protect our groundwater uh, as we all drink that groundwater in many cases. Um, and so some of those will um, definitely affect people and require that they get enhanced treatment. Um, as far as uh, Supervisor McPherson, your question about the various numbers that are laid out of different systems that will be affected by the changes. There definitely is overlap. And again, John Ricker, I asked him what he thought instead of, you know, eight to 12,000, it would be like four, five to 8,000 parcels that would be impacted. So again, reflecting that there is some overlap. Um, these changes that are in the lo local area management plan are addressing issues that they've seen not only in Santa Cruz County, but also statewide, where there's uh, the, our, our previous ordinances uh, were not protective enough of groundwater and surface water. And again, we depend primarily only on our own groundwater and surface water to, to, to provide us drinking water here. Uh, so that's why some of these, uh, we do have to meet minimum standards that the state has set. Um, and also uh, protect again, importance of our, our groundwater and our surface water. Um, I do uh, welcome you know, a continued dialogue on this as we move forward and a dialogue with the regional board who ultimately has to approve our land, local area management plan. Very good, I think those are adequately, uh, any supervisor have further questions on that? Thank you, Ms. Underwood for that, uh, that detailed uh, response. It's taken a long time to get here, and I guess we can uh, look forward to discussing this further in June uh, before the Board of Supervisors. Uh, my only other comment was uh, on item number 39, the East Ione Road Repairs. I want to thank, again, as I do just about every meeting that we have with the Board of Supervisors for the work of our Public Works Department uh, for the storm damage repairs that go back to 2016-17. Uh, we are, really do appreciate the work that's going on despite uh, many, many infrastructure demands related to fire recovery that we have today. 
So thank you again, Public Works. Um, it's a very important road uh, there in my district, and East Ione Road. Um, with that, I, we will move on to, um, or excuse me, uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Pardon me, Chair. I would like to call out that item 27 requires a four-fifths vote, so the maker of the motion is aware. Okay. Mr. Well. Chair, I'll, I'll move the recommended actions. And also just very briefly, just on the Dr. Underwood comments, if, if Dr. Underwood wouldn't mind working with each of our offices on the outreach to our constituents, that'd be useful. I think that we could help with that outreach. Um, I just wanna be sure we have a very robust public outreach plan on that, but that's not direction. That's just a suggestion on that item. Um, I'll just move the recommended actions. Very good. Second. Thank you. Good point. Okay, um, call the roll, please. I, I believe you're on uh, mute, Ms. Carrera, but if you... Supervisor Koenig, yes. Aye. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Supervisor Coonerty? Aye. Supervisor Caput? Aye. And Supervisor McPherson? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. And, and you did get Supervisor Koenig on there. I didn't hear you say that, but I think he said aye, so it's, it passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Moving right along to item number seven, we have a, a presentation by the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County on its work with the Disaster Relief for Immigrants or DRIA program. Um, as outlined in the memorandum of uh, Supervisor Caput, and I will say in advance, the Community Action Board has been in Santa Cruz County for a long, long time, for decades, and it's just does phenomenal work to those who uh, need help the most, in my opinion, and they do it year in and year out, and they they really handle their tasks as efficiently as can be expected, and uh, we do very much appreciate what they do year uh, throughout the years. Um, I don't. It's, uh, who is going to be making the presentation on that, Mark? Okay, um, Mr. Campbell, yeah, 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 you brought this to the point. It's okay. Thank you. And thanks for your comments too, Bruce. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Maria Elena De La Garza and Paulina Moreno of the Community Action Board uh, to speak with us today. Uh, they're a, a great asset uh, for especially South County uh, because we have documented, we have undocumented people living here. We have for, farm worker families and uh, then we have the complication of blended families where uh, let's say half of them are uh, uh, documented and the other half are not. Uh, we have many families down here in South County where uh, some of the children uh, were born in Mexico or in different countries. And uh, then the other children were born here. So some are citizens and some are without any document uh, documentation at all. Uh, my children uh, that I have, uh, they go to school at many white public school with uh, in the fourth and fifth grade with a lot of kids and some of them are not documented and some are of course. And then uh, uh, also are in our neighborhood, uh, we, have another, we have also everything that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's a uh, uh, CAB is, especially with when uh, I uh, had a good relationship with uh, Doug Keegan and he retired and now I believe somebody you can introduce uh, who took over immigration. Matthew, I believe is his name, is that correct? Yeah, okay. And uh, so anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Maria Elena and good to see you. And uh, you can tell us, I, you, were, you were born and raised in Watsonville, or you, you definitely raised in Watsonville. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be with all of you today. Um, thank you, Chair uh, McPherson, and, and welcome and hello to Manu, who we've not met before. 
Um, yes, born and raised in South County, Greg, in Watsonville, to be exact. So it's Thank always you. an honor and a pleasure to come and speak to you about some of the work that we're doing, not only in South County, but throughout the community. Um, thank you for your kind words and for acknowledging 56 years of service of uh, the Community Action Board in our county. Um, and so we, we are having some technical difficulties on this side. Paulina Moreno is one of our directors. I'm not sure if, can, can you see her? Okay, okay. Do you see Paulina Moreno on your screen? I'm not sure how to do this. And so- She has me. been elevated and she can unmute herself and help with your presentation. Excellent. Okay, so we, hopefully we can do that, um, but I will move us forward. So, so we wanna talk a little bit about what our, our experience was uh, uh, over the summer, last summer, um, being one of, of 12 agencies selected by Governor Newsom to um, distribute um, uh, economic resources for families who did not qualify for federal relief or unemployment. Um, and as you can imagine, um, Paulina, can we put up our, our PowerPoint? Yes, very good, thank you. Um, and under our under CAB and our Immigration Services Program, um, there's a new initiative that, well, not so new anymore that you've heard of, hopefully, the Thriving Immigrants Collaborative. And if we can move to slide four, Paulina, that would be helpful. Um, and the Thriving Immigrants Collaborative was born in, in the city council chambers of in, at the city of Watsonville when we were talking and debating whether our, our community should be a sanctuary city. Um, a really important conversation that happened on all levels of the jurisdictions. Um, and in particular in Watsonville, we, we went to the podium and we said, you know, it's a given, we must be a sanctuary city in this, in this time. Um, remember it was right after the elections um, four years ago, four and a half years ago. Um, and there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment and rhetoric um, circulating throughout the nation um, and in our state. Um, but we said, we need to do more. And, and it's not just about being sanctuary, but it's about how do we come together to help our communities thrive and how do we help our immigrants thrive? And that was where the Thriving Immigrants Initiative was born. You can see on the screen who some of the steering committee partners are um, and where, where we are committed to do better and be better for immigrants in our community. Um, we have uh, not only our steering committee members, but a, a reach of over 200 partners that include our human services agency and our public health partners through the county who are committed to to, to, to understand um, what the needs of immigrants are and to, to be responsive to those needs. Um, please, next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna introduce Paulina who led the special project of the disaster relief assistance for immigrants over the summer. It was a huge undertaking. We had about eight weeks to distribute $2.5 million regionally and I'll let her speak to the, to the details of that work. Thank you, Marielena, and good morning, everyone. As Marielena mentioned, my name is Paulina Moreno. I'm one of the project directors here at Community Action Board, and, and we're just thrilled for the opportunity to be with you this morning to share uh, with you a little bit about what the Disaster Relief Assistance Project meant for our community and uh, talk a little bit about some uh, lessons learned and, and next steps that we're hoping to engage in conversation with you. Um, I am having some in and out coming out of my, um, I'm getting notices that my internet connection is low. So um, I may be uh, having to turn it off if it does get too slow. So uh, I, I wanna um, just uh, say that and, and, and apologize in advance for that. But um, very quickly, um, if you all can remember uh, back on April 15 of 2020, Governor Newsom uh, made his announcement uh, with the creation of 75 million disaster relief fund uh, for assistance to undocumented immigrants as a result of the COVID-19 emergency. You know, this is historic and unprecedented in, in, in our history. Never before has a state taken a stance to make sure that we are inclusive of all in our economic relief, regardless of immigration status. So we wanna commend our governor and also the, the organizations that have been advocating on behalf and with immigrants asking for inclusive policies that don't discriminate based on immigration status. And so for the very first time, you know, we um, were one of 12 CBOs across the state that were selected to implement what it, we uh, internally called the DRE program. Uh, it really, it was an opportunity to reach um, 150,000 undocumented Californians 
Um, in, in, in six weeks, as Marielena mentioned, people who were eligible were adults um, who could receive $500 in direct assistance with a maximum of $1,000 in assistance uh, per household. And really a household is, is defined as individuals who live and purchase prepare meals together as defined by the state. And really um, some of the eligibility criteria, um, you know, uh, people were obviously adults, people who were over the age of 18, but they were excluded, not eligible for any state or federal uh, COVID-19 uh, relief efforts. And of course had experienced some hardship as a result of COVID-19. And so um, what we wanna share with you is uh, part of what the, the lessons learned when it came to community engagement. We understood and we, we know what the impact of COVID-19 was or is continues to be for our undocumented community, um, specifically who have been excluded uh, from any relief efforts. Now there's been much more advocacy to make sure that even people who um, in the first round of COVID relief efforts if there were mixed status families, they were excluded from receiving any type of stimulus support. Now there's conversations to do away with um, mixed status families. And so um, one of the things that we learned in terms of our community engagement is that when there's a, a, a need, there isn't really a, such a big need to do aggressive outreach. Um, what, what is needed is really funding for the infrastructure to be able to respond. Um, one of the things, you know, that we quickly learned is that we needed a communications person that could not only be in conversation with our elected officials who were constantly um, reaching out to make sure um, that, you know, they, they were receiving calls from their constituents, concerns that they could not get through the hotline, concerns that, um, you know, they just wanted to be part of the process. And so uh, on top of everything else that we needed to administer, there was a really concerted effort to make sure that we were keeping our elected and just the general public um, updated with information about what was happening with the disaster relief program. Um, and, and our response to that, it, because we understood the needs, is that we contracted interpreter excuse me, interpreters to make sure that we could um, connect with the community beyond English and Spanish, but also in indigenous languages and multiple languages outside um, that our, our immigrant community uh, speaks. Um, you know, we um, launched a hiring committee. Um, uh, we, we brought on board oh, over the course of two weeks or less, 18 new staff who are bilingual, bicultural, compassionate, uh, were born were from this community, raised in this community, who understand the cultural nuances of what it means to connect with um, people from the community who are in need. Um, and really, I think to our benefit that it requires an agency that's committed to equitable practices. I think that it's by no, um, you know, uh, luck that Community Action Board was one of the agencies uh, selected to do this work uh, in the Central Coast. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what that um, breakdown looked like. I wanted to share this because I think it's important. Part of our effort at, at CAB has really been to advocate on behalf of the Central Coast. Um, when it comes to um, immigration services, legal services, resources coming from the state, there's, um, you know, we get over overseen from the larger counties. And so for us, it, it's a continued push to make sure that um, the state understands that there are undocumented uh, uh, Californians living in the Central Coast. And we represent a, a, a huge percentage uh, of people who are also um, not only providing a, a, and uh, essential workers in our county, but are also in need. And this is what the breakdown looked like across the state. Um, really, the state organized us based on region. Um, we were uh, delegated as part of the Central Coast that was divided in two. And we really uh, had about almost six and a half weeks to launch this program. Uh, the application assistance began on May 18th and it closed on June 30th of 2020. And um, I just wanna briefly talk about the stages of DRE. You know, there were um, various stages to um, be eligible for this, this, this program. Um, not defined by us, but defined 
by the state. And so, you know, there was an intake process, which really um, for us spoke to the need. Um, I want to share that, you know, when we launched on May 18th, in the first hour, our system crashed because we received 35,000 calls in the first hour. There was absolutely no way that our phone system could um, take the capacity and the, the uh, of, of the number of calls that we were receiving. We were not the only organization across the state that crashed within the first hour or even within the first day. Um, but we quickly, you know, um, did our homework, processed with uh, uh, companies that could take on the, 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 the capacity for the amount of people that were um, calling us. Our um, website, our Facebook, our social media, within the first hour was, you know, received 47,000 hits. Um, and so really the, 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 the need was out there and it just spoke to, um, you know, the, the process for, for doing intake was via phone, of course, because of COVID um, regulations. Um, part of the documentation, uh, there, there were some very uh, serious challenges in terms of barriers that we've heard uh, to technology, not only lack of, but use of technology. Because um, we were uh, following COVID-19 safety protocols, there was a need to make sure that um, everything was done via um, email or Zoom. Um, but we did set up uh, in-person uh, drop-off centers where people could connect with us and, and provide the required documentation to move forward. Uh, one of the things that, that I do also want to highlight around the documentation piece is that um, many of the, the, not only were there challenges around technology, but there were challenges around having access to something as basic as a uh, ID with a, a picture on it. Something as basic as, as being able to prove that you reside where you say you do. Uh, and so those were additional challenges that came and that unfortunately we could not work around and, and some people became ineligible as a result. Um, but I do have to commend my team for really being creative in finding solutions to uh, address some of those challenges, whether it was teaching people really how to send an email uh, via a text message, describing to them how to use you know, their, their cell phone um, and, and, and just, Training, basic training to our community was, was pivotal in this effort. Um, the, the disbursement component was really an opportunity. Uh, the majority of it happened uh, via mail. So people were mailed out once they became eligible. Oh, and excuse me, I'm, I'm stepping one, I'm skipping one important step, which is really the approval process. Um, you know, in addition to the 18 staff that we hired to process calls, so the, the hotline was answered Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. In addition to the 18 staff that were constantly answering the, phone, the, the hotline, we had our admin and director's team really focused on approving um, applications so that we can move them forward. And, and so for us, it's really how do we create systems that are equitable for people um, and and ne not necessarily that disadvantages them because they don't have the required documentation to prove that they are in need of a service. And so um, the disbursement again happened primarily uh, over mail, but we did have several in-person pop-ups pop -ups throughout the counties that we were tasked with serving, uh, where we also brought in a number of interpreters to help us provide support um, and to help people activate their cards. Um, people received their, their assistance via a, a, a visa card. And so it was an opportunity to also, you know, a lot of our community members had not used a visa card, didn't know how to activate a visa card, um, didn't trust that there was actually money in that visa card. Uh, so we set up a, a help hotline. We were one of the first organizations that set up a, a help hotline to be able to support people in activating their card. Um, and again, this is really just a breakdown. We were tasked with providing assistance to 4,500 individuals across four counties, uh, Santa Cruz County, uh, Monterey, San Benito, and San Luis Obispo. Uh, again, the system uh, that was set up 
by the state was a first uh, first come first serve system, um, which again might be a fair system, but as you can see, it's not an equitable system. Um, you know, and a possible solution could have been maybe setting up phone numbers for different areas of the county. So really, this is what the the, the breakdown looked like across um, our the four counties that we were tasked with. Uh, approximately twenty percent of residents in Santa Cruz County receiving this type of assistance. And I won't go too much into depth into what the data is telling us because um, as, as I'm sure that you're well aware, these are not, this is not anything new. I, I think that for us, what is um, important to highlight that this is the first time that a survey uh, of undocumented people and, and, and what are their needs and what is the impact? Um, th this is the first time that we have data to support what, what I think we already know. And what this tells us is that, you know, immigrants uh, not only have the same needs and aspirations as other Californians and, and that immigrants contribute in the same way, but for us, the big difference here is that there's a lack of pathways to access resources that other people may have access to. Um, and I'll just go next to, I'll turn it over to Maria Elena. Oh. Thank you, Paulina. That was a lot of information. And I'm just in closing, we want to talk about the lessons learned in equity and, 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 and reinforce what you heard in Paulina's presentation. First of all, the needs far outweigh the resources available. We know that. COVID-19 response technology strategies do not work for all. And we need to be really careful as we begin to, to move in technology-driven um, systems that they create further gaps, especially for our indigenous speaking communities. We need to amplify the voices of impacted community members and compensate their time to help support this work. Current systems are not representative of nor accessible to indigenous speaking communities. I wanna reiterate that. We have a hard enough time as a county responding in Spanish. I don't think that our board of supervisors meetings has a Spanish interpreter. And if I do, if we do, forgive me, I'm not aware of it, but, but, but how do we push beyond that? Because there are people in our community that have no access to you or to, to learn about, have access to learn about what you're doing in support of their needs. Trust and relationship building is key. Um, we talk about trusted messengers, right? We learned that through our census work. And, and we know that that's what works in communities of color. And what has been missing is strengthening the infrastructure for trusted messengers. You know, trusted messengers have big hearts and big souls and are activists and, and in action in this community. And we need to help support those infrastructures. I wanna talk about the process of inclusion. And right now, County Board of Supervisors, we are looking at an equity plan. We wanna operationalize equity, not only in the county system, but all systems. How do we look at inclusion in a different way? How do we create systems that elevate the work? And how do we partner with agencies led by people of color, governed by people of color to be responsive to the needs of people of color? That's on you, Board of Supervisors. You can do that. Just like five years ago, you had us restructure the core system. You can include metrics of equity in that system so we, that we can ensure to, that our responsivity. Um, we need to have tools and we need to partner with with, for example, El Consulado Mexicano, so that we can get IDs for people. We can practice um, what the state showed, right? Uh, the best practice for pro-immigrant movement. What it, you know, we can ask ourselves, what is our local responsibility for our families and for our, our most essential workers? You know, we need interpretation. We need access to technology. The, 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 the need is vast and all it takes is you know one step at a time. You just you just adopted a resolution that racism is a public health issue. Well, under the, that resolution, the pro-immigrant movement needs a space. We need a bold space to continue to advocate for this community because the needs are huge. I want to thank you, Board of Supervisors, for allowing us to share our information. Paulina, would you go to the last slide, please? Um, uh, you know, this, this work is, is, will continue. CAB will continue to work with partnership to move this work forward. Uh, last slide, please, Paulina. And just to put on your radar on, on um, May, March 18th, March 18th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., we will be 
following up with a community immigration forum. Um, a, a year ago, we held one of the last convergence allowed before shelter in place at Cabrillo College, where we had hundreds of community members come together. We're having a follow up online virtual coming up March 18th, and we invite you. Um, we want to thank the, the, the Human Services Agency for partnering with us, along with the Latino Affairs Commission, for getting this work out and continuing this movement. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being bold and courageous. And thank you for understanding that you have to push us. You have to push the systems to change and to be more responsive. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, really condensed uh, presentation. Phenomenal what you're doing. I mean, you're, there were th unknown, unbeknownst to us, what would be the, re the outcome of uh, this COVID-19 impact in particular. I mean, you've had you've had to serve thousands more in, in our community, our county. Uh, and I think you said you added uh, 18 staff members. And I think it's really a uh, testament to you and what CAP does here in Santa Cruz County, that you are one of the few counties that have been recognized by the state as uh, in implementing some of these programs. And you are correct. There are so many things we want to do and we need to do, and we're gonna continue our efforts to get that done. I think you're right in communication. Uh, so people know and feel confident uh, that they, they can have a place to go to and uh, find a place where they can be assisted. Uh, I just wanna say uh, there are more than uh, out there, but uh, the thousands that you've assisted without your really dedicated support to do this, uh, they, they would not have that assistance that they have received so far. So I can't overstate uh, Maria, Helena, and, um, and Pauline, uh, and your whole staff. Please tell them how much we as the County Board of Supervisors do appreciate their work. I know they're hard pressed. And like every other uh, body or subject that I can think of, um, they, they need more funding and resources. We were gonna, we'll continue to work at that. But I just wanna say, because of your dedicated efforts, and your recognition of what you have accomplished over in the past, over these past what now 56 years, um, that's why you have been recognized to the extent that you have been today. So uh, it's it's uh, just my hats off to you, and I know that's from all of the county board of supervisors. And I would welcome any comments from the county board uh, board members. Does anybody have any other comments? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I do have something to just add. I'm real and I'm and Plano, the, the, those numbers were just staggering. I mean, the number of calls on that, first, I mean, it really floored me. I, I felt like we needed to pause and really reflect on two things. One, not just the need, but two, uh, talk about your organization being a trusted member. I mean, because in order to get that many calls, that's that really proof positive that people feel confident in your ability to deliver. But those numbers really did floor. And I think it's important for the community to see that um, be it from the state, federal, local level, we set a policy and even provide a funding, but in some respects, it really just leaves at that point. I mean, it, it, this, this next network is where the action really takes place. Um, and I appreciate that and, and, um, and would like to hear more about some of your thoughts over the equity metrics as well, just personally um, offline. And, and again, just uh, to echo Supervisor McPherson's comments about the appreciation, but I, I think that it's worthy of really making sure those numbers get out there because they were just really stunning to see the level of need, uh, especially because there's a debate right now as to whether there still continues to be a need, not by this board, but by others across this country. And, and there's no greater uh, metric than that. So thank you for your work on that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other board member would like to make a comment? Uh, Supervisor Kappen? You bet. You bet. Uh, I, it was mentioned, uh, uh, the word trust, and I, I think that that's a key with uh, CAB. Uh, the Community Action Board, when, uh, when I refer people uh, to go and talk to them, uh, I tell them you can trust them and they're not going to be taken advantage of because there are some lawyers that are out there that will say, I'll help you with immigration and they charge a couple thousand dollars and then, uh, or more, and then they don't get anything done. And then the people really uh, that are undocumented, they can't take them to court. Uh, they're not gonna walk into a courtroom and say, I was taken advantage of and I have no uh, paperwork. So they're, they're afraid to uh, stand up for their rights. But sending them down to cab, uh, we know they're not gonna be uh, uh, 
mistreated, and also uh, uh, I was uh, I'm amazed that uh, it's kind of on a donation part. If you want to donate so much money for the paperwork, which is uh, you know maybe a hundred dollars for a packet of papers that they do down there at Community <laughs> Action Board, uh, if they don't have the money, they don't have to pay it. So. Uh, it, it, it's just really a great asset. <clears throat> and I think with the census and the redistricting that will be coming up, uh, Zach Friend, uh, in your area, you're, you're probably going to get a, a greater portion of South County because we go by population and the young population of Watsonville is greater than uh, most of the uh, other areas of Santa Cruz County. Uh, it doesn't matter if the population of the census is uh, with papers or without. It uh, goes by population alone, not by number of voters or whatever. So anyway, my my actual area will, will shrink in South County and uh, Zach Friend, yours will actually grow. So it'll, it'll be a great asset to uh, not only the whole county, but especially South County. Uh, the farm worker population, I'll just say uh, that you do great work uh, uh, with them and uh, Paulina and uh, Maria Elena. And I don't know, I, yeah, all you have to do is work a few days out there in the field, and uh, especially in the summer, and you can, you'll realize that how difficult it is and how hard the work is. And uh, we really appreciate everything that uh, 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 people are doing uh, in, our, in our county. Thank you very much. Take care and God bless you. Thank you, Supervisor Captain, and for all the work you consistently do in the South County for your constituents. And I, I want to make it clear that when we do have redistricting, which we are going to do this year, uh, the, an equal number of people will be in each district. Some of the lines may change just so yeah. people don't think if there's more people are going to be in one district than another, it's uh, to be evenly out allocated. Um, Supervisor Koenig, do you have any uh, comments? Yeah, just uh, just wanted to thank you, Maria Elena and Paulina for the presentation and uh, also echo Supervisor Friend's comments that I would uh, love to see your suggestions for some metrics of equity, um, you know, that we can, I, I think we'd all like to incorporate some of that into our work and so very much look forward to continuing the dialogue on uh, what we can measure and how we can improve. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah, I just wanna um, thank CAP for the amazing work they do and <clears throat> stepping up at this moment when um, big parts of our community needed them the most and because of their leadership, not only locally, but in the Central Coast and statewide, um, we were able to help people when they really needed it. And then I just wanna say, Maddie goes to show the strength of CAB's organizational ethos that uh, before we're even out of the crisis, they're already thinking about the lessons learned, what could be done better next time, ways to improve and ways to really not just um, to focus on the specific delivery of services, but actually change our systems to make them more equitable. And like the others said, I look forward to, to good conversations and um, you know challenges about how we can how we can promote equity uh, in all of our systems. And uh, and I just want to appreciate CAB's efforts. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, comments from the public? Yes, Chair. I have one speaker. Call in user, you will have two minutes to speak once your microphone is unmuted. Your microphone is unmuted. Hi, um, this is Marilyn Garrett and I wanna thank Community Action Board and uh, Supervisor Caput for bringing this presentation forward to the public so we can hear the actual voices of people very much affected by um, what is going down on with all this lockdown. I taught in Watsonville for about 20 years, the Mesty and Calabasas School, bilingual classes, uh, primary grade, and the accounts of the arduous work in the fields and exposed to toxic pesticides 
uh, we're, we had parent conferences, and it was just uh, heartbreaking. And I'm looking at this Universal Declaration of Human Rights that reaffirms faith and fundamental human rights. And Article 23 says everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to um, protection against unemployment. And this uh, lockdown, shutdown of everything without any scientific justification, of course, has affected people in poor communities uh, most, but everyone is affected. I want to refer people to Children's in, uh, Health Defense, Children's Health Defense, Dot org, and that's what I always tried to do as a teacher. You call her nineteen ninety nine. Your microphone is unmuted. Yes. Good morning. This is James Ewing Whitman. My comments will be brief. I did listen to this, and I took about a page of notes. I appreciate what Marilyn just said. Um, and I just took a page of notes. This is amazing. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. There are no more speakers. Okay. Uh, once again, I want to thank um, Marilyn, um, or excuse me, Maria and Pauline for their presentation and uh, to uh, let us know some of these astonishing facts that have uh, developed, uh, particularly in the recent years. So thank you for everything, and we will accept your report and. Uh, we will uh, we will listen to what you we have listened to what you had to say. So I hope we can act on it in the near future to the best of our abilities. Thank you very much. Okay, now we are going to go to items number eight and nine that have been combined, and um, we do have a scheduled item at ten forty five, and that might come a little late because um, I think we should address these. Uh, we we don't want to wait for twenty minutes. Uh, I'll, I'm going to read number item number eight. Uh, this is consider housing for a healthy Santa Cruz, a strategic framework for addressing homelessness in Santa Cruz County as a framework for guiding county investments and collaborative work on homelessness. Direct the Human Services Department to provide a framework and a six month plan progress report and gaps analysis to the board by August 10th, 2021. And every six months thereafter, as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Human Services, uh, we have item number A, a strategic framework for addressing homelessness in Santa Cruz County, B, a six month work plan, January to June 2021, uh, C, community presentation summary, uh, and then a framework for survey results summary. Um, and item number nine, uh, we will consider directing the Housing for Health Division of the Human Services Department to work with other county departments exploring the creation of policy recommendations related to the development and siting of temporary shelter, safe sleeping, and safe parking opportunities to identify and prioritize available public, county, and private property outside the cities of Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Capitola, and Scotts Valley that could be used for temporary shelter operation at at least 120 units for homeless households shall be located within the urban services line of the unincorporated area of the part of the county. And during the six month work plan update, include information on any barriers to achieving these goals as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisors Koenig and Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, we are going to open this in a moment. Just, I, I'd like to make some just general comments on our how we've been addressing homelessness. And I wanna begin by saying, there's been an enormous amount of work by our staff and community me uh, members to get to the point where we are today. And having a strategic fr framework and work plan for how to achieve our goals. You know, now for many years, we've, we've heard the refrain, the county needs to do more. And I think we have answered that call time and again over the past few years in our coordination of state and federal funding to expand services and sheltering. Uh, we're also managing uh, now a, a part of 
through a dedicated office of our human services department under director Randy Morris, where there is truly a uh, needs to be grounded as a matter of public health and well-being for all. Um, in addition to this framework, the board is, is also scheduled uh, to hear other items today from board members related to affordable housing. And I anticipate these are gonna be complementary to the overall framework as we work to prevent homelessness by diversifying our affordable housing options. Um, so with that, I think I would like to hear from uh, introductory comments from either supervisor or both uh, Supervisor Koenig and, uh, and Coonerty. Did either of you want to make a comment at this point? Uh, th yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to uh, take a moment to echo what you said, which is, you know, we are housing more than 600 people uh, more than we were at this time last year. Um, the county has identified positions um, and taken a much greater leadership in terms of coordinating services and providing services, um, <clears throat> often with the assistance of federal uh, and state funding related to the COVID crisis. Um, and uh, and I think that what we've met, what we, what's been missing is, uh, despite all this effort, uh, both a real uh, dedication to creating systems that work and strategies that work uh, for the people on the ground, as well as for the community, as well as identifying spaces outside of the cities um, to help uh, solve what is a community-wide, if not national. Um, crisis of homelessness. This neither the cities nor the county will be able to address homelessness. Um, it is a national crisis that's precipitated by a failure of a safety net, failure of mental health, substance abuse treatment, um, housing. It's it, we're 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 the sort of the last resort uh, um, a response of a result of big system failures that are going on. Um, but I think with today's efforts and with the leadership of the Human Services Department, Dr. Robert Ratner, um, and uh, this board's effort to find um, appropriate places uh, to, to have shelter in the unincorporated area, I think we can do a lot better. And I'm optimistic, although this is a major challenge that we can, um, uh, we can do better in both addressing the needs of people experiencing homelessness, as well as the community who is feeling the very real impacts every day. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll um, you know, just to add that uh, our goal of, uh, of Supervisor Coonerty and my proposal is really just to address the fundamental, fundamental question of supply. How do we create affordable housing options? I mean, you know, we've got to have something in between uh, the unmanaged encampments we see today and, you know, the $400,000 new construction uh, that is, you know, standard construction options. So, um, you know, the goal in our proposal is really to create a framework uh, to allow for an all hands on deck approach. Um, it falls in lines with what we've seen other cities do, like uh, the city of Sacramento, uh, Eugene, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington, that basically creates a framework of, of guidelines uh, whereby uh, nonprofit or uh, faith community operators um, can help create uh, a housing community of whether it's of tiny homes or Conestoga huts or any other uh, form um, to provide that that uh, temporary option. So um, you know that's that's all I'll say now and looking forward yeah. to the presentation. Very good. You will have more comments, I know. Um, I think. Uh, um, uh, Human Service Director Randy Morris would like to address us in this item. These items, I should say, items eight and nine. Uh, sure, good morning, Chair McPherson. Am I coming through okay? Yes. Okay, uh, good morning, Chair McPherson, board members, and to the public watching this. I'm Randy Morris, the Director of the Human Services Department. Thank you for framing this, um, for joining with us in uh, managing this humanitarian crisis, which is very um, large indeed. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, can I thank you for your comments here and recently in a uh, media article recognizing that this is bigger than the county, um, but that doesn't mean we can't do better and I think we can do and hopefully um, if your board approves the strategic plan, we will start doing better. Mindful, we also need federal and state support. Um, I am going to uh, provide a few introductory remarks um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Robert Ratner who was mentioned earlier, uh, who is the director of the division in um, the human services department called Housing for Health. 
that when your board supported in consult with the county administrator's office to shift the administrative oversight of this effort from the CAO's office to human services, your board also agreed that we needed to prioritize um, putting resources and infrastructure to move such a big plan forward and approve the hiring of a new director. That is Robert Ratner. And today is his first day uh, presenting to your board, though he has been here with us since uh, November. Um, I do want to just repeat and underline Supervisor McPherson on item number eight specifically, and I know we've merged nine on eight specifically, there are three asks in front of your board and just break them down because throughout the discussion today, hopefully um, you will agree they're reasonable and that will help guide us going forward. The first is uh, to accept this strategic plan, which has been an effort uh, in motion for many, many months and actually um, more than a year. Uh, the second is uh, part of this plan is to break down our work in six month work plans uh, because your board approved the conceptual frame we were working on as draft in November. We actually started the effort in January and to get in rhythm with those six month cycles, uh, we are asking to be directed to return in uh, no later than August with an update on our work. Uh, in the first six months um, and then every six months after. Um, this is an important issue to your board, to this community. We want to be transparent, we want to be held accountable and we also want to be really honest with this community about what efforts we're making and where there are barriers that we can't find solutions and have honest conversation with this community about what we can do about it. Um, so before uh, turning this over to Dr. Ratner, I just wanna name um, that homelessness truly is a humanitarian crisis. Um, sometimes these conversations, when we talk public policy, we lose sight of the fact that we have hundreds and hundreds in this community, thousands of people who are have parents and have siblings and have friends uh, they've lost touch with who are living unsheltered. Um, and this is a very serious crisis with an awful lot of suffering. And I just hope that throughout our work, we can constantly remember that um, and keep focused on what we need to do locally um, to work on this. Um, as Supervisor Coonerty said, and as I said earlier, uh, the fact that this is an issue in communities throughout the United States of America points to the fact that this isn't something that can be solved locally. Uh, this is something that has arguably devolved over many, many decades of action and inaction at all levels of government. So I think to unpack this and get a better trajectory is going to take uh, some amount of lobbying and advocacy with the federal and state government. But I think to our presentation today, I do think we can do better and I do think we can get better organized. And if I were to summarize what I do think is in our control, given the historic nature of this issue, it is whether or not we come together and work together as a coalition, as a team, or if we spend time and energy that um, does exist in this community, pointing fingers and sharing frustrations. And I think when we do that, we fall short of building a team and building a coalition. And hopefully this frame that's being presented to you today will help us organize ourselves to maximize teamwork and minimize some of the frustrations that have existed. Um, so I want to share with you just as a brief reminder to your board, um, a reminder to the community, um, and for those newly watching, um, a little bit of the history. I don't want to repeat the whole story because it's been very involved, but I do think it's worth piggybacking on what you said, Supervisor McPherson, when you introduced this. Um, before my time, I've been here a year. Um, I've heard from many people in this community in my last year that up until um, uh, the appointment of our current county administrator, Carlos, um, there was a history of resistance in the county in taking this on as the crisis it is. Um, and then we started a new, um, under uh, a new county administrator, under board direction to really start building up our infrastructure and taking on our role as a county to work with our cities and with our community to be a part of the solution. And um, this is not a struggle unique to Santa Cruz County. The tension between counties and cities is pronounced everywhere because the state and federal government does, doesn't give us a lot of clarity about the roles and responsibilities. Um, there was recognition very early on that in order to get a plan to address something this complex, we, want, we would benefit from consultants who have experience in this field. And your board approved an action that was funded by a combination of human services, health services and the county administrator's office to hire a nationally recognized consultant firm called Focus Strategies. And Focus Strategies was bought on board. And over the last 18 plus months, there has been a lot of community engagement and a lot of presentations to your board um, about that effort to lead to today. 
I do want to take a moment to recognize my colleague, um, Elisa Benson, the Assistant County Administrator. Sorry if I'm embarrassing you, Elisa, but today is the first presentation where she is not one of the public staff presenting. She carried this heavy responsibility for many years. Um, the last time we were in front of reward, it was um, Elisa and myself as we were preparing to transfer this office to human services and Elisa, thank you for all your work. And I want the board and the community to know we still work um, every week, Robert and I with Elisa to take advantage of the history of all her leadership and work. Um, when the board decided, which was actually just before I started to transfer this office to human services soon after your board approved the hiring of a director and you made some subsequent actions to help us build up the infrastructure of this office, which have played out um, over this past year to the point where we are today. Uh, after Elisa and I presented to your board on November 10th, um, we then want this, uh, your board and the community to know that we went to all four city councils and we presented the draft plan as well, because we are hoping that um, not only does the board of supervisors that all four cities also support this plan so that we work together as city and county. And what we are in front of you today is the final plan that is a byproduct of a lot of community engagement, including feedback from all of your offices, all city elected city managers and the community, which uh, Robert will speak to more in a little bit. So my final comments before turning this over to Robert is I wanna take the opportunity to share with you um, in my year here and in the last many months since this office transferred to my department, um, what I'm gonna call some tensions that if we manage them well, I think we will maximize the efficacy of our work. And I think if we don't manage these well, um, it will compromise our work. And I hope you find these um, comments helpful because I think if we pay attention to them, we work through them and we recognize there is tension in um, making decisions, uh, it will help us do better um, to this community. So the first is in front of you today is a strategic plan. And I just want to simplify that term strategy and planning and something as complex and vexing as homelessness that has so many issues and is so big, sometimes bumps against two things, uh, politics and crisis. And there are lots of political pressures on you as electeds, city electeds. Um, there are lots of issues. There's lots of constituent um, frustration shared with your offices and city elected offices, which leads to lots of hopes and wishes and direction. And if we can balance that with being strategic and planful, I think we'll be better off. If we just be reactionary and focus on just the crisis, I think we might miss the ability to be strategic and planful. Um, and we can talk about throughout the three years in our presentation. Uh, the second is clarifying roles. The amount of time being spent in communities throughout California delineating what the role of county and city is, is a lot of time and energy. And I think we can do better to clarify those roles. And the reality is both county and city have a role, but being specific about what those roles are is some work we can do. And we plan to do that in our planning. I also want to name the difference between a policy means and a end outcome that we're looking for. There's a lot of discussion in the work of homelessness focusing on the means to what I think we need to focus on the end. And what I mean by that is this, sometimes there's a lot of push to achieve something specifically, which is really just a step to get to the ultimate goal we wanna to get to. And if we're not clear about the difference between the two, I think sometimes we get really mixed up. And I would, at the risk of um, provocation, point out discussions about encampments are one of those issues that we need to be careful, we need to talk about. I believe this community does not think having encampments is the end goal we want, but we need to realize we have encampments. And so how we toggle between and deal with the tension of not getting lost and solely focused on what to do with encampments, what we want is everybody to be housed and healthy, not just living in encampments or better living in encampments. So I think that's just an example of one of many. Uh, the next one is very difficult given this crisis is devolving and getting worse and that is a little bit of patience. Um, I, in our previous presentation from CAB, uh, I heard Paulina and Maria Elena speak about the, the profound pressure on their infrastructure to handle the volume of work and how overwhelming it was. Um, this work is profound and overwhelming and we are in the middle of trying to develop some infrastructure, develop some data systems, get uh, some organization so we can better 
provide information to the community. And to do that takes a little bit of time. And sometimes that effort we're taking isn't visible because what's visible is just what people see in the community. So we will be very honest and upfront in this presentation and in all our reports to your board about the work we're doing, but sometimes it's not always visible, all the work we're doing. And we've been doing a tremendous amount of work. I have two last statements. Um, the second to last is managing expectations. I feel like one of our responsibilities as human services is to share with your board and with this community what we have control over, getting the facts on the table and helping make informed decisions under your direction about where to prioritize resources we have. Um, we plan to unveil today our preliminary financial gap analysis that will expose to your board and to this community our best calculations of how much money we have today and the distance between what we need to actually achieve this goals of this plan. And what you will see is we do not have enough. So we welcome questions, if not challenges to our analysis, but we feel like it's important to be really clear with this community, what money we get, what we've been doing with it. I wanna recognize there was a very fair article in the local media a few months back saying, where'd all the homeless money go? That's a good question. We want to be able to share that with the community and not have to wait for the media to ask us but what you will find and what this community will find is we do not have enough financial resources to achieve all the goals and achieve all the outcomes. And we want to have that conversation. And in the end, we look to you as our electives to help us make these very difficult decisions about where to prioritize the inadequate resources. And we will work very hard to get more resources. And then my final comment, the role of federal and state government. I have been in, uh, county government for 25 years, an extra six years before that in nonprofits and graduate school. I have been in many moments in my career where I have seen issues like this that are public policy crises where there are populations suffering. And almost every one of them that is this big and this national has never been solved without federal and state intervention. So we have to spend some time not all our time, we have to balance our time working across coalitions regionally and across the state and lobbying for solutions at the federal and state level to really help move this needle. And I would just end my comments before turning this over to Robert with um, an experience that I have had throughout my career. Often the federal and state government doesn't immediately come in and create an entitlement funding stream to solve issues without piloting without putting out grants as they do today, and you'll hear some of them. Sometimes when they recognize the federal and state government, there are issues, they put money on the table to pilot things. And they often look to communities where there is promise of having that money land and have that turn into good solutions to then make permanent solutions. Communities that are at odds and finger pointing and not collaborating and not being a team are not a good investment. Communities that are working together are a good investment. So I just invite you all as board members in the community to hold me and Robert accountable to be good team members and in turn invite our city partners, our electeds in the community to work with us. I think the future holds the opportunity for more grants, more opportunities to bring resources. And we want to in our applications be able to share that we are a team and we're a worthwhile investment for more federal and state resources to help advance some of these causes. And I'm concerned that if not, we might miss some opportunities. So I really push all of us to work on this concept of team. So I'm gonna turn this over to Robert. Robert is a very humble man. I apologize, Robert, but I wanna start by saying, if you don't know Robert, I could not be happier with the community hiring process we went through. Um, Robert is a medical doctor by training. He also has a public health degree. And unlike me, um, his last 30 years of work as a medical doctor and public health professional have been directly in the field of housing and homelessness. Um, I also want to share that he has roots in Santa Cruz, family and in-laws who are very connected to UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I wanna just recognize him for the great work he's done. He's been out in the public and in the media, but this is his first opportunity to present to your board. So I turn this over to Robert and thank you for uh, our work together and you can take it away from there. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to thank you for that uh, introduction, uh, Mr. Morris. And I uh, 
just want to remind people that the scheduled 1045 item will be, we'll take that up after we complete uh, addressing items number eight and nine. Uh, Dr. Ratner. Thank you, Randy, and uh, thank you, um, Supervisor McPherson and members of the board. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this community and to work on this really challenging issue of homelessness. And I am excited to present to you this work that has been done, um, started two years ago um, with the work of Focus Strategies and many members of the community, elected leaders, to really move away from a reactive approach to this really challenging um, humanitarian crisis of homelessness to one where we've actually got a framework that we're working from together as a team. So that this first slide really speaks to what um, the kind of outlines are. And um, I'll go through this material in about 10 to 15 minutes and wanna save time for questions for members of the board. Um, this slide presentation gives an overview of this three-year strategic framework and also highlights some of the things we're working on over the next six months. The, the three-year framework is really looking at the period of uh, the beginning of this calendar year through um, the end of 2023, beginning of January. And it's a partnership. So there's an entity within Santa Cruz known as the Homeless Action Partnership, which serves as the official HUD recognized continuum of care um, body or council and board for work around housing and homelessness. And then our human services department um, stepping in to create this new housing for health division, which I'm excited to be a part of and member of that team. And as Randy said, there's been a lot of work from many people to get us to this point. So the overview of what I wanted to cover is, um, first I wanna make sure we honor the feedback and input we received through the public meetings and a community survey that we put out after the November presentation of a, the draft of this framework. And give an overview of the framework itself. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the stories we tell about this issue really matter to how we work together as a team and how we work on this challenge together. Uh, Randy alluded to some preliminary information uh, looking at gaps so that the framework has specific goals for us in terms of types of programs and we use some estimates of how much those different programs cost um, in this community and other communities in California to come up with some financial gaps analysis and then I want to highlight a few of the things we plan to work on over the next six months. So in terms of the feedback we received, uh, there's a few key points that came out of the community meetings as well as the survey. Number one was uh, we heard loud and clear that the initial draft we presented in November needed to be a little bit easier to read and understand. So we hope that we honored that feedback with the changes we made. There was a strong emphasis on much of the feedback that we really needed to be more clear about how the gap between the incomes of people in our community and the cost of housing are major contributors to homelessness. So I, I hope that you all feel that we address that. There was also a really strong um, contingent that felt we need to not just focus on the people who are homeless now because we'll never get to a place where we've actually ended homelessness if that's the only lens that we look at. We really need to think upstream and look at how do we prevent people from losing their housing and get it more into a preventive mode. Uh, a lot of the public wanted us to say more about how healthcare issues and Supervisor Coonerty alluded to this a little bit as well. How do behavioral health issues or issues affecting our, our behavior and our ability to manage things uh, in daily living, how do those things contribute to homelessness? So we've included more material around that. And um, you heard in the public comment today, and Randy addressed this a little bit in his comments, that homelessness often is connected to the visibility of people living in large groups and in encampments. And there's been a lot of attention to that issue. So um, there was a request, and we really wanna honor that, that we need to do something together with our city partners and community members to figure out how do we address the reality that many people are living unhoused and it will take us some time to make progress. What, what do we do in, in this moment um, when we have so many unhoused people sometimes living together in large groups? And then uh, the last point that came out loud and clear is that we really need to have a bottom-up approach to thinking about this, a community-driven approach. Um, and we need to include people who've experienced homelessness in the past and people who are experiencing homelessness now and really listen to their voices and understanding what we can do better as a community to help meet their needs and get them back onto a path into permanent housing. So the, the overall framework and what we're trying to achieve over this three year period is a 50% decrease in the number of households or people who are unsheltered 
and a 25% decrease in the people uh, in our community experiencing homelessness. And the graphics here on the right show what our numbers were in 2019 and where we want to get to in 2024. Our plan is to really think about measuring our progress with households. I think one thing that often gets forgotten with people who are unhoused is that they're not alone often. They're living with children, they're living with adult parents, they, they want to live with others. So really reframing our work of supporting households to move in together and be successful in housing and, and to thrive in the community. The framework has established uh, through all this community input some really core principles. I was pleased to hear many of you articulated them earlier. Um, one is that we want to move from just uh, talking to actually taking action, getting to the point where we have consensus and taking steps to move forward with our overall goals. We want to keep the people that all this effort is about in mind, person-centered. You know, what is the experience of people who are unhoused at the moment? And how can we do a better job of serving them and getting them on a path to permanent housing? I uh, appreciated the presentation that came before uh, with Cab and Marilyn and Paulina. The equity and inclusion piece is really important. When you look at the data on the populations that are much more likely to experience homelessness, we see some fairly clear patterns here in Santa Cruz and around the country. There are significant racial disparities. There are disparities in terms of health status. There's disparities in terms of the age of people who experience homelessness. So we really need to be a, pay attention to those um, disparities. We also really need to think about how do we include people uh, to be a part of our broader community. Uh, the measure that is attached to this framework that um, Supervisor Coonerty and Koenig mentioned is like, how do we involve the whole Santa Cruz County community in helping to address the problem of homelessness, not just segregating our efforts into certain geographic areas? And how do we include populations that have often, often been excluded from our efforts? Uh, Supervisor Coonerty and others have alluded to the need to be really systematic, thinking big picture, so not taking one little project at a time, but looking at all of our investments, whether our investments are getting us to the results we need, and really looking at it from a countywide systematic approach, making sure all the pieces of the things that we do fit together. Um, it says date-driven, but it should be data-driven. <laughs> um, but I think there's an element of date-driven, too, that we need to be uh, focused on timelines and hitting our goals and, tr and tracking our accomplishments. And then the last key principle is uh, being countywide in our scope, really trying to bring together our city partners, our community members, um, and uh, looking at how we can mobilize all of our different resources. The framework calls for some specific go goals related to our performance of our different interventions in the world of a housing crisis response system. The chart here on the upper right comes from our strategic framework, but it comes also from the work of focus strategies. They developed a model looking at our community's performance overall with helping people to get back into housing. And they had some recommendations. If we're going to get to those original goals that we established for the three-year time period, we have to accomplish certain measures with our intervention. So an emergency shelter, we need to reduce the amount of time people are in an emergency housing situation and increase the percentage of folks who exit from our shelter programs into permanent housing. With our transitional housing, we need to do the same um, and rapid rehousing as well. Permanent supportive housing um, is a, a long-term intervention where we're providing ongoing subsidized um, housing with supports to help people maintain and be successful with that housing. So there are no specific goals around that in terms of length of stay and increasing of the rehousing rate. But we do have a wonderful partnership with the Housing Authority of the Santa, um, Santa Cruz County. And a lot of our permanent supportive housing programs allow for a transition from people from a specialized program to their regular program. So that creates more opportunities for us to get more people into permanent supportive housing. The three-year framework also has some targets for us in terms of how many temporary housing beds. And by temporary housing beds here, we're referring to emergency shelter and transitional housing beds. Should we aim for? How many rapid rehousing slots should we aim for? And rapid rehousing is a program model that combines short-term, medium-term housing subsidies with supports to help people increase their income as a household and housing search efforts to help people get back into housing. And then permanent support housing, which I alluded to. So you can see the recommendations are to grow um, our capacity in all of these areas. The 
focus strategies um, analysis recommend that we invest significantly in expanding our rapid rehousing slots relative to other communities we haven't invested as highly in this approach. And there's evidence that for many people experiencing homelessness in our community, this can be an effective cost-effective strategy to helping folks get back into housing. The framework calls for um, our areas of action so that the key areas for our work are building that coalition from the ground up and bringing people together to address this issue, focusing on prevention and thinking upstream about how do we um, prevent members of our community from losing their housing, increasing people's connections with the kinds of resources that help support them to get back on a positive path in their lives and back into housing, and then expanding our permanent housing. And, and part of expanding permanent housing is also helping people to increase their income. So housing becomes more affordable in this community. The other uh, point that the framework calls out is that we have to do work and evaluate our interventions around whether or not we're getting to the root causes of this problem. And uh, over and over again in public meetings, uh, people with lived experience, the number one thing that comes out is the cost gap or the housing affordability gap between incomes of people who want to and have lived in Santa Cruz and what they can afford, um, we have to find ways to close that gap. And there's many different uh, ways that we can work on that together. Some are gonna be discussed as part of the board agenda today. We need to figure out how do we change our health um, care services and practices to support people to maintain housing and to not end up in institutional settings. Um, behavioral health issues are very um, common health issues that impact people's ability to maintain their housing. But there are other um, health issues that come up in our lives that impact our ability to get and keep housing. So we really need to tend to those things. Uh, lack of supportive connections, the experience of um, losing your home and ending up on the street can result in people losing connections in their lives that are helpful and hopeful. Um, whether they're professional or per personal and familial. So we need to have interventions that help people to reconnect with others that provide support to them. And then the last point um, is actually not really a, it's a not a policy area. It's um, how do we as a community don't lose, in, in spite of the federal and state, the need for federal and state investment, um, how do we not lose hope and a sense of purpose in terms of what we do collectively together because um, when we lose hope as a community, I think the people who have lost housing also lose a sense of hope and purpose. So I, I think that's key with our interventions, key to how we do work, is holding on to a sense of hope and purpose that we, we can do better and we will do better. Uh, I wanted to honor the feedback from the community and just talk a little bit about the housing affordability gap. Uh, this slide comes from the California Housing Partnership and they did a report on the affordable housing gap in Santa Cruz County in 2020. And I'll just briefly describe this. So the graph on the left of affordable homes shortfall shows um, the number of extremely low income and very low income households in our community. Extremely low income is a, a housing term. Generally it's people living at around 200% of the federal poverty level in Santa Cruz. That's the group that's most at risk of experiencing homelessness. And the, the gap in affordable homes for very low income, extremely low income households in this community is around 10,000, a little over 10,000. And for this analysis, that they're looking at a community standard of 30% um, of your income going to pay for housing related costs. So if we were to have a perfectly created housing system, we'd have 10,000 more affordable housing units for very low income and extremely low income uh, community members. And the graph on the right shows who are the most cost burden households in our community? And not surprisingly, it's extremely low income households. So 75% of people in this income group are paying more than a half of their income on housing costs. And that, that marker, half of your income on housing at the national level is con considered a severe housing cost burden, which is the group that's most likely to live in unstable, overcrowded, unsafe uh, living conditions and to become homeless. So we really need to, direct our attention to creating more income growth opportunities and affordable housing for that population if we're really gonna prevent and end homelessness. This slide is to share with you all um, how we're doing as a community relative to some agreed upon goals that are set um, collaboratively between our local jurisdiction and officials at the state level in the California Housing Community Development Department. Um, every eight years, our community and others throughout the state have to establish a housing element 
that has some goals around housing production. And this slide shows goals that were established um, back in 2015. And so the goals that we're working on actually coincide with the framework. It's a coincidence that we have um, by the end of 2023. Um, how many types of housing permits should we be issuing for different income groups within our community? And this shows percentages, which can be a little bit misleading because it doesn't show the actual numbers. Um, I can make that available uh, to folks who are interested, but I wanted to show the percentages to just show a high level picture. Um, on the far right, you can see how different jurisdictions in our community are doing with the overall number of housing units. But on the far left, you can see the group that's most likely to experience homelessness, uh, how we're doing with creating more housing for that income category. And, and not surprisingly to me at least, uh, that's the group where we're struggling the most. The goal we had through this process is 734 new housing units for that income population. And we have till the end of 2023 to get to that goal. And we're at 76 units to date. So if we're really gonna make a dent in homelessness, we've got to close that gap. And that has to be a primary area of our focus um, together. I shared earlier that the stories we tell um, really make a difference in terms of how we do our work and how we think about what we're doing. Um, and I, I wanna put out to members of the board, uh, members of the community, some stories that I've heard in my three and a half months here that I think may be getting in the way of us moving forward with a positive uh, agenda. Number one is I've heard a fair amount of people say, well, let's do that. Let's get people into shelter now and we'll work on the housing later. Um, in my career, what I've seen is we end up focusing on shelter and we never get to the housing later. So we really need to find that balance between using shelter as a pathway to get people into housing, but not as an end result in itself. So if we are gonna do managed encampments or some kind of safe housing effort, we need to think about how do we resource that so it can be an effective place for people to transition to something that's lasting and more permanent and it helps them to thrive in the community. Another very common thing that comes up in around the country related to homelessness is that people experiencing homelessness come to particular communities for services. And there may be some truth to that. I mean, people, people do go where they can get help, but there have been multiple research studies and a lot of data that indicates that that is clearly not the primary reason why certain communities have more people experiencing homelessness. Uh, it may be a factor, but it's not the primary factor. And, and when we use that as the, the dominant narrative in our messaging, I, I think we get distracted from what's really driving homelessness. And that's that gap between what people can afford with their incomes and the cost of housing. I, I think another thing that happens when we're talking about homelessness is um, the, the human rights, um, travesties that we have in our communities around the country with people living in these large encampments with lots of health and safety issues and challenges. Um, those become the dominant ways we think about homelessness. I think it's important to remember that in most communities, and that's the, tr the truth here in Santa Cruz as well, the people we see in encampments are a very small fraction of the people experiencing homelessness. So if we devote all of our resources and attention to those living in encampments, we're gonna forget a large group of people who are experiencing homelessness and, and more private ways that we may not see um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Randy alluded to this next story um, that is also very common nationally um, where uh, it was such a challenging, complicated issue uh, on some levels. Uh, it's, it's hard when we're not getting to a point where we can see success. So it's often the case that people will say, well, they're not doing enough. Uh, the county's not doing enough, the city's not doing enough, that person's not doing enough. I would encourage us to move away from the they to we are not doing enough. All of us together are not doing enough and we all can do better. Um, so let's figure out how to do that. Um, and the, another dominant narrative uh, is that mental health and addiction are the primary drivers of homelessness. And, and I think it's important that we reframe that. Uh, a lot of historians who look at how we end up with the situation we're in and how the deinstitutionalization of people with serious mental health issues has have contributed to homelessness. It's actually not the health problems themselves that are contributing to homelessness. It's the fact that we didn't create housing and supports for people who are struggling with these health problems that is a, a major contributor to homelessness. So 
as our nation and our state and our communities help people transition from inhumane institutional settings in theory back to the community, we fail to invest adequately in the community housing and the supports that people need to be successful. We still haven't made adequate investments. And for us to make progress for people struggling with these health conditions, we, we need to figure out how do we match those kinds of wraparound services that help people to stay in housing with affordable housing for people to live in. You can't just have the healthcare services alone without the housing. Another common narrative is that we just need a little bit more outreach um, for those uh, that want the help. And um, we certainly do need more outreach and we need to be more organized, but outreach alone isn't gonna help people get on a pathway into permanent housing and into situations that will help them to thrive and be connected in the community. We need outreach that's connected with other resources that pe get people on a path. So outreach alone isn't gonna get us there. The other thing I wanted to say about outreach is that um, if you've experienced homelessness or have had struggles in your life, it's easy to, to lose hope. Um, and if you have had many experiences where it's hard for you to develop trust with people who are working for government or with a nonprofit, it can take a long time to build trust. So I'm often in meetings where people say, well, a lot, a lot of those folks out there, they don't want help, do they? And it, it often depends on what we're offering and whether it's, tuned into what the person is asking for and where they're at in their own process of thinking about uh, engaging with someone on a path to uh, longer term housing and stability. What I found over and over again in my career is if you can spend the time with people and really get to know them and their stories um, and build that trust that the people who don't want help, quote unquote, become people that want to move into housing and really benefit from that support. I think another thing that's fairly common, uh, and there's a lot of migration happening in California because of the cost of housing. Um, a lot of people who are earning pretty decent incomes are moving because of the cost of housing throughout the state. And I, I think we have to be careful of this narrative of um, folks experiencing homelessness should move somewhere else. The, the data from the studies on homelessness um, that are done every year in this community that include surveys indicate that about three fourths of people experiencing homelessness are from Santa Cruz and lost their housing in Santa Cruz before becoming homeless. Um, and I think this, this narrative speaks to this idea of equity inclusion and inclusion, which is one of our principles. How do we create a community that is equitable and inclusive of the diverse range of people who, who live um, and wanna be members of our community? So I think we just need to be careful about this notion that uh, folks should move elsewhere. How, how do we balance um, the reality that housing uh, is largely in, unaffordable um, at the moment with a goal to be more inclusive uh, in terms of how we think about residential development and housing development in our community. So this is a high level analysis of what our goals are in our strategic framework, where we are with resources, and um, I'll quickly go through it and happy to answer questions. So. The blue bar um, in each sector, so they're on the bottom, the x-axis, there's different interventions we've included in our framework that we feel like we need to help address homelessness. One is we need proactive outreach. That's really building those relationships and helping to connect people, break through those trust barriers and connect people to resources that matter. Um, shelter and transitional housing, those are initial kind of connections, creating safe ways for people to get in with supportive folks and live in safe situations, rapid rehousing, permanent support housing and affordable housing. So for each of these types of categories of interventions, uh, we came up with some estimated cost, And then the available dollars refers to our best guess of how much money we have the next um, fiscal year for that kind of intervention that's already budgeted. And the gray bar indicates of that money that we have, how much of it is one-time funding. So unfortunately, the federal government and the state have been, fortunately and unfortunately, the federal government and the state have been sending lots of one-time funding allocations to us at the local level to address homelessness, but there's limits to what we can do with one-time funding. Um, so this graph is trying to highlight for you uh, as board members, but also the community, a lot of the money we have currently is one-time funding. And this graphic does not include the one-time FEMA-related funding that we have to help with our COVID uh, sheltering effort for folks. So at a very high level, 
this graph shows that if, if we want to achieve the targets in our overall framework, we need an estimated $65 million um, annually. And next year, we're around 30 million, gathering all the various, not all of that is county money. So it's city, county, federal money that may be going directly to nonprofits. Um, and of that 30 million, we have about 10 million of it is one-time money that will last us a year or two. So, so the biggest gaps um, where we um, have the most need for additional resources, you can see are in the affordable housing column uh, and shelter and transitional housing and proactive outreach. And um, as Randy alluded to, we're gonna have to make some difficult decisions about where we invest our funding because it, it's not likely to get us to that $65 million level um, in the short term. So I'm getting close to the end of the presentation. Wanted to highlight some of the things that we have uh, in our first six month plan. Randy alluded to this and it is one of my personal goals, uh, really working on being more clear and transparent about what we're doing with our money, what are our outcomes. We have a ways to go to get there, but that is one of the things that we've incorporated into our framework, finding ways to get information out to the public and to help people understand what, what's happening with our efforts. Uh, the other item here um, is related to a board package we're bringing to you all on March 23rd. We have um, the very significant effort that we've undertaken with over 200 county staff and community-based organizations to help people experiencing homelessness get into safe living situations during the pandemic. The Biden administration extended the funding available through FEMA, which only covers a portion of the overall cost of this effort um, through September. But we have to start a process of preparing to demobilize that sheltering effort. And we, um, within our team, created this term, a rehousing wave. So we're bringing forward a big package of uh, new contracts and programs to you all uh, for review and approval to get started with a, a fairly massive rehousing effort to help as many people as possible who are in our sheltering programs get into permanent housing before we have to close um, the current COVID-19 related shelters. Uh, the Housing Authority of the County of Santa Cruz has contributed to this effort. They set aside 75 housing vouchers, which I'm incredibly grateful for and wanna honor and appreciate their board for that set aside. And then we have some significant rapid rehousing programming embedded in here, as well as some evidence-based practices to help folks experiencing homelessness. Uh, our, our next six month plan calls for us to really reflect on how we're investing in shelter and transitional housing and make sure we're investing in ways that get the best outcomes for people that align with the goals in the framework. Um, we wanna have a, a new structure for how we work together and build a coalition from the ground up. We are really committed to working with our city partners and community members to draft and, and move toward implementing some guidelines around how we respond together to and support people living in encampments. Uh, Project Home Key is some funding that will be available from the state to help us acquire properties that we've been using for our COVID-19 sheltering effort or other properties that we can use to help close that housing gap. And there's this term getting to zero. There's um, some national efforts around the country that have shown a lot of promise. When you, you focus on creating a list of people by name and by story, uh, folks experiencing homelessness, and you work through that list of people one by one and connect them with appropriate resources, you can get to this idea of what folks call functional zero, where the number of people experiencing homelessness in a given month is small enough that you have a system that can help them get back into housing uh, within that one month period. And we are relatively close with some subpopulations of folks experiencing homelessness. For example, veterans, um, we are relatively close to getting to that functional zero level um, we have around, according to our data, 80 homeless veterans at the moment. And I think with um, some focused efforts and work with property owners, we, we can make significant progress. We also um, are at the direction of the board, creating a work group specifically around families experiencing homelessness. So that's adults with children and really trying to work out what do we need to get to zero for that subpopulation. And then having some data that we can share with folks on a regular basis to show um, the progress that we're making. And that is the end of our presentation. And thank you for allowing us to go over time. And Randy and I are here to take any questions. Uh, no, that's thank you for the presentation. Very, very uh, well done. And uh, I want to thank um, you for that and for what you've been doing and also for the CAO's office for making this a top priority in Santa Cruz County. 
Uh, I know we're going to be continuing looking at the gaps uh, that exist between our resources and our goals, and there are great, there are many, and they are great. Um, but I also think it's equally important to promote our accomplishments as we go along, because we have accomplished some things, as I mentioned before, and we want to really be uh, uh, transparent about that. So uh, I know that we're going to have the six-month work plans, and we'll be able to uh, relay that to that uh, to the general public. Uh, do we have any, uh, I don't know, Mr. Morris, if you had anything else that you wanted to say, but I think I'd like to get some comments from the board first. No, just ready yeah. to answer questions. Okay, very good. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ratner and uh, Director Morris for the presentation. Um, I, you know, the, the most ambitious goal, it seems, in the plan is this, uh, the rapid rehousing wave and going from 140 units to 490. And, um, you know, I guess my, my primary concern is, you know, as you described, we've got this huge shortage of affordable housing in the community. Um, can you just describe a little bit more, like, what that program looks like, how, how we're going to be able to find those additional units? Um, you know, I remember in the focus strategies report here and kind of the shocking statistic that right now we're spending somewhere between 16 and $19,000 um, kind of in that time period of, of someone being in temporary housing that we're looking for one of these housing slots. Um, so that kind of spoke to me of like the difficulty of, of actually accomplishing this. Um, is there any change in tactics here? Um, or are we, you know, are we just throwing more, more vouchers at the problem? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Supervisor Koenig. And I, I think we'll have to see whether or not the intervention is successful to your point. Um, one of the things that's significantly different with our proposed re, rapid rehousing programs is the amount of money we're budgeting to help with the transition of people from the current hotel situation into a permanent situation. Um, and the services model we're promoting is something called the strength-based model that's shown a lot of promise around the country for helping people to work on their personal goals and plans and, and move forward. And I think your point about the private um, housing landscape, because the rapid rehousing model is entirely dependent on finding units in the community for folks experiencing homelessness and using transitional income supports is one way to think about it. You give people a little bit of extra money to pay for rent for a period of time and hope that they can increase that income over time. I think one of the one of the things we're doing is we're um, contracting, and you'll see this in our proposal on the 23rd, for a more centralized approach to building relationships with property owners. So what we're calling a real estate partnership program that's shown a lot of promise around the country, where you actually have staff who are really focused on meeting the needs of property owners and making sure that the the supports that people need to be successful are actually there and. Um, actually spending time, I've been really surprised in my career at how many people really want to contribute to addressing this problem. And what communities around the country have seen is if you actually organize an effort to partner with folks who have property and land, you can make a lot of progress. I think the other reality is we're going to have to help people um, learn to share. Um, I mean, I, I have had to do this in my life. I still do it. I share my housing with others. So to be able to afford an average $2,200 a month apartment unit, and if you're living on Social Security at $1,000 a month, you're going to have to find a way to share a place with people. So I think we'll see over time with this effort how successful we are, and, and we may need to reevaluate whether rapid rehousing alone um, is going to work in the absence of creating more affordable housing. Robert, can I recommend, and I hope I'm not embarrassing you, you share some of the statistics that you and I have just heard about your work in your former community and the unsolicited update you got about the interventions you put in place there with Project Room Key. I think it's worth highlighting. I think this is Supervisor Koenig's question. This stuff can work, asterisk. You have to track for long-term outcomes, but in the short term, your work in your former jurisdiction is working. Yeah, well, and Randy's alluding, all this takes a village. So uh, I, I was working in um, Alameda County and they also were involved with the project room key efforts. And we put in place rapid rehousing, also some expanded subsidies from our local housing authorities. And um, Alameda County has helped 400 people get into permanent homes from their project room key sites, um, which is a really, uh, great success. Um, and I think what we'll see over time, how many of those folks are able to keep housing. So there's evidence that a coordinated effort with rapid rehousing and some permanent long-term subsidies from the housing authority can really make a difference. 
Right. Yeah, that, that's that is encouraging that, uh, you know, having some kind of partnership program is a lot better than having none. Uh, my, you know, I, I love that in the report, you kind of highlight these four things that lead to uh, lead to homelessness and, um, you know, that one of them is or, or a couple of them lack of supportive connections and loss of hope and sense of purpose. Uh, that's really uh, something I've heard repeated. Um, the, the quote that stuck with me is that a lot of time people are suffering not from um, a poverty of things, but a poverty of relationships. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly to this point, the loss of hope, uh, when I visited with the downtown streets team, uh, it was so encouraging to hear people who were part of that program to say, you know, this is the first time I feel like I have goals again. You know, if you're, you know, if you're, you're probably familiar with the program, but, you know, every time, but every, uh, at least once a week, uh, they review, you know, hiring opportunities in the community. They promote people, um, you know, throughout the organization to greater levels of responsibility. Um, and it's really something I, I've heard echoed, you know, whether it's the Homeless Garden Project, um, you know, even programs like the state's fire camp system, um, which, uh, which puts folks who were previously incarcerated uh, to work helping in fighting fires. So work, I think opportunities really help build that sense of self um, and that sense of hope. And I'm just curious, you know, I, I don't see it explicitly defined in the plan today. How, you know, are, are we looking at, um, you know, making more funding available to these kinds of programs like Homeless Garden Project or, or Downtown Streets Team and how that might fit in the strategy? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I also personally believe that, um, and there's a lot of research to support the idea that health and wellness is dependent on having meaningful things to do every day, whether it's income growth um, or volunteerism or um, helping out with um, schooling your children at home. Like That's really important to our overall health. Um, and I, I think part of what we can do as a community is as we, we launch these new programs, how do we actually hire people who've experienced homelessness and train and support them to be part of the solution. We often are um, hiring people um, who don't have experience. So downtown street team is a, an interesting, not in, it's a great model for how do we involve the people who are trying to help and being part of the solution. So I think that's something certainly to look at. So within our different interventions, thinking about who do we hire and um, creating work opportunities for people experiencing homelessness. We're, we're not talking about it today, but in our, um, proposals around the coalition that we hope to bring together. I think the private sector and the business community and finding and educational community, finding ways for people to get back into meaningful activities and things that they wanted to do in their lives and have been able to do, I think is really critical. Um, and the framework itself doesn't call out these kinds of glue supportive services, but they're, they're embedded in all these different interventions. So I, I think what you're bringing up is really critical. It's critical for the rapid rehousing model. It's based on income growth as part of that overall strategy. So I think helping people to find work and ways to increase their income, it's gotta be part of what we do. So I look forward to working with your office on um, building those parts of our effort. Uh, Robert, I just want to piggyback and make a comment that one thing we government sometimes lose sight of is we think we government are the solution. And sometimes we government need to, to piggyback on the previous presentation from CAB and Supervisor Caput saying there's trust sometimes with community organization where there's not with government. There are many, many things we can do. And there are some people who just a little bit of nudge to reconnect with their family or friends with a little bit of support. And maybe that's through community partners, not government, can help people reconnect. And that's a pathway. That's not brick and mortar permanent housing slots. It's just reconnecting people with their community with a little help. And that's a whole other conversation we could talk about later. But I think that's in part a response to your question one of the multi-pronged approach. And actually this is something Robert and I worked on in our former jurisdiction, where sometimes you can just help people come together and help that family come together and get resources to that family. So the person's off the streets back with their family. And that's not about a permanent supportive housing slot. So we can talk more about that over time as well. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, I like, yeah, you know, the question of answering the question, who do we hire? Um, it, it kind of dovetails for me with the, um, you know, the presentation we saw at our last meeting about substance use disorder and hearing how effective, um, you know, people who have overcome um, substance use themselves are at helping others um, and, and really made me think maybe those are folks that we could look at at, you know, hiring in our insurance services program or other related services. 
Um, my last question for you, you know, you, you kind of mentioned it uh, obliquely there at the end of your presentation about the, the in the getting to zero work groups. Um, but it's, you know, something we've heard work, uh, you know, example in Bakersfield and, and how they got to functional zero was this by name directory. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, as we look at like the six month work plan, I didn't see explicitly the, the by name directory in there or anything, but of course you talked a lot about HMIS, um, you know, how should we, should we associate the sort of a, a by name directory approach with, you know, the getting to zero work groups or HMIS or, you know, where, where is it in the, in the plan? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it's not specifically called out, but it certainly is uh, embedded in some of the high level items with getting those work groups started. Um, we, in part because we've made some shifts around how the homeless management information system contract is structured. And now that we have the new division, we can have a little bit more ability to, to coordinate around that. We, we have staff already working on creating reports of the different um, subpopulations of people experiencing homelessness. The fact that I can actually tell you how many veterans is a byproduct of some of that work. Um, and in our next presentation to the board, I think we'll be able to share like how many people do we have on these different subpopulations. I, I do wanna say a word of caution about that. Um, some of it is dependent on how welcoming our system is. So. It only represents the people that come to us for support or how well we are outreaching. So it, it often is not a complete um, capture of the universe, but that's the, the aspiration is to have a system that's welcoming enough, connected enough with people who are struggling that we have really got a representative list of the people who are in that situation. Um, so uh, it, I think you're, I've, the data dashboard item, this is part of what we wanna have in our, our data dashboards is where are we with these getting to zero list. So thanks for flagging that. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. It's great to know uh, just 80 veterans and counting. Very good. That's all my good. questions. Thank you. Right. Good. Supervisor Frank. Uh, Bruce. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead, Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your presentation. And uh, I think some of the key things are what are they doing or what are we doing? And I, I just wanted to, uh, right here at the Veterans Memorial Building where I'm working, right, right outside the door is uh, Homeless Shelter, Emergency Shelter. And I'm just gonna introduce real quick uh, uh, two of the frontline workers uh, there's, uh, that are working here every day uh, with people that are really in need. And that's uh, Cassandra Preciado and Jatsuri Munoz. And they're right here with me. Uh, uh, they're right on the other side of the door. So let me introduce. Uh, well, you know, we want to get that. Okay, uh, go ahead quickly because we want to get some questions and answers and move yeah. on. We're okay. behind schedule. Oh yeah. Hi. Um. So we are both supervisors at the Watson Red Hall. We are currently um serving our uh, community members, those who are in need, by providing them um, resources with any, any help that they need. So whether it may be a uh, drug addiction, um, um, and then also obviously homelessness, and then also um, anything else that they are in need of, um, we, our responsibility is to kind of guide them towards professionals that are able to, to help them out as much as possible. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Supervisor. Yeah, Supervisor. Uh, that's, that's thanks, Bruce. Uh, yeah, put some face on uh, the people that are actually doing all the work uh, for us. Yeah, I didn't want to have a, a supervisor friend. You have any comments? The yes, I do. I have some questions and comments. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Thank you, Dr. Ratner. Um, let me begin by thanking you both for your community outreach including uh, generously offering your time in my district uh, to do a town hall with me, answer a lot of uh, my constituents' questions, and also incorporate that feedback into that plan. I'd like to be, uh, actually begin by saying I fully support uh, what you are bringing forward. And uh, actually some of the questions I had were uh, for my colleagues on their item because uh, I wasn't sure if uh, we ever defined actually what a unit was. So um, we, we talk about 120 units. Could somebody define what that means? Uh, sure, I can 
uh, feel that. So, I mean, I think we're looking at, you know, any housing unit, um, there's not at this point a definition that it's, you know, for one person or two person. Um, you know, we've seen uh, communities use a variety of different structures. Um, you know, I mentioned tiny homes or Conestoga huts um, or, uh, you know, pallet shelters like are currently being used at the, the Housing Matters campus. You know, there as well, of course, Housing Matters has some single person uh, pallet shelters and multi-person uh, pallet shelters. Um, so, you know, I guess right now the, the you know, minimum viable definition of a, of a housing unit would be something that just houses at least one person um, and where they could, um, you know, live for a, the, you know, indefinite amount of time in a, in a way that's, you know, safe and healthy. Okay, so it's pretty broad, Supervisor Koenig. I mean, but I think that we just want to be sure that we provide what that clarity is because it defines whether or not we succeed based on the metrics that you're outlining. Um, I, I think that based on a lot of the emails that we all receive, a lot of people define that unit as a tent, and, and I wouldn't. Um, I, I consider that to be an inadequate uh, living situation, not something that we should be working toward, but working away from. Uh, really an element of last resort. I think it um, institutionalizes an unfortunate living condition that we should be better than. Uh, so I would like to uh, ensure that the word from the board is that that we're trying to get people into safe, stable housing and away from uh, encampments and that sort of living conditions. But I think we need to provide that clarity and, and the item wasn't clear as it was presented. It just said 120 units. And I think a lot of members of the community clearly think that that means encampments. So are you saying that it doesn't mean that within your definition? I would look to some definition around uh, the ability to, um, you know, safely store items. You know, like whether that's uh, a, a housing unit that actually itself locks, or um, you know, potentially it's something where there's lockable storage on site. Um, that you know, I, I'm, if we want to introduce more definition into this particular proposal, I'm certainly open to that. Um, but yeah, that's, those are the lines I would think along. Thank you. Um, and for me, I mean, I, I have some concerns about the item in a sense that it actually conflicts with elements of the three-year plan that we're looking to adopt. Um, for example, the strategic plan talks about it being countywide in scope. Um, realistically, all the item that's coming forward right now talks about the unincorporated area, and they, they really are part and parcel. And I think that, you know, it, we shouldn't silo the discussion if we're serious about the issue, we should start with an aim of housing people, not limiting where that housing can be. And the proposal even talks about it within the urban services line, which interestingly functionally eliminates three of the districts from even consideration on this. And I don't, under, I mean, if, you, if you're a faith-based organization like the Baha'i in Bonnie Doon or the Methodist Church in Boulder Creek and you want to participate, I don't see why the board would limit their ability to do that. And so I don't, uh, really understand the rationale of why the item that's being brought forward actually limits this. Because if we're talking about um, the county having a role, as in the unincorporated county, then we shouldn't eliminate, you know, 50% of the landmass, the unincorporated area. So would you be open to eliminating the urban services line requirement only because um, I feel like it eliminates a lot of possibilities as far as faith-based or organizations or other places that that could also work within all of our districts? Uh, you know, obviously, I can't speak for Supervisor Coonerty. Um, uh, I'm, I'm certainly open to getting rid of it. Uh, my, I think the intention, one of the intentions in including it was just to go after the lowest hanging fruit, you know, areas that could potentially uh, be hooked up to, um, you know, sewer service uh, or just be, um, you know, more closely uh, accessible to services. But I think, you, yeah, you certainly make an excellent point about a lot of opportunities existing outside of this urban services line. And, and I mean, I would support that change. I mean, I, I struggle to support it as currently written for a, a couple of reasons, but I would absolutely support it with that change and an additional change that doesn't eliminate the cities in this discussion. The last time Dr. Ratner and Mr. Morris, uh, Morris came forward, we specifically, Supervisor and Coonerty and myself, both made very clear that the cities had a pretty major role here, which is why we actually directed them to go to all the cities to have these conversations. I think the inventory in the cities is as equally as important as the inventory in the unincorporated area. There are areas, for example, in Aptos that, that might be better than Capitola, but there may be actionable opportunities in Capitola. 
as was evidenced by the RENA numbers that were put forward here. Uh, the cities actually, at least on the lowest income levels, seem like there's some work that could be done. And so I think that uh, what I would also like to see as part of the motion is that we expand it out. We just don't, we don't limit it. Even though, even if the 120 units stays within the greater unincorporated area, I'd like to see the human services department in conjunction with the cities put forward an inventory of what currently exists there, because we're making uh, pretty broad statements that there's an overburden in certain areas, including the city of Watson, Watsonville, which I co-represent with my other colleague, uh, but also then what other opportunities are there? Because that actually hasn't been shown. I mean, there's no data right now that shows how many units are currently in existence or these kinds of things within the unincorporated area. For example, in the last two years, I've worked with um, the faith community in Cabrillo to put locations for RVs, for safe parking and other situations within my district. But I don't know that that's even necessarily known. So um, I, again, I'm not sure why we're just limiting in the unincorporated area. And so I, I would ask sort of whether you and, and Supervisor Coonerty are, are comfortable with at least at a minimum having that inventory for both existing programs and opportunities to not preclude the cities as well. Uh, so, I mean, I, 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 so one, let me go back to the point about the urban services line. I think the idea was that some of the infrastructure costs and then the lack of transportation costs make um, places outside the urban services line more difficult. In terms of like what already exists, two thirds of the safe parking spots exist in the city of Santa Cruz. They're in three different supervisorial districts, but they're all functionally in the city of Santa Cruz. The city of Watsonville and the city of Santa Cruz have opened up the vets halls. The city of Santa Cruz has opened up the armory, obviously that's the homeless services center. Pallet shelter is now there. The encampment outside of the armory um, and so I think, you know, the, I'm certainly open in the motion to expanding it to Scotts Valley, you know, requesting uh, action by Scotts Valley and Capitola, who certainly uh, need to expand it. And I think the idea was that you also have uh, permanent supportive housing programs coming forward uh, at the Homeless Services Center. Uh, potentially, uh, the staff is working on one on the Freedom Campus. Um, but that if we're gonna if we're gonna really spread that housing uh, and or interim shelter options, and I agree with you that uh, encampments are um, are not humane and not the direction we want to go. Um, but that whether it's tiny homes or huts or other things that are that are get people safe is is the direction we want to go. But I think you know the real purpose of this was really to say. There's, there's been a far greater concentration in the cities um, and it's time for the unincorporated areas to, to come forward with, with available sites um, so that, so that you know, it's a, the unincorporated area has the largest urban population in the county yet doesn't have the same amount of services as the two cities do. So then that speaks then to my point, Supervisor Coonerty, that, that it would it would benefit your argument if that data were presented by not limiting it to the unincorporated area. So none of that information was provided either in the three-year report or in your board item. So I, I don't see why we limit um, the, the in existence of current programs to just, I mean, we need an inventory, right? When we don't even necessarily know where everything is currently located. But I think that that inventory should include places like the city of Santa Cruz to show us what's there and should highlight uh, in the city of Watsonville and should highlight um, the burden that you you refer to. But I also know that uh, the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville have been working even with the county on the siting of other locations. So I think it's important for us to be aware of where those opportunities are too. As far as the, the rural services line or outside of the urban services line, um, you know, there's nothing precluding, for example, a location in Boulder Creek from taking two units or three units or four units that would actually then help alleviate the overall burden. I mean, I think that we are artificially reducing opportunities by making this statement uh, because there are areas within the urban services line of my district that get a bus one, once every hour, for example. It's not exactly great for access to transportation. It's no different from the line that goes to Davenport or the line that goes up the 35 that goes up to uh, Boulder Creek. So I, I think that, that we shouldn't do that precluding, but I agree with you that if it's a statement of where there's a greater concentration of services, then human services can come back at that six month point and say, well, as a result of that, maybe 10 units or 15 units or 20 units should be within X location within the urban services line and only two or four or five in another location. But, um, it, but I mean, just, just note, but also from 
a pure commentary on the overall community, this does functionally preclude three of the districts. So it's sort of an odd thing to, you know, cast a vote that that when you just have urban services line, I mean, that's that's two streets functionally in Supervisor McPherson's district is two streets in Supervisor Kappa's district. And, you know, it's basically 7th Avenue and yours. So well, I think that well, we should- except that, except that what we're talking about is community impact. So it's 95% of my constituents live in the city of Santa Cruz who have more than, even though we're a quarter of the population, have over half the homeless population and a vast majority of the services. So to, I mean, I think, and Supervisor Cap and Supervisor Pearson, who represents the Harvey West area, our constituents are far more impacted uh, under the current scenario than, than, than other districts. So the, our districts, this is the, this is the, the vast, most significant crisis uh, that we're facing among the for the majority of our populations, so we're dealing with it on a you know minute by minute or hour by hour basis. And and there's an agreement to do an expansion out. I'm I'm asking you not to limit it. I mean that's that's how I'll support the item if I can see that we get rid of the urban services line requirement because the board can still make that determination when options come back in six months whether we consider that acceptable or not. But by precluding it, you've eliminated even the option. And I also think that as far as the inventory component goes, we should get a sense of uh, where current services are and where there are opportunities that include the cities, because it does speak to, you know, the two cities that you mentioned, but all the cities in general, just being able to have that information. I think that information actually would bolster your argument, quite frankly. Um, and I just, I feel like if we're going to be data driven here, then we should be providing that data in a very transparent way to the entire community. Yeah. And I think uh, just, just to work towards I am supportive, but we can absolutely do an inventory. But I think the idea is um, we should do an inventory of where services currently are. And then also the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County needs to commit to 120 of the units because there's going to be a perpetual argument to keep saying, well, we already have some services there. Let's just put more and more and more services there. And what this is really saying is, Look, there are homeless people across the county. We need to have services in each part of the county uh, to respond to that. I, I, so absolutely, I, think, I, I, apologize. I, I absolutely was not disagreeing with that. I, I was completely comfortable with that. And I think that the report that comes back could differentiate cities and unincorporated and still have 120 in the unincorporated. I'm trying to get better data. And also, I feel like that helps inform all of us and the community better. And secondly, I'm trying to not preclude rural services line option, or actually I should say just outside of the urban services line, because there may be opportunities in some of those areas for small things, especially within the faith community. So if I understand uh, your, you know, effectively your amendment supervisor friend, uh, it would be in the second of the recommended actions uh, for item nine to uh, read, identify and prioritize available public and private property, as well as county property, strike out outside of the cities of Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Capitola, Scotts Valley, um, and then continued that could be used for temporary shelter operations. Uh, also inventory current, um, uh, current homeless services throughout the county period, and then or, or I should say, provide a, provide a list of current inventory as well as potential sites and report back during the six month work plan progress report on available option. Is that? So yeah, and then on item three, strike the urban services line to include, well, just strike the urban services line. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think just to be clear, I, so I'm not supportive of just sort of opening up item number two to all the areas. If we want to, I think the commitment in the unincorporated area it needs to be clear. If we wanna do an inventory, we need to do an inventory um, and we can get that report back, but let's let's move forward with the recommendation today of 120 in the unincorporated area in the urban services line and we can get a report back on, you know, outside the urban services line and and also a request to Scotts. We don't, we obviously don't control Scotts Valley and Capitola's land use um, so we can make a, a request to those jurisdictions uh, yeah. to report on what they what they can do within their within their jurisdictional lines. And I wasn't proposing to strike the 120 units. I was just proposing to strike in the unincorporated area. Period. I was just proposing to strike that it be limited to the urban services line specifically in the unincorporated area. Again, the board would have 
the ability to make a determination when these sites come forward, whether that's something we feel comfortable with at that time, but precluding that opportunity, I, I just don't understand. So I'm completely with you, 120 units unincorporated area. I'm just trying to say it can be, we shouldn't preclude again, a church in, in Boulder Creek, for example, if, they, if it's a, a match for five units, uh, to at least be considered under the operation in six months. I, I see that Director Morris has his hands up too, and I, I apologize that he hasn't had an opportunity to weigh in. Thank you. I'm not so much weighing in. I just want to share a perspective to help give us direction so we can comply. Um, what's missing from this, and, and I don't think it was intentional, but I just want to put this on the table, is there's very likely going to be cost involved in moving anything forward. So we showed you the financial gap analysis. If we do a full inventory to stand up and um, make sites available, there's gonna likely be cost involved, which is gonna require us to come back to your board anyways. So I think I keep hearing you supervised friends say the full board has discretion. We don't plan on moving anything forward without coming back to the board with an inventory, with an estimate of what cost would be involved, what steps would need to be involved. And on this item nine, it does say we're supposed to report back on our efforts and bring forward any barriers. And I think we're gonna to have to bring forward where we have money and get your support to execute that money or where the gaps are. So I'm just throwing out there, I don't think anything's gonna happen between now and when we're back in August to execute this. And we would benefit from a full discussion with your board in August to get your direction on where to pick and choose if our resources aren't enough. So I hope that's helpful, but, th but the clarity on direction would be helpful. I think the both and is um, if the inventory is correct, there's a burden on cities and there's opportunity to unincorporate it. We will bring that inventory back and then we need direction from you where to put those resources. So Supervisor Coonerty, I, I just don't know, if, I don't feel like we're very far off except for on the urban services line component because I'm with you on the 120, I'm, I'm with you on the inventory. Um, I just, again, if I'm limiting Mr. Morris's research to not include that, I feel like I've, I've made a mistake of, of where we can make that determination pre-August. And so I'm just asking for that ability to have him come back with that. You know, I think, look, I, I, I understand your argument. I think right now, let's try to identify the spots within the urban services line, given that there are services and everything from inf the infrastructure we need to potential transportation to other things that that I'm comfortable with the direction as is, but I'm willing to, you know, if we have a motion, we can have a, we can have a, uh, in fact, it's getting late. So, I mean, maybe, maybe we're at the stage where we should have a motion, um, but I'm, you know, you're more than welcome to, uh, to offer uh, that, uh, that amendment to the motion when, when we get to that moment, get to that time. Thank you. Yeah, Chair, do you want to, should, should we? Yeah. Uh, I get that public comment. Yeah, I, I, there's one other point I would want to make um, that, that I think should be included in this, uh, this great discussion, and I think uh, very well taken. But I, I think we should have it for the unincorporated area that no county park be included in the area to be used as a temporary shelter uh, in the unincorporated area. I mean, our parklands, we, we fight tooth and nail to get them established. And they are for the general purposes of the all of the public, homeless or not homeless. And we need to protect those uh, and make sure they're protected so they don't become encampments. Uh, we have plenty of parcels and we're going to be investigating those. But I think we should we should have, uh, and I would really like to give the additional direction as well, um, that no car, uh, county park site be included as an area to be used as temporary shelters uh, in the unincorporated area. I just want to protect our parks for the, the entire general public. Uh, so that's that's the direction I would like to have included. Uh, now I will go to the public for comments. I'm sure that we have, do we have plenty of people that? Uh, yes, Chair, we have. Would, how many, go ahead. We have five speakers currently listed, six to speak to this item. Okay, and uh, get two minutes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, speakers. You will have two minutes from the point that you're unmuted to make your comments. Your microphone will mute automatically. Please remember you can only speak once per item. Caller user four, you're unmuted.
Hi, I've been listening all morning uh, for the constricted two minutes you have put the public comment at Chair McPherson. I did take notes on that uh, very informative and insightful presentation, and I'd like to incorporate some of that in my comments. You spoke of root problems and financial gap even before this lockdown over half our tax dollars go to the military budget, and we are left with crumbs to fight over to provide for problems like homelessness. And and there's something wrong with those priorities. I want to excerpt a document, and one of the sections is called Social Determination of Health, and the other section, lockdowns, inconvenient or deadly, because where it's over 70 million Americans have filed for unemployment claims in 2020, and part of that, of course, is Santa Cruz County, this is the context we're in our now. So just briefly, Lockdowns are super spreaders of massive fear and anxiety and have already caused profound disruption of our lives, unlike anything that has ever been seen. Destroyed economies, massive unemployment, mental and physical health problems, restricted. Caller 1999, your microphone is unmuted. Yes, hello. My name is James Ewing Whitman, and I really want to thank Dr. Ratner and Mr. Morris. I'm not sure which one of you is Randy and which one of you is Robert. You guys said so many things that were incredibly positive and useful. I'm still not sure if you guys are approaching this from a micro view, micro view or a macro view. So since I only have two minutes, this might just be a corporate poop cracker. But here's three points that I don't think were mentioned. I believe it was President Roosevelt who brought community members together, hundreds of thousands of them in the United States that ended the Great Depression of 1929 to the beginning of World War II. I think that's a suggestion. You know, there's a lot of homeless everywhere in the United States, and I couldn't find in my notes, but I believe in early September 2020, Wells Fargo Bank bought $14 billion in U.S. home loans that were in arrears. What's going to happen when all those people get foreclosed on? And now I believe the state of California now has the first right to buy foreclosed on homes in California. So once again, I really think that we're moving in several steps. I really think we're moving several steps forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker Abby Young. You have two minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, greetings to the Board of Supervisors, Chair McPherson and all the supervisors. I so much appreciated what you said today. I feel so much encouraged by your comprehensive approach that the county's taking leadership and dedicating to creating systems and strategies that work. Thank you, Dr. Ratner and Mr. Morris for your great presentation. I did submit a, a letter which will go to the minutes just saying I strongly support your efforts to provide workable humanitarian solutions for the unsheltered population. And definitely su strongly support items eight and nine, as well as 10 and 11, we'll get to that. And, and hope we can approve those items and move forward. I think altogether you're making a very forward thinking and humane, comprehensive approach at last to one of our county's most intractable issues. We can, pilot projects and make things work here. And I wanna be part of that. And I thank each of the supervisors and their staff and housing and human services and the new office for um, health and strat strategy. Thank you for developing creative solutions. And I urge your approval so we can move forward with implementation. Hope to be part of the solution too. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Your microphone has been unmuted. Mm -hmm. 
can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't need the full two minutes, but um, you mentioned sort of in your your presentation in various different ways that you know there's this continuum of care and there's um, uh, you know not necessarily super clear differences and designations um, or you know a lot of confusion about what is city and county responsibility. Um, I'm just you know kind of wondering if if you have any you know concerns about the ordinance that potentially is going to go through, you know, banning, um, you know, camping in, in basically most parks in Santa Cruz where there currently are, you know, houses encampments, you know, are, are you concerned that that's going to um, push a lot of people who um, are used to accessing resources um, in those areas away? Um, and if that's something that's on your mind or, you know, looming perhaps. Thank you. I believe the speaker is concluded. Caller 2915, your microphone is unmuted. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner from Aptos Hills. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. You know, thank you so much, Mr. Morris and Dr. Ratner, for this presentation. I feel in hearing you for the first time, there is hope for real change. And um, I really appreciate your good work, your fresh energy, and moving forward with some real concrete actions to make a difference and not just continuing adding um, outreach after outreach with, with nothing really that changes anything for anybody. Thank you so much. I also want to thank Supervisor Caput for bringing onto line here the people out in the trenches. Um, and that speaks to what we heard earlier from the Community Action Board. It won't always be the government agencies that people respond to and trust. So thank you, Supervisor Caput, for bringing those in. I um, ask, I am coming in by telephone, so I've not been able to see your slides. If you could please put those up in some way in the future on the, uh, the website, that would be helpful. Um, I want the county to consider the property you already own, the Burt Scott Park, uh, which is outside of the urban services line, but there's a house there, a large house that needs repair and it could be used for something like this, especially if you incorporate it with a pilot program for ibogaine that could help really address the drug addiction problem that is part of the homeless. And, and I'm glad that that was all interwoven because it is. <laughs> you can't address one without the other. So the Burt Scott Park, the uh, property the county owns on Crestview in Watsonville that is on the, the transportation line. Even the Esplanade property that the county has declared excess, why are we selling those properties? Are we, is that the last of the uh, public comments? Chair, I apologize. It looks like our um, clerk of the board was uh, disconnected from the internet. She's having issues. I am, let me, we do have more comments. I will not be able to share my timer. So if community TV could please time for two minutes. Thank you. The first person is John Sh Showalter. You are being asked, you are being unmuted. You will have two minutes to talk. Thank you. John Showalter, do you wish to speak? Okay, our next gotcha. Oh, great. Yeah, I, that was buried behind something else. Uh, thank you. My name is John Showalter with the Association of Faith Communities. It's been interesting watching the sausage being made here and the way that you all are trying to work with each other to come together on what seems to be in, in contention here is not the three-year uh, plan that seems to be to go to adopted as it should be, 
but the policy that's being suggested. A couple comments is do not preclude tents. Uh, it's really a question of cost. You can buy a stand-up tent as people can stand up in them for a thousand dollars. If you want to put any uh, structure more than that, it'll cost you anywhere from three to ten. That's a question of how you spend your resources. And this is how camps usually develop. They start at tents, then you move to structures. Uh, so do not preclude this. In terms of parks, um, let's look at them. The impact of a well-run transitional current can be minimal. Uh, there are corners in some of our parks that could be used for this. And many of our parks also have existing uh, infrastructure that uh, is already impacting their use. If it's about, you just don't wanna see it, that's a different issue. But whether it's usable land, uh, we should be looking at that. The other is a political determination. Um, faith community's ability to operate a, a shelter or a camp is uh, largely by law left to them. Mount Calvary has proven this. And we will be able to move forward as we are able to find some place to locate something like this. That our efforts over the last three years, the six spaces and shelter, suggest that there's very few churches and other faith communities have the land available or willing to serve it up. Uh, this is going to be a search for a public place and you should search as wide and as far as you can. So you now have the data to make the determination of how to introduce this new form of transitional camps. Thank you. Thank you, Ann S. Your microphone is unmuted. Thank you very much. Yes, um, this is Ann Simonton, and I am encouraging the board to please pass this. And I would also second uh, Mr. Schulwalter's comments about tents. Um, they, we live in a moderate climate. They're not ideal. We're in an emergency. We have no money. Let's face the reality because, you know, there's a lot of people in this community that are willing to be volunteers to help create managed camps. I was one of the ones that went into the Ross camp and tried to hand out vouchers. And I saw what an unmanaged camp is like firsthand. I encourage all of you to go to the camps yourself, find out more spend a night on the streets, you know, do something that you could really feel what it means to be homeless. I would encourage Ratner and Morris also to try living on the street for one night and just see what that's like. We need action now. Uh, the future of our health of our county lies in your hands. I'm really hoping that you'll at least work on this, implementing a permit process as soon as possible so that uh, volunteers like myself can have a chance to make these differences. And I really believe that, um, you know, uh, we're in a situation where uh, we need to act now. We don't need to wait until August. This is March. You, the, you know, I know we need patience, but you know, all of us are making six figure incomes. And so we need to understand that this is a severe situation. Uh, we need transitional emergency camps, and they could be for fire, you know, victims. They could be for severe climate change coming up. It could be for new financial destitution that unforeseen possibilities down the road could create. There's so much that we need to to maintain uh, in terms of creating these kinds of spaces that will be transitional emergency stop gaps. Thank you so much. You caller eight seven eight three. Your microphone is unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, my name's, good morning. My name's Serge Cagno of Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Um, I have two minutes for both of the items, so I guess I'm gonna talk really fast. I have a lot of appreciations and two asks. Um, I have great respect and appreciation, CAO's office, HSD, Housing for Health, Focus Strategies, both the CATES, um, all of the collaborating organizations and the advocates um, that, uh, gave their input, as well as those experiencing homelessness were, who added their input as well. And the six-month plan, uh, under increased connections, uh, for this month, uh, there is a uh, slated complete draft set of recommendations for county-city partnerships related to unsafe encampments. For next month, there is uh, 
develop proposed action plan for creating and funding fiscal year 21-22 regional proactive multidisciplinary street outreach teams. As HSD Director Randy Morris said regarding federal funding, more grants and more investments are give are um, given for cities and counties working in collaborations. The tonight the city of Santa Cruz is actually voting on a camping ban. So Supervisor Coonerty, I live in your district, and you and Chair McPherson, I would ask that you support this work plan by talking to the city council and asking them to support the plan by holding off on their ordinance um, until the draft of the encampment is written and the proposed action plan next month as well. On number nine, um, I, also, I support that. And I would also ask that there is a review of two ordinances, 9.70.620, which uh, limits uh, RV parking and 10.16 no camping zones so that those two things are put in alignment with our framework. I thank you very much. You guys are great and you're all doing great work. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, speakers will have two minutes to make their comment and are limited to speak once per item. Caller Eric, your microphone is unmuted. Eric, your microphone is unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Great. Document uh, from the city of Santa Cruz. Quote, the city of Santa Cruz is currently experiencing record numbers of encampments in public spaces with a sheltered population of only 65,000 and an unsheltered population likely significantly exceeding 1,200. Santa Cruz is one of the highest per capita populations of homeless individuals in the state of California and therefore in the United States. Unsheltered, Individuals living in encampments are present within the city's limits at much higher rates than are present within neighboring jurisdictions. Unlike some larger cities within the state, the city of Santa Cruz generally has not received significant funding from the state or federal government to provide housing or other services to persons experiencing homelessness. Instead, the county of Santa Cruz received significant funding to provide these services and has been legally tasked with providing these services. Getting back to the um, back and forth between Supervisor's Friend and Coonerty, I think Supervisor Friend knows very well that the city of Santa Cruz in particular has borne a vastly disproportionate share of the unsheltered population's um, burden. And it's time for the county, particularly unincorporated areas of the county and the cities of Capitola and Scotts Valley to step up and do a more proportionate share. So I don't know what you were getting at, Supervisor Friend, but if it was to protect your district from bearing some of the burden, I am squarely with Supervisor Cooney on this. Coonerty, thank you very much. I support the, um, the measures before you today. Brent Adams, your microphone is unmuted. Hello, Brent here. Thank you, we can hear you. Hi, um, really happy that this issue has kind of circled around after many years. We've been talking about transitional communities. I like to call them transitional communities instead of encampments. Um, and then also let's uh, talk about tents. I, don't, I think uh, we really have to honor this community's wishes uh, for what they'd like to see in a, in a neighborhood. While I agree that tents are the, can be the, the most basic uh, sheltering unit, a lot of people really don't want to see those in their neighborhoods. There's fear that it's going to bring your property values down. Let's honor that. But also, uh, we could do better than a tent that is a soft-shelled structure. There's many creative construction, construction designs, uh, but at least uh, putting a, a sort of a water sheltering surface over the tent on top of a deck that looks really good from the outside that any neighborhood would be happy to, to, to host these for the time being. Um, and again, Fullbridge Services uh, has been offering uh, storage laundry showers in a neighborhood without any pushback in an extremely successful way. And the way we've done it is just reaching out to the community and working with that community. So we, uh, I really understand there might be some fear and trepidation about the concept of encampments in our communities. We want to change that story and, and build something that is world class that the, the entire country could look to Santa Cruz for, for uh, as a new model. 
tiny houses, Conestoga huts, um, and a, uh, an empowering community that, that serves and, and heals our community of people who sleep outside and the surrounding community, rather than uh, uh, something that's constantly you know, on the attack. Really honored and uh, grateful to see this proposal moving forward and um, uh, looking forward to working with the county, hopefully, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, the last caller. Sidney, your microphone is unmuted. Cindy, your microphone is unmuted. I believe the speaker's having difficulties unmuting their microphone. Last call okay. for Cindy. Okay, got it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much for your service and uh, Supervisors, the work you do is so appreciated on every level. So thank you first. I'd like you to consider some amendments and some thoughts. Number one, um, I appreciate uh, the amendment for zero, uh, functional zero for families. And I would like you to please add pregnant women in that uh, amendment. It is just heartbreaking to see a pregnant woman um, on the streets and, and to think that maybe uh, or to think that something could be done. So please add um, that. Number two, I just do not think your 25% reduction is sufficient. I know you're looking at your um, budget, but I think a goal can be higher. Uh, number three, Supervisor McPherson, I really love your support for parks. I support parks and I see very many areas in parks that are not environmentally sensitive, that are away from visitation areas, that temporary housing nope. would feel safer with a quality like the previous caller call. I mean, I, I'm seeing a dream of tiny homes that could be Victorian uh, replicas of, of houses in the city that could really be quality and could not detract from county homes. I mean, come from county parks and could be out of the areas where people are using the county parks. And so I suggest that we look at all the land that we all own in all the parks and say that it's better than um, being afraid to walk in a park because there are so many um, people and, and uh, um, who are necessitated to be camping in the parks and we're not knowing if we're safe or not and our environment isn't necessarily safe with campfires. So thank you so much for your work and thank you for the plan and um, look forward to progress. That concludes the speakers for this item, Chair. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Uh, great discussion, and thank you for the presentations too. Um, um, I think we we want to face uh, address an issue here. Um, you've heard my my uh, recommendation for um, uh, additional direction on parks uh, that are existing or planned. Uh, those park sites. Um, the one I I don't think we can just offhand eliminate, you know, like Zach, uh, Supervisor Friend said, three districts from being included in this solution. So um, I'm trying to figure out a way that we can at least explore what the opportunities are from non outside of the urban services line of, uh, of nonprofits, churches, because I do believe that a lot of them would participate in this effort. Um, Supervisor McPherson, may I make yes. a recommendation? I'd like to, how about we bifurcate the motion and we just move the recommended, the recommended actions on item that were originally on item eight um, as is, and then we can have a discussion on item nine. So I'm, I'm proposing to bifurcate the motion and I would like to move the recommended actions uh, associated with the original item eight. Okay. That's, that's. Second. That's sec uh, moved by a friend, seconded by um, by Coonerty, uh, clerk, please call the roll. Now, wait, let's see, uh, with that. Well, my my, uh, my proposal would not be included until like item number nine, I don't think. So, okay, clerk, please call the roll. Thank you for clarification. This is motion on item eight as is. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. And I believe Supervisor Friend said aye, but was muted. Aye. 
I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes unanimously for item eight. Okay. Now we'll go to item number nine. And Supervisor McPherson, I'd like to defer to Supervisor Koenig. I mean, this wasn't my item. They've heard my my ideas for amendments, and and obviously we can vote on those and yours, and we can vote on those as sta stated. But Supervisor Koenig, yeah, it. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. It might be useful to separate uh, the the actions here as well. You know, we've got four different actions. Um, start with the uh, the first recommendation. I sorry. Can I just 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 for time and simplicity sake. What if we uh, move the uh, recommendation forward with direction that, uh, that the broader inventory come back with the board and that uh, sites outside of the urban services line uh, be considered, but I would with, but they, I would include as a condition that they have water and sewer uh, access. Well, um, Supervisor Coonerty, by definition, those in the urban outside of the urban services line don't have sewer. That's the definition. So, sure. so, here. so let's just say water. They they have existing infrastructure. Okay. Okay. Can you can you? Uh, I would like to have my uh, additional direction on parks included in that. Would that be acceptable? Well, I guess my my question is is. Uh, that that there may be, I don't know that all the supervisors feel the same way about what's the best spot in their in their community. So I I, I sort of don't want to preclude it if if the supervisor if there's a supervisor here who thinks that it may be a it may be a workable solution at some level. Well, I support, you know, we, I support I just, that amendment, Supervisor McPherson. I mean, I support the parks amendment that you're making. Okay, I, I just, we have a lot of parcels and the parks are established and they've been been very, very hardly fought for for that purpose, for recreational purposes for the overall community. So I would would appreciate if, um, I don't know if a motion, has a motion been made on this yet? So if if somebody, I don't know, if somebody does make a motion, I would appreciate it if, um, if also, uh, the, the direction to prohibit uh, or say that no county park land should be included uh, for temporary shelters in the unincorporated area. Let me ask Supervisor Koenig, do you have an opinion? And then I, if, if then I'll adjust the motion accordingly. Um, you know, I, I guess on the one hand, uh, while I think, you know, writing off, you know, at this point, it seems like casting the, the widest net and getting the most information possible would be the best way to go. Um, you know, that said, I, uh, and so to that effect, you know, ultimately, you know, people are, are living in parks today without services, without water, without sewer. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that we could identify and create a, a better situation, I, my, in, my inclination is not to preclude those sites. Um, I do agree with Supervisor uh, McPherson, though, that there are certainly plenty of alternatives as well, um, and that you know I think that ultimately the list would come back with, um, you know, with a number of opportunities. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'm willing to support the, uh, the Parks Amendment, so to speak. Okay. Then, then what I'm going to do is an attempt to uh, to. To bring us to a consensus vote here is uh, I'll move the recommended action uh, with additional direction that uh, existing uses come back as part uh, across the whole county come part come back as part of the um, as uh, as part of the August report that uh, sites outside the urban services line but with existing infrastructure uh, are included and that parks are excluded. I think I, I'll second unless uh, Supervisor Koenig, did you second that? I'll second. Okay. Okay. That's moved by Coonerty. Uh, we clear on that? The, I, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, call the roll, please. Thank you. This vote is for item nine. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. 
Congratulations on a unanimous vote and there's more to come. So thank you. Now it is 1220, but I do think we should address the uh, zone seven issue. I don't think it's a long agenda and I would like to do that. It was a scheduled item for 1045. I'd like to address that before we go into closed session. Um, or if people want, I don't know what the board wants to do with the closed session at the end of the meeting, we have still plenty to go. So I would like to go to uh, the scheduled item at 1045. That is the zone board director's regular meeting. Um, the board of supervisors shall re, uh, recess in order to permit the board of directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 7 to convene and carry out regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, Supervisor Friend, you are a chair of that board, um, so I'll just hand that over to you. Thank you, uh, Chair McPherson. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we need additional time to promote some of these new panelists, or are we okay? We are fine. I've promoted everyone that is in attendance. Thank you. All right, well, we're going to call to order the Santa Cruz County Board of Directors for the Flood Control and Water Conservation District, also known as Zone 7, for our March 9th meeting. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Uh, here. McPherson? Here. Bilicic? Here. Lucas? Here. And uh, Director Chair? Here. Thank you. Excused are Directors Coltworth and Alternate Gonzalez. You have a quorum. Thank you. Are there any changes, uh, Mr. Strudley, to the agenda today? No, Chair Friend, there are not. Wonderful, we'll move on to oral communications. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but are within the purview of zone seven. Are there any members from the community here to address us? On oral okay, members of the public registered to sign or to speak okay. to this item. Thank you. All right, move on to item four, which is the approval of the zone seven board meeting minutes. Are there any questions or comments on the minutes from any director? All right, is there anybody in the community that'd like to address us on the minutes? There are no public speakers. Thank you, Madam Clerk. A motion would be in order. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. We have a motion from Director Bilicic and a second from Director Koenig. If we could uh, have the roll call, please. Thank you, Director Koenig. Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. Friend? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously with attendance. Thank you. We will move on to the consent agenda, which is all of one item. So is there any, are there any comments from directors on the consent agenda item? Director Bilicic. Um, I was looking at the time. Is 1045 the right time or is it an evening meeting? Usually, isn't it usually an evening meeting? I, I'm just asking. Oh, so... Please, Director Strudley, or Dr. Strudley. Yeah, Director Bilicic, um, the, the times that are in this board item were coordinated with clerk of the board. Um, so as far as uh, that coordination is concerned, these are the correct times to the best of my knowledge. Okay, I just usually in June, we have an evening meeting there. But if we're not having an evening meeting, that's fine. Just wondered. Thank you. So I can make a motion to approve. Uh, in one second, any other directors like to comment on consent? And if not, are there any members of the community that are that wanted to address this on consent? Did you see anything, Madam Clerk? There are no speakers to this item. All right, Director Bilicic, please. I'll make a motion to approve uh, the consent agenda. Second. A motion from Director Bilicic and a second from Director Coonerty. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. Friend? Aye. Thank you, motion passes with attendance. Thank you. We'll move on to the one regularly scheduled agenda item, which is item number seven, the program manager's report. As the board of directors of zone seven to consider a status report on the Pajaro River flood risk management project as outlined in the memo of the district engineer, Dr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Friend, uh, members of the board and members of the public. Um, I'm here to provide you again with an, another update on our longstanding levee reconstruction project. Uh, as you know, we've reached uh, several significant milestones over the past few months. Uh, among them is um, uh, preparation for uh, signing a feasibility cost share agreement with the Army Corps, which you 
provided authorization uh, for your chair to sign that, for the chair to sign that agreement um, as soon as the core has, has readied that agreement. Um, we expect that agreement to, to be coming soon. Um, as soon potentially as March or April, uh, later this month or next month, we expect to be uh, able to fully execute a feasibility, excuse me, a, a design agreement with the Army Corps uh, to move us fully into the PED phase with the Army Corps and begin work. Um, they have accepted our closeout agreements for prior uh, cost share agreements, which will credit uh, a large sum of money towards the construction of the project once we enter that phase. Um, and we have reached other significant milestones on uh, the governance side, which I'll go into shortly. Um, so in addition to um, an expectation of beginning the actual work of design uh, very soon, we are uh, in conversations with the Department of Water Resources as well as our state a delegation of legislators to look at the possibility of authoring legislation that would elevate our cost share uh, with the state of California under our subventions agreement. Uh, you may recall that our existing subventions agreement and authorization in statute uh, limits the state participation of non-federal costs at 70% of those costs despite the fact that the project is a very shining example of a true multi-benefit project that notably provides a tremendous amount of flood protection for um, a significant population of disadvantaged and severely disadvantaged uh, residents in uh, both Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. So we are embarking on a number of discussions and have actually developed some, some initial pieces of legislation that we are in coordination with DWR as well as Senator Laird's office, as well as Assembly Member Stone and Assembly Member Rebus. And uh, as far as staff is concerned, we would like to extend our uh, large appreciation to those legislators, as well as Chair Friend who has guided this process and the coordination with those legislators. Um, so I think we, we do have a fairly good chance of moving the needle here with the state. The question is, how much will we be able to achieve? And uh, uh, we won't know until several months down the road as the legislation moves through the process. Um, as I've uh, reported to the board previously, we have been um, trying to secure other grant monies to support the project as well as to support um, other flood risk reduction uh, programs and projects outside the envelope of the, of the federal project. So notably, we are still waiting to hear from the Department of Water Resources on the results of our application to the Coastal Watershed Flood Risk Reduction Grant Program uh, under Prop 1. Um, we do stand, I think, a fairly good chance of securing some additional funding from that program, um, but it remains to be seen what will come of that. Uh, we hope to hear from DWR within the next month, if not few months, on the outcome of that grant application. We anticipate um, throwing our hat in the ring on a future solicitation, which we expect to be available later uh, this year, probably summertime uh, for Prop 68. Uh, again, we will be requesting money to support the federal project. And the other item I'd like to mention on this uh, funding pursuit is um, we are in active discussions with FEMA and Cal OES right now for a hazard mitigation grant program and application uh, that would address the absence of uh, flood risk reduction solutions in what's called REACH-1 by the Army Corps of Engineers. REACH-1 extends from Highway 1 down to the ocean, to Monterey Bay. And the federal uh, levy reconstruction project does not include improvements to this area because of economic considerations made by the Army Corps. So we are uh, simultaneously trying to address this gap by positioning a, a planning application with uh, FEMA um, to look at feasibility analysis and other requirements to begin looking at the potential solutions in that area of the Pajaro River. Um, the challenge here is that is several miles of river and this would, if we're successful, this would be the largest planning grant sub-application sent to FEMA uh, under the hazard mitigation program uh, in the country to date. So, uh, it's both an interesting um, descriptor of both the potential accomplishment we could get from this, as well as the large challenge ahead of us and kind of securing that level of support from FEMA. 
Um, on the environmental review process with CEQA, we are working uh, continuously with our consultant team in developing draft uh, documents and parts of the environmental review, and those parts are in internal staff review right now. Uh, we expect to have a draft document for in, uh, continued internal review um, sometime this spring, uh, and there will be more to report on that item as we move through the environmental review process. On the governance and finance side, um, nothing has really changed in our description of our potential finance challenges related to the project. Um, as it stands now, we're still looking at roughly 10% cost coverage that would be envisioned as part of the benefit assessment district. But like I said earlier, we are looking to close that gap, so to speak, uh, and shrink that requirement down to as little as possible through the legislation that we are um, championing with the state of California for our subventions authorization. Um, the last major piece of note uh, is our progress and milestones that we've reached related to uh, governance. Um, as reported to you before and as recommended by this board and supported by this board was the pursuit of forming a new governing body to implement the capital project as well as other flood, flood risk reduction projects within the Pajaro River envelope. Um, we have now uh, secured all five uh, uh, authorizations from the five member agencies of that JPA to adopt the agreement. So we are working through right now some administrative matters that will position all those member agencies uh, to, to be brought together under that JPA's umbrella and to start up meetings and to start guiding the project through that JPA. And so there will be more to come on that in the next few months. And there may, uh, just to give a heads up to the board, there may be the requirement for special meetings to be held um, to, uh, to align some of those administrative matters for the creation of the JPA. Um, these items would include things like designating uh, the members of the board of directors from those member agencies uh, to the JPA. And that would be, need to be done, for example, according to um, the Brown Act uh, by the member agencies themselves. Um, with that, I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions you may have. And again, thank you for your continued support with this project. Thank you, Dr. Stradley. Director Caput. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Supervisor Friend. Yeah, Mark, uh, quick question. Uh, you, you talked about the grants. I don't know how much money we're talking about. And uh, so it, it, the question has got just two parts to it, and that's it. Uh, how much uh, in millions of dollars are the grants we're requ uh, we've applied for? And the other part would be if we received some of the money, would that lower the assessment per property owner the that are in the flood zone that would vote on it. Yeah, thank you for that question, Director Caput. Um, so far, we have under the Coastal Watershed Flood Risk Reduction Grant Program with State DWR, we have applied for approximately seven point two million dollars of support that would support the project through um, the design phase. Um, that money, as it stands now, as, as would any other grant funds secured from the state of California or state agencies, without the uh, addition of legislation that changes the statute for Pajaro uh, subventions, uh, those grant awards would sit within that 70% cost share allocation coming from the state, and so would not uh, work towards reducing um, the benefit assessment district uh, costs. Uh, we have not yet submitted an application for Prop 68, um, so I can't give you a magnitude of, of the, the dollar amount of that grant. I expect it would be it will be smaller than the Coastal Watershed Grant because we are going to be applying for support there for elements that sit outside and this gets a little confusing. There will be planning elements that sit outside of the federal project. And so uh, they would reduce costs um, to local ratepayers or, or ultimately to the JPA once it's fully stood up and administering the project. Um, but those would be costs that we would incur as local sponsors to a project uh, anyways. And they're planning elements. So they actually sit outside of the 70%, the way the statute works. Um, we're probably going to 
apply for a few hundred thousand dollars to perhaps maybe in the low millions, depending on what elements we end up seeking to include based on final guidelines for that program, which have not yet come out from DWR, although we've commented on the draft guidelines. So that's grant number two. The, the third grant that we are working on right now is this hazard mitigation grant program with FEMA. Again, this sits outside of the federal project of the subventions issue. This is this would represent costs above and beyond the $400 million levy reconstruction project because this is targeting solutions that are, sit outside that Army Corps project. Um, we are looking at potential uh, a potential application for just a little bit north of $5 million to two uh, feasibility analysis, environmental review, other uh, items that uh, position us for permitting, other environmental topics, and uh, initial design of the project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director Caput. Director Bilicic? Uh, yes, Dr. Strudley, just quickly, um, do are the are the agencies now starting to approve their members or how is what's the process for that? So I'm I'm coordinating with staff from our other member agencies. Uh, it was only very recently that the last member agency had adopted the JPA agreement. So there will be some coordination that will ensue over the next few weeks uh, or maybe, uh, maybe next few months, depending on those decisions. But as I understand it, there is discussions happening internally with the different member agencies on who, who they would like to select as uh, to sit on the board. But ultimately, that process has to comply with the Brown Act. So it has to go through the member agency uh, boards or councils um, for approval. So they may be doing it in the next month or the next agenda or whatever. They could be doing it anytime now, right? In theory, yes. And so as an example for Zone 7, our next scheduled calendar meeting is the June meeting. Um, but that's why I mentioned that there will be a possibility for the need for a special meeting sooner than that so that we can uh, address a number of these administrative matters that Zone 7 needs to take up on its own to fulfill the, the initial start of requirements of the JPA. Well, hopefully the cities and others will do that before. I mean, we'll just have to see. Now, the other question I had is, um, you know, listening to the homeless report, it looks like we're gonna have some real progress here. Has there been, um, with the people on the Corlitas Creek and the and the South Sopatius Creek, is there an impact on our levy project and on the plans going forward? Is there any problems there or are we okay? The water quality, et cetera. I, I, I just wanted to know if you could, if you know anything about that. Yeah. And it's, it's more a concern with ongoing operations and maintenance than it is with the capital project itself. So, um, and it's, it's a big concern actually for safety during win the, the winter and spring months when we're, uh, anticipating rainfall to be in the forecast. A lot of these um, homeless encampments are fairly deep within the river channel, um, uh, close to low water. Um, and one of our initial concerns is for the safety of those individuals who may or may not be privy to kind of the, the rainfall forecast. I don't, I don't have a good feel for what kind of information those people have at their disposal. And should they have an absence of information, they could get caught in a very dangerous situation very quickly, especially on Coralitas and Salsipuedes Creek, uh, more so than the Pajaro because it is so flashy because it responds so quickly to rainfall and the water levels rise relatively quickly. And so our first challenge is, is trying to get people out of harm's way during the winter months. Our second and longer term challenge is um, Addressing O&M requirements in the channels, allowing our contractors uh, safe access to the channel so that they conduct, can conduct their work, allowing safe access for our drainage maintenance crews so that they can conduct their work. And then the third concern is, is any potential damage um, or additional flood risk that is posed by the presence of, of those encampments. Um, we have had instances in which uh, homeless have dug into the levee prism 
uh, which is uh, an extremely alarming thing to do given the age and fragility of the existing levy system. The other thing that's problematic is, is for example, when those encampments um, set up beneath uh, bridge decks and present a, a hydraulic challenge to the conveyance of flood flows underneath that bridge deck. It could clog up uh, the bridge, uh, beneath the bridge, it could uh, wash downstream and, and clog up the channel elsewhere and cause backwater flooding. Um, so these are the items that we are um, trying to address. And again, it's more related to operations and maintenance than it is anything else. I did see um, <clears throat> county staff out moving couches and things from under the bridge the other day. So that's a positive thing. I yeah. just wondered if it, you know, how, how it affects the overall maintenance of this project? Uh, it, it does increase costs. Um, you know, we, we have line items in our budget that address the need to protect water quality, um, uh, to protect uh, flood risk reduction uh, by clearing the debris out of the channel uh, when it is problematic for flood flow conveyance. Um, you know, the, the recent activity that occurred there was because of the forecast for rain that uh, was for last weekend and this week. And so without uh, a lot of confidence about how big those storms were gonna be, the last thing we wanted were for people to get caught under the bridge um, and be in an unsafe situation. But we also didn't want the debris blocking the conveyance under the bridge either, should we have uh, a convective thunderstorm roll over uh, the county and the Coralitas drainage basin. Um, it does add significant costs um, to us, and it presents challenges to us because uh, although we are beginning coordination with um, Dr. Ratkin and, and the others that spoke uh, from human services, um, we're not experts in how to address the problem. Um, we're experts in dealing with flood control and maintenance of the facility, and so it's going to take additional effort and requirements to um, partner with those groups and to arrive at solutions. Well, thank you so much for your hard work and the work of the county. Um, it seems like you're on top of it as much as you can be. I know that there's been a lot of injunctions and different things happening with homeless camps. Where do they go? Uh, a lot of concerns about the people, but also quality of life for other people. So I don't know, it's a big challenge. And thank you for everybody, what you're doing. You too, Zach and Greg. Thank you, Director Bilsich. Any other board members on this item before we open up to the community? Uh, seeing none, is there anybody, Madam Clerk, from the community that'd like to address us on this item? There are no speakers to this item, Chair. Okay, we'll move it back to the board. I, I think it's an acceptance file. We'll move it back to the board on, for action. I'll make a motion to approve uh, the report. I'll second that, uh, Supervisor Caput. So a motion from Director Bilicic and a second from Director Caput. If we could have a roll call, please. Hey, Director Koenig. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Bilicic. Aye. Friend. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with attendance. Thank you. I'd like to uh, apologize to those members of Zone 7 that waited for the last couple hours in order to attend this item. We do appreciate uh, your patience, and um, that'll end the Zone 7 meeting. Uh, Chair McPherson, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zone 7 board members. Um, thank you. We're at quarter to one, and um, we've got uh, four items to go, and we've got a scheduled item at 1.30. Uh, what I would like to do is for... Uh, to go into closed session um, and then come back. We have a scheduled item on the general fund uh, mid-year budget report at 1.30. Uh, so we'll come back by 1.30. And then we have uh, four other, what, five other items, 10 through 14. Uh, they're, they're on tiny homes, free uh, accessory dwelling units. So they're going, a couple of them are gonna take some time. We're gonna be here for the long haul. So what I'd like to do now is uh, go into closed session uh, is there any, or is there anybody on uh, board member that has something they have to go to that uh, that they would like to take a, a full 41 five minute break and then come back and then uh, address um, the items after um, the scheduled item at 1 30. everybody okay okay we'll we'll recess we'll go into closed session at this point and uh, return at 1 30.
and then take up items 10 through 14 after we discuss the uh, mid-year budget review, uh, which is item number 16 on our regular agenda. Okay, so we will go into closed session. There's nothing reportable from closed session. Oh, so thank you. Person. Thank you sure. very much, appreciate it. Okay, we'll go into closed session. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, we're going to reconvene the uh, the March 9th, 2021 uh, meeting of the Board of Supervisors. The time is about 1.35, 1.37 p.m. Um, clerk, please call the roll again. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Thank you, Eva Corman. We're expecting Supervisor Coonerty. Okay, I think we'll go ahead um, with the uh, item number 16. It's a scheduled item for 1.30 p.m. Um, and when uh, Supervisor Coonerty comes on, would you just acknowledge that, please? Will do. Okay, uh, we'll consider the general fund mid-year budget report with updated estimates for fiscal year 2020-21, preliminary requests for fiscal year 2021-22, and an updated five-year forecast is outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. Uh, we have a mid-year budget report. Uh, our County Administrative Officer, uh, Carlos Palacios. Excuse me if I may jump in quickly. Yeah. Supervisor Coonerty has joined the meeting. Great, okay. We have a unanimous, we have all five of us here. Uh, Mr. Palacios. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair McPherson and members of the board. Uh, Carlos Palacios, County Administrative Officer. I just wanted to provide a, a brief introduction to our mid-year budget update. Uh, very quick overview of what you're gonna hear uh, Christina Mowry, our uh, County Budget uh, Manager, uh, give a presentation in more detail on, is that overall the news is good and that we are doing um, better than we had anticipated a year ago when we developed this budget. Uh, so that's good news. Um, the cautionary note is that we we still have not fully recovered. In other words, our revenues um, still are have not reached pre-pandemic levels yet. So that's important to note that we're still in a recovery mode from the recession, but we're getting better. And we hope in perhaps in the next year or, or two, we'll be fully recovered. But certainly not now, we're not, we're not fully recovered. Uh, the other issue is that there's been significant news about the uh, new stimulus bill that the administration has uh, uh, proposed and is on the verge of being approved by the House. This is the American Rescue Plan. It contains very good news for uh, local government, for counties and cities and states and the um, Thing with, uh, to keep in mind with that is that, and Christina will go into more detail on this, is that uh, it's very good news for us and that we're slated to receive um, $53 million uh, from the federal government uh, in recovery funds. What's still not absolutely clear yet is what those funds can be used for. Prior stimulus funds were limited to only new COVID related expenses. And that put a lot of uh, restrictions on how we could spend the money. And it frankly couldn't backfill any of our lost revenues. With this new um, American Rescue Plan, uh, originally it was proposed that we would be able to backfill lost revenues as every other industry that has received aid from the federal government has been able to do, such as transit districts, such as airplane, air, uh, airlines uh, and so forth, hospitals. But uh, local government up to now has not been able to backfill our lost revenues. So originally it was proposed. It's not clear uh, in the language yet until the House approves it what the final language will be. And that is very big for us because um, we are, as, as Christina will talk about, we believe we will be able to reduce the furloughs next year to about by half um, and still be able to avoid major disruptions to county services. Um, if we receive the American Rescue Plan dollars and there's allowed 
to be backfill of lost revenues, uh, then it may be possible that we will be able to completely eliminate furloughs next fiscal year. That's a possibility. But again, right now, uh, we don't know, and the bill is not clear, or we're not clear yet, whether we'll be able to backfill lost revenues, and that um, really has a big implications for how we develop next year's budget. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is that we are in the midst of a major reorganization of county government. Um, when I first became CAO, we developed a six-year strategic plan. We developed then after that, uh, after more than a year's work, a two-year operations plan, um, performance measurement, we're in the midst of uh, continuous process improvement as well. But we are also doing four major reorganizations of county government. One of them you heard from today, which is housing for health. This was uh, our homeless efforts, and we moved those efforts from the county administrator's office to the human services department established a new division called Housing for Health. We hired a great new um, director of that division, Robert, Dr. Robert Ratner, who you heard from this morning, and we're in the process of coordinating and consolidating many of the county programs that we use um, uh, to help the home, those experiencing homelessness, individuals experiencing homelessness with that new division. That's been a major lift, and we're very proud of the efforts and that we've done over the last couple of years to bring about that new division. Uh, second, we are in the process of forming the OR3 office, the Response, uh, Recovery and Resiliency Office. Um, right now, uh, Elisa Benson is heading that effort up and we are uh, in the midst of hiring staff and getting that, that new division uh, stood up. That will be within the County Administrator's Office and it will take over uh, our major efforts to uh, respond to emergencies. So the Office of Emergency Services will be in that new division. And we uh, will also contribute to the recovery efforts that are going on and help coordinate those efforts uh, from the CZU fires that we experienced last summer. And then we also will consolidate our climate uh, action efforts in that office. So as we work at resiliency and against future disasters, we also will center our climate action uh, efforts and goals within that OR3 office. And we are in the process of standing that office as well, up, as well as I mentioned. Uh, third, we're um, in the process of working on, uh, con on transitioning the public defender's office from a independent um, private contract to a county department. And you've received reports on that in the past and you'll be receiving a report on the 23rd of March on our progress to date. Uh, that is another a very significant um, effort and a major, another major reorganization that we are undertaking. And then fourth, uh, we will be working uh, over in this budget year on a new community services division I'm not sure what we're gonna call it, if it will be a community services division or development permit center, one-stop center, basically trying to consolidate those efforts um, within the county that, um, in, that the, the community has to go through when they want to um, get a building permit or some kind of development permit. And so that would consolidate staff from both the planning department, public works department, and environmental health, as well as um, fire districts and county fire. And so that is another significant effort and reorganization effort that we are undertaking and that will be hopefully in place uh, next fiscal year and that we're working very hard on. So I wanna make sure that you know that those um, major reorganization efforts are underway and we will be discussing them in more detail during budget hearings in June. Uh, at this point, I would like to turn over the presentation to county budget manager, uh, Christina Mowry, who will go over in more detail our mid-year budget report. Thank you, Carlos. And good afternoon, uh, Chair McPherson and members of the board. Christina Mowry, your county budget manager. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen in the presentation. There we go. Okay. 
As Carlos mentioned, I'm going to go over and give you an overview of our, this is our mid-year report. We gave you a preliminary forecast in January, um, and now we've received uh, the department's request, and so we have a little better understanding of where we're at. We're first going to cover, sort of give you an update on our federal aid uh, for the COVID-19 um, response, uh, particularly the American Rescue Plan and how that affects us. Um, we'll give you a, a brief uh, state budget outlook, economic outlook. We'll focus on the general fund because that's where your board has the most discretion. And we'll look ahead, giving you an update of the five-year uh, general fund uh, forecast and then some options to prepare for our future. As Carlos mentioned, we've gotten good news recently. The uh, Senate approved the American Rescue Plan that was previously approved by the House. Um, it allocates $350 billion for local governments. Um, our estimated allocation is about $53.4 million, and it includes funding for our revenue losses, which we had estimated at $25.5 million. Now, we're still taking a close look at this. The, the Senate did make a few changes to the original proposal. So um, our revenue losses and, and the amount we can claim may be limited to something less than the $25.5 million. Um, and we're still, we'll be receiving uh, once the House takes final action, hopefully tomorrow, and the president signs the bill, we'll get, uh, the US Treasury will issue guidance on how funds can be uh, claimed. Um, but we're, we're very excited. Um, uh, we're very hopeful it's gonna help us cover our revenue losses, which, uh, will help us with some of our budget. So here you'll see sort of an estimate. Um, we've been providing you updates um, previously on the coronavirus relief funds that were allocated through the CARES Act, uh, which was back in June. But we haven't really specifically talked a lot about all of the costs related to our uh, COVID-19 response. So this is an attempt to give you sort of an overview of where we think we're at. And this is based on the preliminary information and our experience through December. Um, but we believe our FEMA eligible costs are about $78 million. Um, and our costs through uh, December uh, related to the CARES Act that your board approved is about $27 uh, million uh, plus some interest. And then we have costs, the departments are putting together plans. You saw a preliminary estimate in January, um, but we have costs uh, for our continued response uh, through September estimated about almost $30 million. And then as your board knows, you, you received a report earlier, we received some rental assistance aid, which was a separate um, funding provided for rental assistance for community members and including the money that the state is going to administer, that's $16.8 million. And then public health has received some very specific funding um, for their related costs related to vaccine efforts, and that's totaling about $11 million. So overall, our cost estimates to providing the response um, is about $163 million. And the funding we've received uh, that we're estimating to receive because we really don't know exactly how much money FEMA is going to reimburse us. But we're in this scenario here, we're estimating that we will receive everything that we've spent. We know that's not likely. And so we are looking at and hoping that we'll get some approvals of some FEMA projects before year end so we can give your board an update if FEMA's disallowed any of those costs. Um, but as we said before, we have revenue estimates of our losses of about $25.5 million. Um, so our overall costs are the, the $163 million. So we have a gap right now based on what we've received so far or anticipating to receive of about $55 million. And so the new American uh, Rescue Plan provides us about $53.4 million. So not quite enough to cover um, all of our revenue losses, but almost all of our revenue losses based on the original proposal. And the state budget outlook, the governor issued his budget in January. It's very positive, um, just like we're experiencing a little bit of additional unanticipated revenue compared to our original estimates, so is the state. 
They have a healthy surplus of about 23 .23 billion, um, and they have some increased uh, one-time allocations included in the governor's budget of about 15.5 billion. Um, and they're anticipating increasing their reserves by seven and a half billion dollars. So we're anticipating the May revise to include some additional funding. Um, and as the revenues improve, um, may include an additional ten and a half billion dollars, which will be really helpful. The economic outlook is, is looking very positive also. Um, you know, with the vaccine in place and, and people getting vaccinated, um, it's helping uh, the economy reopen. Um, consumer confidence is very high. We've seen uh, continued growth in sales tax and transient occupancy tax. And we expect that to continue to, to return. Um, sales tax has, has you, as you'll see in the, the revenue uh, details I'll provide shortly, has, has nearly recovered. However, um, the transient occupancy tax or hotel tax is gonna take a bit longer to recover. Um, and overall, uh, the equity markets are recovering along the Federal Reserve actions that are maintaining low interest rates and support for low inflation will help fuel the continued recovery as well. So we're gonna focus on the general fund budget. Um, since the forecast we provided you in January, um, the revenues, the general revenues have increased um, ever so slightly, about $1.6 million for total growth over budget of about $7.9 million. And that's primarily from um, a little bit more uh, sales tax uh, growth, uh, transient occupancy tax, and a little bit of uh, property tax overall, um, offset by some, some uh, reduced revenue we're seeing in our interest earnings. Um, our departments and other net costs are less by about six and a half million dollars. And this is primarily from increased revenues that some of our departments uh, saw. Some of that revenue is a reimbursement of some prior year costs. So that's one time revenue. Um, and in some cases, there's some additional revenue being provided one time to help cover some of the costs in the budget. So overall, we're expecting an increase in the fund balance available by the end of the year of 8.1 million for a total of 12 and a half million dollars to carry forward to 21-22. And here you'll see a summary of the revenues, which is where your board of course has the most uh, discretion. These are the general county revenues made up of property tax, sales tax, uh, transient occupancy tax, the cannabis business tax, deed transfer, interest, and some other revenues and reimbursements. So since the uh, mid-year estimate, like I said, it's gone up by about 1.6 million. Um, and you'll see there the hotel tax has gone up a little bit, the sales tax and the property tax, with some minor changes overall. Um, and there you'll see the interest uh, has dropped uh, a little over a half a million more than what we anticipated uh, in January at mid-year report. Um, and But overall, growth is good, better than we anticipated, 5.2% better than, than we originally projected last August. So that's good news. That's going to help us. And then we look at the department costs in the current year. Um, as the departments had more experience, they fine-tuned their estimates based on their costs. And like I said before, this gives you a breakdown by the various government categories. So we have our general government category. Overall is seeing a little bit of improvement uh, since the preliminary forecast. Um, health and human services is where we saw the most improvement, and that's primarily from that those increased revenues that they're seeing. Um, and some of that, most of that is um, one-time revenue. And then our land use and, and community services is seeing a little bit better revenue than what they anticipated. They anticipated quite a decline in their, their permitting revenue. It did get a little bit better in their, their um, recent forecast, um, but still down um, compared to budget. And then public safety isn't doing too bad. Um, they're up a little bit, just a half a million dollars. So overall, the departments are saving uh, compared to budget about $5.4 million. And here you'll see the general fund uh, contribution summary. This is a summary of, of how the general fund 
how we finance the department budget. So remember the, the, the departments have their own direct revenues and the difference in the general fund departments between their revenues and their expenses is the general fund contribution that comes from those general revenues. And, and it also comes from our fund balance that we carry forward. So your board will recall that this year we took over $13 million out of reserves. That's how we had that fund balance available to us. Um, and we use that as a measure to help soften some of the impacts and the changes that we would have had to make to the budget. So you can see overall, like I said, our general revenues are better by um, 7.9 million or 5.2%. The total financing is up um, just under 5% uh, when you include the fund balance. And the department uh, net costs are um, better uh, than originally uh, budgeted and forecasted. And we have some other costs um, that are slightly better as well. So overall, you can see there, we're able to have an ending fund balance of about $12.5 million that we can carry forward. So to give you an overview of the 21-22 uh, general fund budget, since the forecast, we now believe, remember, you'll recall that in the, the preliminary forecast in January, um, we recommended to your board that we um, asked the departments for three scenarios because we didn't exactly know which scenario was gonna prove to be best. So based on the uh, requests from the departments and based on our current revenue projections, we believe we're in a position to eliminate 50% of the furlough. Um, the financing estimate has increased overall. Um, now a big chunk of that is one-time uh, savings from the 21-22 uh, uh, 2021 year carrying forward to 2122, but we're also including um, the better revenues as well. Um, and the department costs are higher by 6.4 million. And this is predominantly, uh, I say, should say per primarily from the um, eliminating 50% uh, of the furlough, which is about almost $6 million. And then we have some minor changes in staffing um, as a result. And then there, there are other costs that are being recommended uh, to be increased for our critical deferred maintenance and our increased restricted contingencies. Um, and then we are recommending, um, based on the financing that we have available to us and carrying over some of that savings, um, to increase our reserves by $2.6 million. You'll recall that when we take money out of reserves, it's important that we have a five to seven year plan to restore those reserves. So we need to start working on that plan to restore the $13 million that we removed from reserves so that we can have it ready for that next event. But we're gonna do this as we have funding. And so right now, based on our proposal, we believe we have $2.6 million that we can start to restore the reserves with. And overall in this particular plan, we're only out of balance by less than a million dollars. We, be, we believe we'll be able to reconcile all that before we finalize the pro proposed budget and present it to your board in May. And here you'll see a breakdown of the revenues and the growth. A lot of this is the same continued growth that we see, we're seeing in the current year. And then some additional growth that we're anticipating in our property taxes. Um, sales tax is gonna continue to um, be restored prior to the pre-COVID levels, as you can see there. Our TOT, we're, we're not expecting it to be restored completely. It'll take another year, we believe, for the economy and the hotels um, to recover from the pandemic. And um, cannabis business tax is still um, strong, even though it's a, uh, a little less than what we initially thought. Um, and our deed transfer tax um, is, is seeing some growth some continued growth. And of course, we spoke about interest. Interest is down. We expect it to continue to be down for a while. Um, so overall, our growth compared to the um, budget is about $10 million or 7% growth. And remember that even this is above average growth. And this is because we're seeing a little bit of a bump from the increased recovery. And here you'll see a breakdown by the various government categories, uh, general government, health and human services, land use and community services, and public safety and justice. So overall, the department net costs are going up by $6.4 million, or a change of, of just a little over 4%. 
you know, you'll notice there, you might uh, be surprised to see general government going up so high. This is because every other year when we have an election, where we're not in a general election, our election costs are much higher because we're not recovering revenue from a combined uh, consolidated election with other measures. So there's not as much revenue to offset those regular costs. So uh, a good portion of this $2.6 million increase is our elections, um, which is continuing without that, that offsetting revenue. Um, and then the rest of that and these other departments here are just the primarily, um, some of the departments were able to cover some of their increased costs if they had revenues, but many of them weren't able to cover the cost of, of eliminating the furlough, uh, half of the furlough. So um, we're covering that here overall um, with an increased general fund contribution. And here you'll see a summary of the general fund contribution. Uh, you'll see the increase of the uh, $12.5 million anticipated from the fund balance with the general revenues for a total financing of $176 million to offset the department costs of almost $156 million um, some of our other costs, which includes debt service, contingencies, uh, general fund contribution for um, capital improvements and deferred maintenance, and then our contribution to reserves. And overall, we're just slightly out of balance and we'll rectify that before we present it to your board. Now, if we were to consider, as Carlos said, you know, we um, were very, we're gonna be receiving the American Rescue Plan and some one-time um, reimbursement of our revenue losses. Uh, and so until we get that additional information, we won't know for sure how much additional revenue we might have available to us. Um, but if we did decide to uh, eliminate the furlough completely, uh, we would need another, at least another $6 million uh, to be able to provide financing for the departments without engaging in any um, position eliminations or layoffs. So we want to give you an update um, on the uh, sort of forecast, the five-year forecast for the general fund. We still do show growing deficits. Um, we've updated the uh, projection based on the proposals and that we've received um, by looking at eliminating the furlough in 21-22 or, or by uh, half of the furlough. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in 21-22 and the remaining furlough by 22-23. That's what the forecast includes. It includes sort of average revenue growth and average expenditure growth. And even after all that, we still estimate a shortfall of anywhere between 13 and, and $15 million. And that's even after we carry forward savings each year of at least $5 million, which has been our average for the last few years. Um, Rising health and retirement costs continue to drive the overall costs. Um, and it's important to understand that, you know, our budget is balanced based on um, using some of that one-time carryover of the money that we took out of reserves. It doesn't look like we're gonna need a lot of it this year, but we'll need, we're planning on using, uh, using it for next year and hopefully we'll be able to save some of that and carry it forward. Um, but we will need to look at some additional revenue options to replace the use of those one-time funds. So here you'll see a picture of the five-year forecast of just looking specifically at the general fund contribution. Um, the uh, blue line is the actual financing um, that's available from the fund balance and a combination of the general revenues. And it's uh, growing um, here. You can see in 2021, we have a balanced budget. The lines come together and we're proposing that by 21, 22, we'll have a balanced budget and they come together. And then you'll see that the gap starts um, by 22, 23 with the full elimination of the furlough, which is a total of almost $12 million. We start to see our gap and it, and it continues to go up. So just as a reminder, there are lots of things that will help guide us as we look to the future. We have our strategic plan and our operational plan helps guide our priorities. We've got our continuous process improvement to help us create efficiencies in what we do. Performance measures are gonna help us assess the effectiveness of what we do. 
and we're hoping program budgeting, we are gonna be demonstrating that in our uh, proposed budget uh, that will be released in May. Um, and then hopefully by the following uh, uh, fiscal year, we'll provide program budgeting for all budgets. But we're hoping that will provide greater clarity and helping the public understand what's included in the budget by breaking it down by program and service. Um, the reserves, as we know, will need to be restored over the next five to seven years. And as before, we've looked for revenue options to help us preserve the core programs and services and replace some of the one-time funding um, that we're using during this, during this sort of uh, economic recession to help us close that funding gap. And Carlos, I believe you want to cover our, our revenue options. Yes, the um, challenge that's before us is that um, assuming that we're able to use the American Rescue Plan um, revenue loss uh, category, um, we, we would be potentially help using those funds to help us bridge the gap to restore um, the remainder of our furlough amounts for the next fiscal year. Uh, the difficulty is that these are one-time funds. Uh, depending on, the, again, we don't know all the restrictions. Uh, there has been some talk that the American Rescue Plan uh, could be used over a couple of years. And so uh, if we were to use uh, approximately $6 million to cover next fiscal year, uh, then what happens the following, right? That's the difficulty. Uh, our revenues and our costs have been rising basically at the same rate. In fact, our costs have been rising a little bit more rapidly than our revenues, slightly more rapidly. So we've been in a somewhat very tight budget situation given our normal cost increases. And then if you consider that we're using one-time funds to cover $6 million. And again, the $6 million is the net county cost amount. We're not talking about our, so in our general fund, which is over $500 million, our net county cost is somewhere in the neighborhood of 170 million at this point, I think, 160, 170 million. So that is the uh, area that, so $6 million becomes more significant of that. So that'll be the dilemma. One, one choice would be to set aside $12 million out of the 54 and then use 6 million next fiscal year and then 6 million the following fiscal year. So that would allow us two years to try and make up that uh, net county cost um, difference to backfill the revenue, the uh, furlough amounts. So that's possible. But then that, that uses up more of the American Rescue Plan $53 million. Uh, other options would be to consider revenue measures in the future. Uh, one uh, possible measure is emergency response fee. This is our uh, 911 um, center that helps us to offset those costs. Uh, right now, the um, charge is $1.47 per landline, uh, and it continues to go down because people have switched to cell phones. So if we were to, uh, and to voice over internet. So if we were to uh, reduce the charge, but expand it to cell phones and, and voice over internet, um, that would allow us to capture uh, approximately uh, another one and a half million dollars um, in those costs that we go towards our 911 center. So that's an option. Uh, the hotel tax or transit occupancy tax is another option. Uh, currently, we're at 11 percent. Um, City of Monterey last year in the midst of the recession actually increased their TOT to 12 percent. They went from 10. They were actually lower than us. They went from 10 to 12. Every 1% increase is um, by a million dollars. Um, there's also the possibility of increasing, um, of splitting it, we think, that you could actually split the amount you charge to traditional motel hotels versus hosted rentals such as um, Airbnb and VRBO and charge different rates. So there may be a possibility there as well. And again, every increase is 1% is about a million dollars. And then uh, sales tax, uh, we're currently at 9% sales tax. We're the lowest uh, in the unincorporated area. Um, most of the other cities are either at 9.25, 9.5, or 9. Point, I think Scotts Valley is the highest, which is at 9.75. Uh, 
So there's a possibility that we could increase that. Uh, every quarter cent in the unincorporated area raises about four and a half million dollars annually. And as you can see, the gap we're gonna try and cover is that $6 million that covers the remainder of the furlough amount. Um, so uh, anyway, those are things that we need to think about as we go, go forward uh, into the next budget year. Um, I think with that, we're, we're uh, concluding our, um, our, our major presentation to you. Um, and I think Christina touched, I'll touch on one more point that Christina did, that uh, we did use over $13 million of reserves and we need to build that up. And so we are proposing to include that amount. It's, it's something that your board has considered um, in the years past, and that's how we got to our 10% our reserve because you showed a lot of fiscal discipline over the last decade. And so we're just wanting to continue that into the future and restore the amount uh, that we had uh, used in, in this uh, to get past this recession. Uh, so with that, we'll conclude our presentation and then uh, be open to any questions from the board. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Blasius, and thank you, Christina. Um, well, uh, it's, it's better than we thought it might be, so that's great. It's under those circumstances that we wouldn't have gotten here without uh, our employees sacrificing through the furloughs to re reduce our deficit, that just wouldn't have happened. Uh, I can't tell you how much we all appreciate it. The people of Santa Cruz County appreciate it because you've been able to carry out more than your fair share of services, additional services uh, very well. And uh, we appreciate your understanding of that. Um, also, um, I, uh, I'm glad to see that uh, Washington has given us, it looks like a 53 little amount to $53 million. That'll be just so essential. And we, we are gonna have to need that as we move along. Um, on part two of the recommended actions, uh, is there any fin financial impact to uh, extending the period for the health services agency staff through the furlough time? We, I mean, won't we have still captured the full budget impact by June 30th of this year? Yes, we will achieve the, the budget savings we need to this fiscal year. Uh, we're just giving the staff more flexibility to use those furlough hours into the next fiscal year. Perfect. Okay, good. All right, and you answered some of the other questions about, uh, well, we have a little uncertainty what's coming, but it looks very positive uh, in this, line, this, this week. Uh, are there any other questions from the members of the board? Uh, Supervisor Friend? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mowry, as always, for that outstanding presentation. I learn a lot each time, and, and Mr. Palacios as well. Um, I appreciate the information. Obviously, we have a lot to learn when we get treasury guidance about what is flexible or not flexible in this, and we do have one-time funding. I do. I would like to say, though, that um, one of the successes of the 2009 recovery was investment in capital projects, not just on a revenue loss basis. And I think that we really do need to take some of this money. I noticed that you did mention the contingencies, which we've blown through due to the fires and other reasons. And you did your due diligence last budget year and cautioned us on the reduction of the on the contingencies. I want to acknowledge that. Um, we need to build that up. We need to build the reserves back up no matter what. And it, and it appears as though we have a plan for that. But I do think that some of this needs to be set aside for capital uh, project investments, A, because we have massive deferred maintenance, and B, because it that money goes and stays locally. I mean, it creates local jobs and it helps stimulate the local economy in a way that that purely revenue loss investments don't. I don't know what that percentage is, and I would trust you two to come up with that, but I would like to see something even in the public works or parks world that can can make some investments that are that are desperately needed. And in, in my district, for example, it's no different from my colleagues. We we still have a lot of storm damage related projects that need local funding and we've been taking SB1 funding, it's taking a long time. Anything we can do to stimulate those projects again creates jobs and also saves money in the long run because the escalating costs of construction. So I just like to think about how we creatively use uh, this one-time funds to also create and stimulate local the local economy and jobs associated with that and meet some of our capital needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sort of piggybacking off what Supervisor Friend was just talking about, I do think that an opportunity to invest in both capital projects and also some workforce development. Um, right now, I think Supervisor McPherson and I are hearing from a lot of 
our constituents are finding hard time, they're having a hard time finding contractors uh, to rebuild their homes or to build the affordable housing that we've all agreed is so needed. Um, and then we've also burned through uh, medical professionals in response to the crisis, various crises. And so um, training up uh, people in the trades, training up, training up people to do nursing and public health nursing, um, I think partnering with our Workforce Investment Board or Cabrillo or the County Office of Education um, and really sort of investing in this generation so that we can uh, create some, you know, and essentially an economic foothold for people uh, and much needed services, I think, uh, with targeting some of this money. The other question uh, that I, I think it's uh, that, that if we can develop some programs uh, with this stimulus dollars or these COVID relief dollars, um, I think it could play a, both a short-term and a long-term benefit to our community in creating some good jobs and needed, needed uh, providers in our community. The second question is, um, I wanna appreciate the staff's management in these very difficult times uh, to keep our uh, fiscal situation um, solid and to make sure that we weathered this storm. Uh, one of my questions was, it, I, it said that we may not be able to build in um, the COVID relief dollars into our budget, but uh, but I'm sort of hesitant to, to do several different budgets uh, in June and then come back in August and then come back in the fall. Um, and so what can we do to sort of, even if we don't have 100% of the dollars, be able to have a thoughtful conversation of where we wanna make these investments and what the next couple of years look like, because. Um, sort of, we've had to do this budgeting piecemeal because of these emergencies and it's totally understandable. But at some point we, we wanna get some uh, stability back in our projections and so that we can all plan going forward where we wanna make investments. Yes, uh, we can, uh, we do plan to uh, come to the board with uh, the budget on May 11th, I believe the date is um, when we will release the budget. Um, Unfortunately, we the budget is the train has left the station, so to speak, and so uh, we didn't know what the American Rescue Plan at that point was. So it is true that it is going to be outdated the minute it's released. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, it is a good plan. What we plan to do is introduce a supplement, a supplemental budget, in um, budget hearings in June, which will take into account all the different proposals for the American Rescue Plan dollars. By then we will have treasury guidance and we will understand how we can spend it. And then the board will be able to give us direction on how to spend that and incorporate it into our budget. And so our anticipation is to have the board pass a budget at the end of June that will be a complete budget and we won't need to revisit in, in August. And if I can just add to that, Carlos, um, you know, as soon as we get guidance, we will bring a report to your board regarding the American Rescue Plan because a good deal of that funding is for this fiscal year and we'll need your board to approve a plan. We will be setting some of it aside for next fiscal year. And as Carlos said, we'll put that in a supplemental. But this fiscal year portion will need to be adopted. The departments um, that have been uh, you know, in the middle of the pandemic have, have gone on in good faith and continue to provide certain services that we do need to um, you know, set up appropriations in the budget appropriately and to make sure that we have that money coming in. Um, so we will be asking your board to take an action probably. I don't know if we'll have everything all figured out by the end of March, but definitely by April, we'll have something to you. Supervisor Caput, do you have any questions? I think uh, I think you covered it very well. Okay. All right, Supervisor uh, Koenig. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mowry and uh, and Mr. Palacios for those great presentations. Um, I think I, I pretty much understood everything you said. I, I I think I'm finally starting to get the hang of this. So um, and, I, and it's also I'm sure thanks to the clarity uh, and directness of your presentation as well. Um, you know, obviously contemplating uh, how we're going to manage these long-term gaps. Um, you know, I, I agree with my colleagues that we have to think about what kind of investments we can make. 
Um, in looking over the revenues for this year, I, I also want to highlight, um, you know, the increase that we've seen in the cannabis tax. Uh, you know, that was due to policy changes that this board made and making that permitting process a little bit easier. And so I think it's, um, you know, obviously, uh, as we consider revenue measures and, uh, you know, it's more than likely that some of those are going to be necessary. Um, but, you know, I think we should also not forget that, you uh, Ultimately, we are stewards of our community, and the more our community prospers, uh, the more ultimately general money general government will have available to it. Um, you know, obviously, property tax is the biggest source of, of income for our community. And so, um, to uh, our CIO's point, um, you know, with the creation of a new community uh, community development or community, um, you know, basically a new approach to streamlining permitting, I think that's going to be critical. Uh, to ultimately allowing more people to invest in our community um, and that, uh, that will ultimately see uh, our property taxes increase if we do that effectively. Um, so yeah, just uh, I, I think that there is a lot more that we can do and um, just uh, let's, let's not forget to think creatively and, and think about how we can help uh, our entire community. Thank you, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the public? There are no speakers to this item, Chair McPherson. Thank you. Okay, this is a just a mid-year report, um, and it's better than we could have anticipated um, you know, six months ago or so, but uh, thank you for that report. And we will now move on to item number 10 to consider- the Chair, Chair McPherson, we had a accept and file. Oh, did we? We had a couple of, yes. we had a couple of recommended actions on this. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Thank you. Okay, uh, entertain a motion to accept the file this mid-year budget report. I'll move the recommended actions. Yeah, there were, there were two actions and direct the personnel director um, to take action regarding the extension of the furlough period for health services in place. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Okay, the maker of the motion is uh, Coonerty, seconded by... I'll second. Second by your friend. Uh, call the roll, please. You Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Palacios, for that. Uh, all right. Now we will move to item number 10 uh, to consider proposed process and timeline for development of policy and ordinance related to tiny homes and direct the planning department staff to proceed with policy development as outlined in a memorandum of the planning director. I think that this is okay. um, Great, thank you so much, um, Chair McPherson, supervisors. This is Daisy Allen with the planning department. I'm sharing my screen. Um, so, uh, let me just pull, okay. Oops. Just a moment. Okay. Um, so at the January 26th Board of Supervisors meeting, the board considered the idea of developing a policy that would allow for tiny homes in Santa Cruz County, including uh, tiny homes on foundations, as well as tiny homes on wheels. The board directed planning staff to return with a proposed process and timeline for development of this policy. So what is a tiny home? Uh, tiny homes are not defined in our code, but tiny homes are generally considered in the industry to be small housing units, less than 400 square feet, that are either on foundations or on wheels and may be towed to different locations. The state of California recently adopted Appendix Q of the 2018 International Residential Building Code, which includes special standards for ceiling height, lofts, ladders and stairs, and egress windows for tiny homes. Uh, Appendix Q is an optional provision in the International Building Code, but it was adopted by California as mandatory actually for all jurisdictions. So it is already in effect here in Santa Cruz County uh, for tiny homes that are on uh, foundations that are considered buildings. Um, the Santa Cruz County Code currently allows tiny homes on foundations that are as small as 150 square feet uh, tiny homes on wheels are currently treated the same way in our code as recreational vehicles, and uh, we 
do not allow permanent habitation of recreational vehicles, except in designated RV parks. Uh, so uh, in response to the board's direction, staff proposes to update the county's regulations for tiny homes in two separate projects or phases. Phase one would involve updating the code to allow for tiny homes on foundations or on wheels as primary dwellings or as ADUs. These code changes could be made uh, without requiring general plan amendments or CEQA review. The county building code uh, already incorporates the provisions of Appendix Q, as I mentioned, but there may be interest in adding additional local amendments uh, to the state building code in order to address foundation design or other areas where special building standards for tiny homes may be appropriate. Um, changes to the zoning code will definitely be needed. Uh, staff suggests creating a new code section dedicated to tiny homes in order to clearly define what we mean by tiny homes and delineate how tiny homes are different from other definitions in our codes, such as manufactured homes, mobile homes, recreational vehicles, uh, and travel trailers or park trailers, uh, which have their own standards. There would also be a need to provide guidance regarding the appropriate placement of tiny homes on parcels, um, ownership, uh, of tiny homes and to define when and how tiny homes on wheels would be considered as housing units uh, contributing to the county's housing production numbers. Uh, information will be needed about utility hookups uh, as well as potential exceptions to our usual dwelling unit standards such as allowing for efficiency kitchens rather than standard kitchens. Um, also the zoning code section concerning accessory dwelling units will need to be updated to explicitly allow tiny homes as ADUs uh, and reference the new tiny homes code section. Uh, staff proposes to conduct these code updates concurrently with an update to the county's ADU regulations this spring and summer. Staff is currently working on updates to the ADU ordinance in order to better align with guidance provided in an ADU handbook that was prepared by the California Department of Housing and Community Development this past fall. Uh, so since the topics of ADUs and tiny homes are related, and uh, it appears that neither of these efforts will require a general plan amendment or environmental review, uh, staff proposes to take the two topics together either as one ordinance or parallel ordinances on the same schedule. Um, so there uh, would also be a potential for a phase two of tiny home policy. Uh, phase two would include policy options that would take more time uh, due to requiring general plan amendments or potentially requiring environmental review uh, or uh, you know, more uh, extensive community meetings. Uh, for instance, these policy options might include tiny home villages, in other words, multiple tiny homes on a single site. Uh, our existing regulations do allow for multiple single family dwellings on a parcel. Uh, these are called dwelling groups but dwelling groups are subject to density limits. And for that reason, it's unlikely that tiny home villages would be allowed under our existing rules, except on very large sites or in very high density zone districts. Uh, in the future, the general plan and accompanying county code could potentially be amended to allow for tiny home villages generally, or for specific applications of tiny homes, such as emergency housing or transitional housing from the, uh, for the homeless, as was discussed uh, in a previous agenda item today. Uh, another potential policy area that could be explored in phase two would be tiny homes that are completely off the grid. Uh, our general plan and county code does require a public water and sewer hookup for all development located within the urban services line. And there are water and septic requirements uh, in the rural area. If there is interest in allowing for tiny homes with composting toilets, it will be necessary to amend these policies to allow for that. Uh, and any updates to our policies that would increase development potential in the county uh, could be subject to review under uh, the California Environmental Quality Act. So in terms of schedule, um, the concept of tiny home regulation is new in Santa Cruz County, especially the idea of allowing tiny ho homes on wheels. Uh, engagement with the community is therefore very important. Also, it's important to take the proposed changes through review by the Housing Advisory Commission, as well as the Planning Commission uh, for recommendations before returning to the board uh, with a proposed ordinance. Last week, we did review the tiny home concept at the Housing Advisory Commission meeting and received positive feedback about the policy idea generally, 
as well as helpful input on issues to consider uh, in phase one, uh, phase one of the uh, ordinance development. After today's meeting, we have scheduled a community meeting on March 16th, where we will plan to present uh, both the proposed changes to the ADU regulations, as well as uh, tiny home regulation options, uh, and we'll be gathering feedback from the public. Uh, and then we will plan to go to the Planning Commission for a study session, and then for a public hearing, followed by a return to the Housing Advisory Commission uh, so that they uh, can provide feedback on the actual draft ordinance. And finally, uh, back to the Board of Supervisors uh, and then on to the Coastal Commission. So staff recommends that the board direct the planning department to proceed uh, with the first phase of the tiny home policy development according to the schedule as proposed and that the board direct staff to proceed separately uh, with a second phase of tiny home policy development later either as a standalone project or wrapped uh, together with other housing policy initiatives uh, such as uh, supportive housing policy work. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, Supervisor Koenig, do you have any comments on this? I know that you we brought it together. So yeah, you thank, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Allen, for the comprehensive presentation. Uh, it looks really great, and I received a lot of positive uh, comments from folks who saw this, I believe it was the same presentation at the Housing Advisory Committee the other day. Um, so just want to commend you uh, for your work on, uh, on this. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's sort of as expected that we would need to do this in a couple of phases. Uh, so I, that makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, I, I think that you know the delivery of phase one in um, you know late uh, late spring, early summer makes sense as well. Um, I guess my only concern at this moment is that uh, the potential that uh, phase two could kind of get lost in uh, in the shuffle down the road. Um, so is, do you have some sense now of the timing on that phase? Um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, if we do proceed with this two phase option, um, the only concern we would have from a staff perspective is that we be finished with the phase one project first before we moved on to phase two. So given the proposed schedule, that would put us at around August or September to be starting work on uh, potential options for phase two. Great, yeah, that, that makes sense. So I, I suppose, um, you know, if we need uh, some kind of action coming out today, I think maybe all that I would add is that when we do ultimately review an ordinance um, for phase one, that at that time we get an update on a uh, potential timeline for phase two. And um, yeah, I, well, I'll follow up with you to make sure I've got the link for the March 16th community meeting and definitely look forward to helping to promote that as well. Great. Okay. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Allen, as always for the presentation. I, I do have some questions. These are relatively similar to the ones that I'd raised at the last uh, meeting when we uh, asked for you guys to, for the planning department to come back. Um, I'm definitely supportive of this general concept, but I think some of the details will actually really matter during the, the process of making these. And so maybe some of these questions are things that will need to be explored from the PC and, and you, or maybe some of them you could actually address. I mean, one of the questions I had is, could you have an ADU and a tiny home on the same parcel? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so what we're proposing for phase one would be no change to our current um, density allowances and housing allowances that are in our, in our current zoning code, um, as well as the ADU state law. Allowed <laughs> In terms of um, number of units, if you have a, a single family parcel, you may have a single family home and an ADU. Uh, as well as a junior ADU. Uh, if, uh, as part of this phase one policy project, we would be allowing for a tiny home to function as either that primary dwelling or as that ADU. And as you say, the devil is a little bit in the details because the ADU size currently is related to the primary dwelling size in terms of some types of ADUs. So, so that's one thing to kind of to think about a little bit. Um, there's also, of course, concerns regarding tiny homes on wheels. Um, you know, 
allowing for a tiny home on, wheel to, on wheels to function as a primary dwelling when it can be towed off site and you know where where we draw the line there in terms of um, when when that that becomes uh, part of the real property there. Um, okay. So so there's a lot of questions to be worked out as part of this project, even the part of, even the phase one aspect of it. But we wouldn't be proposing to allow for um, additional density beyond what we already allow in our zoning code. Okay, I think that where we would run into some pushback and most likely some environmental challenges would be if that were the case. Um, so it sounds to me like it's functionally a replacement of an either or, not your words, but just how I'm kind of looking at it that way. Um, but in addition to that, we, we cite uh, where ADUs can go on a parcel pretty specifically, especially because uh, from fire codes and other reasons, how we define them as a new construction versus an addition and, and various things. Uh, uh, my thought here is that by definition, something that is more mobile would be cited potentially in a different location. So at least within the urban services line and in particular, the coastal zone, um, I, I wanna flag a concern. And I think this is something that the planning commission needs to review is to where they get cited, because I can see a situation by which you could ostensibly have, you know, dozens on a, on a given block, I mean, or that are being rented out potentially in relatively no setback areas on driveways that are very narrow, right? I mean, so you can imagine if like, I think about a Pleasure Point or a Rio del Mar, for example, that, that that would have a very different effect because we wouldn't permit an ADU there. It would be a garage conversion or something in the backyard. Um, and so we, we're gonna really have to look at, especially on smaller parcel sizes or urban services line area, in particular coastal zone, where these are sited. I think that that's gonna be a, a hurdle for us to overcome. Um, in addition, I don't know for like Soquel Creek Water District's perspective, is this a new water hookup? Is this not a new water hookup from our sanitation district? How do we calculate flow rates associated with it if it's connected within the urban services line? Because these are all things that under Prop 218 and other challenges, we actually need to know uh, when we're making rates on, on those issues. So, I, I, I mean, it's much easier in an area like a, a Coralitos in my district, for example, where you have space. Uh, versus the urban area, even though there's advantages to being within the urban area, obviously. But these are things that I want to be sure the Planning Commission addresses. Do you have a sense of how we would assess these properties? I mean, so when when we have a an ADU come on, that's uh, and you know that you get a new assessment on your property from a size. But if these are technically mobile, how would they be? But they're a living unit that you could be your primary living unit. How do we now assess it from a property tax perspective? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that one yet. Um, my understanding, you know, from doing a little bit of research in other jurisdictions so far, and just being at the very beginning of this policy project, is that a tiny home on a foundation is considered real property, and a tiny home on wheels is considered personal property, similarly to a travel trailer or a park trailer. Um, but beyond beyond that, I'm not I'm not certain if you know if we're allowing a tiny home on wheels to be used as a primary residence, we might require some level of interim type of foundation alternative foundation construction in order to allow for that to be considered part of the real property. But that's that's a, a blurry line, and I'm not I'm not certain yet about okay. that. Okay, well, and I and I completely appreciate that honesty because to me these are the questions that just popped up in my mind as to how this would work because. I view something on wheels as temporary and if and our code seems to agree, but if we're allowing somebody to live there for multiple years or if, or if not permanently, then that's a fundamentally different situation and I think needs to be treated very differently as new construction and how we look at new construction. Again, this is just different within the coastal zone and other areas in the urban services line. And so it's something to consider. Overall, I'm definitely supportive of the program, but these details are really gonna matter because I can see there being um, some pushback, including on the CEQA side, if we don't really, if we're not thoughtful about how this is presented. So I, I would just hope that, that I mean, I'm not looking for this to be additional direction, but just that you're getting board feedback now that these are things that I would hope that the Planning Commission and HAC would consider and planning staff would consider before something comes back to the board. Thank you, Ms. Allen. I appreciate it. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. I see he's still there, you know. Um, 
I'll come back to Supervisor Coonerty for ask again. Supervisor uh, Kappa, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, not too many, but uh, just a few. Uh, you answered uh, uh, a couple of questions I had already on your presentation, so I won't repeat them. But uh, I was looking at the picture. It showed like a neighborhood of uh, uh, tiny homes. It, it almost looked like the Wizard of Oz and uh, whatever. So are, are we talking about certain areas maybe becoming like a, a neighborhood of uh, tiny homes? Or, or are we looking at it where a tiny home has to be somehow uh, connected to a ma uh, uh, a large uh, you know residential home yeah that's that's a great question so uh you might be referring to the picture in the lower right portion of the screen where there's a few different tiny homes on the same property so this is something that we would consider to be a tiny home village and it's been done in some other communities um, as i mentioned uh, our zoning code doesn't really allow for tiny home village except on very high density zone districts. And in those zone districts, we really would want to see more like a for, uh, apartment style multifamily housing rather than uh, detached housing. Um, however, uh, there may be an opportunity to update our zoning code um, later as part of maybe a phase two uh, of the policy. Uh, project for tiny homes that would allow for tiny home villages. Uh, but the, what we're proposing for a phase one part of the policy project would be just allowing for a tiny home to be uh, used as either a primary residence or as an ADU. Okay, all right. So if, if there's a neighborhood of regular residential homes and there's a vacant lot in that neighborhood, Somebody can't just go in there and say, I'm going to put a tiny home there, and uh, that'll be it. Right? right. And actually, in our existing um, code, you can already do that with a tiny home that's on a foundation. So what we'd be exploring as part of this phase one of this policy project would be uh, expanding that to, in some way, incorporate tiny homes on wheels as well. Okay, and they, they, they'd all be uh, subject to private ownership, I guess. And I get what I'm getting at is uh, uh, someone uh, that owns a residential home, instead of building an ADU, uh, they can put one of these tiny homes and then uh, pretty much rent it out. Uh, and we're assuming that the rent would be cheaper or, you know, with people being, uh, with the COVID-19, uh, of course, there's no control over how much rent that would be charged. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So uh, that's one thing we do have to watch out for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, did you have any questions on this? Are you? I, I don't. I'm sorry. I was having a hard time unmuting. But uh, no, I appreciate the the report, and I don't have any questions this time. And thank you. I, I too, um, I, I support this uh, two-pronged approach um, moving forward uh, in the immediate future um, with an ordinance or code update that makes tiny homes possible uh, soon. Uh, and more significant policy to work on tiny home villages and off-grid options that uh, are to be studied later. Um, I think this is um, a great avenue that we're, we're addressing and uh, I appreciate uh, Supervisor Koenig's involvement in this with me and uh, to bring it to the board. Is there, are there any public uh, comments? Yes, I have one speaker to this item. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holliday, your microphone is unmuted. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I am um, a small business owner in Ben Lomond and I am a CZU Lightning Complex fire survivor. And I just wanted to, um, say how supportive I am of making this available. I am also a tiny home dweller for over nine years. And while often tiny homes are associated with people who are currently unsheltered, um, they are an amazing option for people across income levels. So I was able 
um, to, because I was living in my tiny home, um, while I was working on a building permit that expired, we ran out of money and then everything burned down. Um, I was able to open a business and put my resources into the community, creating jobs as opposed to being kind of forced to invest in real estate. And so it was an incredible option for me. And then the other thing I wanna um, just say um, that the technology around composting toilets and gray water systems has advanced a lot. And um, like I'm in a position, um, I'm going to rebuild a tiny house, um, but my septic system is gonna cost as much as the house. And so I just really wanna encourage that phase two to happen for people like me. Um, I live up Alba Road um, to be able to address this sooner rather than later. And I just wanna um, thank you for pushing forward with this movement because it is um, good for people and it's good for the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Was that the only other, uh, or the only public comment then? Yes, Chuck McPherson, that is the only speaker to this item. Okay, uh, we have two uh, recommended actions to uh, uh, direct the planning department to draft an ordinance allowing the tiny homes as a primary or accessory dwelling um, and direct the department to proceed with more extensive tiny home policy provisions, uh, some of when, which have been suggested as we speak today. Um, those are the recommended actions. Does anyone want to make a motion to that effect? Uh, Chair, I, I, first I just had one follow-up question. Sure. Yes, uh, go ahead. I think the supervisor friend raised with, about the, the question of you know whether a tiny home would be permitted in addition to an ADU, um, and I, you know understand the clarification that right now they they would not. Um, right. I do understand that the city of Watsonville recently has allowed multiple ADUs on parcels over I believe it's twelve thousand square feet. I'm just curious in the general scope of the ADU amendments, if if multiple ADUs, uh, you know, detached ADUs, obviously, since we already permit a junior ADU as well as an ADU. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious if that is in um, you know, your, your scope of inquiry. Um, yeah, so, so multiple ADUs are currently allowed on uh, multifamily properties, but not single family properties. Single family properties can have one ADU and one junior ADU. We have not gotten feedback or direction to make a change to that portion of the ADU code, but that's certainly something that we could do. We always have an option to be uh, more lenient than the state law regarding ADUs. Um, so uh, we would certainly welcome um, that feedback uh, and we will be gathering input from the community at the meeting next week. So we may um, hear some, some similar requests from community members as well. Great, thank you for that clarification. Okay, thank you. And to Supervisor um, Koenig to that question, when we had asked that question previously of planning during our previous ADU process, we were told it would require a general plan amendment, an update to the general plan, I mean. So it, it sounded like it was possible, but it would be, um, it'd be a long haul. It'd be a long time. No. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point actually, because um, once we go beyond what is mandated by state law in terms of ADUs, um, even if it doesn't require a general plan amendment, uh, it would most likely require environmental review um, to do that work. So it, it would be um, a bit more substantial of a, a policy lift compared to um, you know, minor amendments to the existing code. Good point, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's somewhat included in the uh, recommended actions. Do I have a motion uh, in effect to uh, support the recommended actions? Chair, I'd move the recommended actions with the um, additional direction that uh, phase two, a timeline for phase two uh, be presented at the time that we uh, re review a phase one ordinance. Perfect, okay. I'll second it. Second by friend. Please call the roll. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to uh, item number 11. I consider directing the planning department to return to the board on April 13th, 2021 with the proposed, uh, a proposal to incorporate a set of pre-approved accessory dwelling unit plans on the planning department's website on or before June 30th, 2021 for use by CZU fire victims and the general public as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Koenig and McPherson. We have a pre-approved ADU plans fact sheet. 
Uh, who's going to be presenting on that? Uh, Chair, I'm, I have a short presentation. I yes, can... go ahead, please. Great, thank you. Um, well, you know, as as uh, Ms. Allen just uh, highlighted, we're currently in the process of updating our ADU ordinance as a county. And so I thought it would be timely, uh, along with Supervisor McPherson, to bring forward um, another solution that we've seen work in other communities, which is pre-approved ADU plans. And um, these, I, I think we, you know, of course, all understand by now that the need um, to increase housing stock and to look at uh, different options to do so. Um, using a pre-approved permit ready plan essentially will make it quicker, easier, and more affordable um, for people to build ADUs. And you know, just for by way of example, in the, city, in the county of San Diego, where they have such a program, the idea is that someone can come in with a site plan and an energy use plan uh, and the uh, you know a CAD file with the with the ADU plans that have already you know been created by the county and are pre-approved and walk out within 30 minutes. Uh, you know, if they have these other items ready to go with a permit. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, a number of other jurisdictions have done this. Uh, recently, the city of Seaside um, created a pre-approved uh, pre ADU program. The city of Capitola just put out an RFP at the beginning of February. Uh, there's actually Senate Bill 2 provided some funding for jurisdictions to do this. Uh, and so which is why a number of, of um, different jurisdictions have taken advantage of it. Uh, unfortunately, that funding recently expired. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we've seen in other jurisdictions like San Diego that the lift uh, is not necessarily huge. Um, they actually created their program in about 80 hours in-house. Um, there, you know, the way some of these programs have gone, the, the city of Seaside sort of had a choose your own adventure option. Um, where they essentially had one base model, uh, but as you can see in the um, in the diagram here, you're able to choose a few different roof treatments, uh, different sidings, um, and uh, you know ultimately that created a you know individual uh, individualized. You had basically nine different outcomes that you could arrive at. Uh, some of the savings involved, you know, obviously there's um, uh, you know just can average about ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Uh, just in savings for, for uh, architecture and design work on behalf uh, of an applicant. Uh, the, in, the case, uh, in this case of the County of San Diego, uh, they created six different plans in-house. Uh, in their case, they marketed the plans as being you know, approximately 85% complete um, so that they still do need a little bit of work. Um, but they get you most of the way there. And, and as I said, if you used one of their existing plans, uh, they're committed to, um, you know, potentially signing off on your project within 30 minutes. Um, one interesting thing to learn from their example is they found overall that about 20% uh, of, of uh, applicants for an ADU use their plans as is, and then another 20% uh, use their plans in some form. And uh, in, it, including just taking the CAD file that was provided by the planning department, deleting the actual building plan itself, but keeping sort of the notation format and then putting their own plans in there. So, I, you know, one way we can think about this is really as a ease of use tool uh, for people working with our planning department, um, just to speed up the process of providing plans that are in a format uh, that we uh, that we want to work with. I've heard a lot of uh, a lot of horror stories of people continually getting their plans rejected because they haven't formatted their bookmarks correctly um, or other things things such as that. So again, this is just an ease of use factor that's going to help uh, speed up the process by which uh, new projects can be approved. And then some context here in our county. Um, you know, of course, we have the, uh, the OR3 office is currently working on developing a plan library of pre-approved plans so that fire victims can rebuild quickly. Um, but as, uh, as we know, that office is still being staffed, uh, still, uh, you know, hopefully we're soon to, uh, getting close to, to finding uh, a division head there, um, but still um, short staffed. And so we can step in here and um, direct planning to assist with this effort uh, and, and helping to create some pre-approved plans, at least specifically in this case for an ADU. 
Uh, you know, we recognize that Santa Cruz has unique to, uh, topographical challenges uh, and pre-approved plans should be a foundation up design um, that may be adopted for specific building sites. Um, so, you know, once, once approved, building official would, would, uh, and all relevant departments, pre-reviewed plans would be considered um, permit ready and would be exempt from permit review fees uh, and would be made available on the county's website for the public to download for free. So in the direction, uh, the recommended action provided today, we've basically, you know, uh, given the option to, uh, to planning to ultimately decide whether they want to go about a sort of build or buy uh, solution to this. As I said, um, a lot of other uh, jurisdictions have pursued the buy approach and issued an RFQ uh, or an RFP. In many cases, like the, the city of C Seaside, Danville, or Capitola, as I said, have all issued RFPs uh, and ultimately oops, own the plans. Um, we could also build the plans in-house similar to the County of San Diego. Uh, that's all for my presentation and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that. And I, I think it makes a re really a lot of sense to have pre-approved options for our residents uh, who want to build ADUs, especially those considering doing that as part of the rebuilding after the fire. Um, I think that ADUs really hold a great potential for providing affordable housing by design and uh, the San Lorenzo Valley in particular in my district and in rural areas throughout the county. And I look forward to getting this support, support tool uh, available as soon as possible. Um, I thank you for your work on that, Supervisor Koenig. Um, are there any other qu uh, comments that uh, other members of the board would like to make? Yes, Mr. Chair, if I may. Uh, thank you both for bringing this forward. I have, I have a brief question. I think I know the answer based on the recommended actions, but just confirming that this item is broader than just uh, for fire victims, that it does say for the general population. So this would apply across the county, correct? Or not across the county, but across the unincorporated area, I should say. Yes. Correct. Okay. Then my second question is, um, the board may recollect that I had actually brought this same item forward a few years ago uh, during an ADU update. And at the time, the planning department said that this actually wasn't possible. We ended up with the ADU toolkit in part as a compromise, but one of the elements was I was hoping to do that. The building department had expressed concerns of hand up having standardized plans. So I just wanted to check with planning to see if something had fundamentally changed since then. Obviously I'm supportive of it. I was supportive of it multiple years ago when I brought it up before, but I, I just wanted to see where planning was on this because they had expressed at the time some safety and other related issues saying that it was uh, difficult. I'd actually presented San Diego as the model at the time. Right. The pot gray that you are, right. <laughs> <laughs> but is there somebody from planning that could address that question? Hey, Miss Allen, are you there? Is she? Miss Allen Matt there? Machado and Kimberly Finley on the line as well for this item. Wait, wait let me uh, check first. Is Miss Allen there? There was a question from Supervisor Friend. Um, yes, I'm promoting her back. Oh, God. For this item. Yes, and Pia is also joining us. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Levine. I see that you're there. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, the, the development of plans that will assist people to develop their ADUs is, um, is something we've looked at and, um, um, and we thought about the proposal that Supervisor um, Koenig's put forward as well and have a couple comments. Um, one thing that's different in response to your question, Supervisor Friend, is that um, many more communities have done this in the interim and there's a lot more um, uh, product, if you will, available just on, on the internet and other places for the kinds of structures that you could build with a pre-plan check set of plans. And um, um, Santa Cruz does have a lot of things that make it different from a community where you've got, you know, flat lots and you don't have to think too much about the foundation down. Um, but we we can implement something like that, of course, and we've been thinking that um, um, relative to the two suggestions that are proposed today, um, the department doesn't have the capacity at the moment to do it in-house, um, not without other commitments, um, you know, suffering. So um, we would be, I think what's feasible now is to use the consultant option and um, 
for us to do a procurement like that, working with general services and allowing enough time for professionals to propose a package, um, a procurement would take about three months to do. So um, the timeline, if the timeline could be adjusted, then the, um, the contract option, it seems like the more feasible one. Um, of course, another topic is that a funding source hasn't been identified at this time. Um, uh, the, um, the OR3 has been looking at this topic uh, specifically for the burn area victims, but any work that they've done and any program they create can certainly be leveraged to apply to the entire county. And um, they have the ability to work with nonprofits and the long-term recovery committee to look for funding sources and also to place this program in the right place relative to the full range of needs that the burn victims have. So um, David Reed is here as well from the OR3 and he can speak to some of the details uh, of, of a program, the pro kind of program that they've been investigating if that would be helpful. And so, so thank you, Ms. Levine. Just so I, I make sure I'm hearing you this correctly, would the board need to approve the consultant contract? I mean, I, I just think on the timeline, it's clear that the April timeline as outlined by my two colleagues is, is probably too ambitious, but it may be possible though, that something could come back to us that procured a contract around that time so that we could get this, this thing moving a little bit. Is that, a, is that an accurate statement? I think it would be accurate to say that we could have a contract in about the three month timeline. So if we started right now, that looks like the end of June. A contract in place or something to the board to authorize the ability to do it, or is that something we could do today? Hmm. Um, the, the, the way I'm familiar with seeing it is that we, put, we, we go through the procurement if you give us that direction today, and then we would come back with a, a proposed contract at the end of that time. And then the contract would be implemented by whoever is the chosen service provider. So, um, super, um, Supervisor Friend, uh, earlier I had read, I actually read a, a correction to this item into the agenda where uh, that said that the um, planning department, in conjunction with the Office of Recovery and Resiliency, would return to the board on April 27th with a proposal to incorporate a set of pre approved accessory dwelling unit plans on the planning department's website on or before June 30th, 2021. And so that was the correction that um, I believe staff had agreed to. Thank you, I apologize for that. Um, okay, I think that I, I understand that there has been some changes and that's what's different from a few years ago. Um, I just, um, I appreciate my colleagues bringing this back forward again since there has been some changes and I appreciate you providing that clarity, Ms. Levine. Thank you. Any, any other questions from board members? Comments? Um, any, any comments from the public? There are no members to the public speaking to this item. Okay, uh, the recommended actions to direct the planning department to return to the board by April 27th, which is a tight timeline in itself with plans, with a proposal to incorporate a set of pre-approved accessory dwelling unit plans on the plan, planning department website uh, before June 30th, 2021. I have a motion to that effect. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded. Please call the roll. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. The, the next item we have on the agenda is um, number or excuse me, 12, to consider directing the board chair to write a letter to the legislative co-sponsors of a supporting passage of Senate Bill 45, as outlined in a memorandum of Supervisor Coonerty and myself, McPherson. Uh, Senate Bill 45 is by Senator Port Portantino. Uh, I wanted to make a couple excuse comments. Me, yes. Oh, Sorry, this is 13. item 12. This is item 13. Item 12 is the public hearing on the proposed easement. Oh, should I, did I say, okay, I, we had the change in numbers. This is item 12, okay? I'm sorry. Um, so you heard my presentation on item 12 to write a letter uh, of support of these legislative co-sponsors. Um, I wanted to um, make a few comments about this, this measure. Um, 
with, um, as your representative of the CSAC, the California State, State Association of Counties, um, Monday we had a conference call on this, this bill, as well as one Assembly Bill 9 or AB 9 by Assemblyman uh, Jim Wood. Um, they are both on fire resiliency and watershed protection. Uh, just to give you a little differentia uh, differential, differential, uh, it's uh, Senate Bill 45 is a $5.5 billion uh, proposed bond. Uh, AB 9 would be uh, 6.7 billion. The governor has not in, uh, indicated what he would support, if anything, uh, to make the June 22nd ballot it would uh, have to come uh, be approved by uh, the fall and September sometime. It'd probably be labeled as a climate resiliency bill. Um, the, uh, the, this is a regional uh, resiliency coalition that's trying to put this bill forward. And our regional uh, area would be uh, led by the Coastal Conservancy. So they're, they're both the sub same subject matter that you might be hearing about. Uh, both Assembly Bill 9 and this bill, uh, Senate Bill 45. There's a differential in the, the amount of that would be on the bill, but believe me, this will be going through a lot of discussion in the state legislature before, or if anything is put on the, uh, the ballot in uh, June 22. Um, that's the basics of the basis of what's going on. And uh, I just wanna keep make you aware that there are some uh, competing measures, and they will be discussed by conference committees in the near future, I'm sure. Um, I don't know if anybody had any questions on this item. No, uh, I, I'll make a note here. Uh, I guess we skipped 12 and we jumped to 13, am I correct? But uh, anyway, we can go back to 12. Well, you know, yes, I, that's that's correct. Um, we're, uh, we're on uh, item 13, we uh, inadvertently skipped item 12. We'll go back to that. I'll, I'll move to approve uh, item number 13. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Um, please call the roll. Thank you. And I'm sorry, was that Coonerty that second or Koenig? I think I beat Coonerty by <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, God. For the vote, Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Now we'll move to third, item 12. Now, this is the public hearing. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Yes. Okay. I've, I've had it reversed in mind. Okay. Um, this is a public hearing on the proposed easement by condemnation across real property located at assessor's parcel number 029-01354 to support Highway 141st Soquel Avenue auxiliary lanes and Chanticleer pedestrian bicycle cro crossing project and consider a resolution of necessity authorized the county council to institute eminent domain proceedings to obtain possession of the required real property interests as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO, Director of Public Works, we have a resolution of necessity, Exhibit A, SCWD, Exhibit B, SCWD, Temporary Construction Easement. Uh, is Mr. Rashado going to be, who is going to be presenting on this? Good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Finley. How are you? Oh, hi, Kimberly. How are you? Good. Um, good to see you, Chair. And Hello, members of the board. My name is Kimberly Finley. I'm the Chief Real Property Agent with the Department of Public Works. I appear before you today to request that the board conduct a public hearing on a proposed easement by condemnation across rural property located at 2505 Chanticleer Avenue, APN 029-01354, and to request that the board adopt a resolution of necessity authorizing County Council to institute imminent domain proceedings to obtain possession of real property interests necessary to complete the Highway 1 41st to SoCal Auxiliary Lane and Pedestrian Bicycle Overcrossing Project. Specifically, the Pedestrian Overcrossing Project requires 8,847 square feet of permanent easement for pedestrian and bikeway purposes and 1,389 square feet of temporary construction easement over a portion of APN 029. 01354, 
which is owned by SoCal Creek Water District. The county, in partnership with Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission, has coordinated with SoCal Creek Water District for over a year regarding the design, location, and timing of the pedestrian overcrossing project as it relates to APN 029-01354. Substantial effort and county resources have been expended in an attempt to negotiate terms of acquisition for the required property interests. But unfortunately, the parties have been unable to reach an agreement. The timing of this project is now critical and in order to comply with Caltrans right-of-way certification requirements and meet funding deadlines associated with the $32 million currently allocated to this project, the county must move forward with the resolution of necessity. Adoption of this resolution of necessity will not impair the ability for the county and SoCal Creek Water District to resolve acquisition of those, this property without litigation. Um, yes, I think we're good. Thank you so much. Okay. And the county remains committed to continuing those negotiations in parallel with the eminent domain process. The county has met the necessary statutory requirements associated with the resolution of necessity as pursuant to Code of Civil Procedure Section 7267.2, the county has offered just compensation for the real property interests as determined by a certified independent appraiser which appraisal was reviewed by a third party appraiser and approved by Caltrans. Pursuant to Code of Civil Procedure Section 1240.510, the project will not unreasonably interfere with SoCal Creek Water District's public use of the property as it exists or may reasonably expect to exist in the future. Currently, the property is bare land. SoCal Creek will be performing its pure water SoCal project sometime in the near future. However, Public Works, RTC, and SoCal Creek Water District have coordinated on design and footprint of both projects to ensure that the pedestrian overcrossing project and the pure water SoCal project can both be constructed, constructed on APN 029-01354. Pursuant to Code of Civil Procedure Section 1240.610, the pedestrian overcrossing project is also a more necessary public use of the easement area than the use to which the property is appropriated by SoCal Creek Water District as the land is currently bare land. Furthermore, as a result of the extensive coordination between the county, RTC, and SoCal Creek Water District, the upcoming Pure Water SoCal project footprint was designed in such a way that it will not be constructed within the area of the property in which the county wishes to acquire the easement. Based on the aforementioned, the Department of Public Works recommends the board take the following actions. Number one, conduct a public hearing on their proposed easement by condemnation across rural property located at 2505 Chanticleer Avenue, APN 029-01354, and two, Adopt a resolution of necessity authorizing county council to institute eminent domain proceedings to obtain possession of the required real property interests. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. <clears throat> any questions from uh, members of the board? This is a critical project uh, for the extension of uh, expanding Highway 1 between Santa Cruz and uh, State Park Drive. Um, any questions from the public? There are no speakers to this item, and it's also been brought to my attention that for item of 13, we did not call speakers. There were no speakers to that item either. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, then we will close the public hearing and return this item to the board. Can you obtain a motion? I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Moved by Coney, second by Koenig. Please call the roll. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Supervisor Friend? Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. And did you get Supervisor Friend on that? Yes, I did. Okay. All right, best unanimously. Uh, we will go to our final item of the day, 
Item number 14, consider a final appointment of Michelle Morton to the Community Health Center's Co-Applicant Commission as an at-large patient representative for a term to expire December 11th, 2022. The nomination was accepted on February 23rd, 2021. Any questions from the board? Any questions from the general public? There are no speakers to this item, Chair. Thank you. Move by Coonerty. Second. Second by Koenig. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That concludes our March 9th, 2021 um, meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, thank you for attending a big long day. We got a lot of things, especially on the housing homeless subject. So I appreciate everybody's uh, efforts to, to move this uh, forward as quickly as possible. Um, this meeting is adjourned. Have a good day. Thank you.